Section 12 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Seventh Day, May the 21st. The court was even more crowded this morning than it has been since the commencement of the trial. By nine o'clock every available seat was occupied, and a great number of persons waited in the passages leading to the various entrances during the whole day, without being able to obtain admission. Among the distinguished persons who were present, we noticed the Lord Chief Baron, the Earl of Denby, Lord G. Lennox, Mr. Monckton Milnes, Mr. L. Gower, Mr. G. O. Higgins, Mr. Forster, and several other members of the House of Commons. The learned judges, Lord Campbell, Mr. Baron Alderson, and Mr. Justice Cresswell, entered the court at about ten o'clock, accompanied by the sheriffs, Sir R. W. Carden, and other aldermen. The prisoner was immediately placed at the bar. He listened with great attention to the address of his learned counsel, and maintained the same calmness and self-possession that he had exhibited since the first day of the proceedings. Counsel for the Crown, the Attorney General, Mr. E. James, Q.C., Mr. Wellsby, Mr. Bodkin, and Mr. Huddleston. For the Prisoner, Mr. Sergeant Shee, Mr. Grove, Q.C., Mr. Gray, and Mr. Keneally. Charles Weatherby, examined by Mr. Wellsby, said, On the 21st of November I received a letter from Palmer, enclosing a cheque for £350. I produce that letter. Quote, Rugely, November the 20th, 1855. Gentlemen, I will thank you to send me a cheque for the amount of the enclosed order. Mr. Cook has been confined here to his bed for the last three days with a bilious attack, which has prevented him from being in town. Yours respectfully, William Palmer. End quote. On the morning of the 23rd, I received another letter from him, which I also produce. In this letter, Palmer requested Mrs. Weatherby to send a cheque for £75 to Mr. Pratt and a cheque for £100 to Mr. Earwaker, and deduct the same from Cook's draft. On the 23rd, I sent a letter to Palmer, of which I produce a copy. Quote, November the 23rd, 1855. Sir... We return Mr. Cook's cheque, not having funds enough to meet it. When Mr. Frail called today to settle the Shrewsbury stake account, he informed us that he had paid Mr. Cook his winnings there. We could not comply with your request as to paying part of the money, even if we had had sufficient in hand to pay you the sums you mention, which we have not. Be so good as to acknowledge the receipt of the cheque. End quote. On the 24th, the following notice, signed by Palmer, was left at my office. Quote, November the 24th, 1855. Gentlemen, I hereby request you will not part with any monies in your hands, or which may come into your hands, on account of John Parsons Cook, to any persons, until payment by you, to me, or my order of the cheque or draft in my favour, given by the said john parsons cook for the sum of three hundred and fifty pounds sent to you by me and acknowledged in your letter received by me at rugeley on wednesday morning the twentieth of this month of november yours etc william palmer mrs weatherby six old burlington street on the twenty third i sent a letter to cook at rugeley which was subsequently returned to me through the dead letter office. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. The cheque for £350 was, as far as I recollect, signed by Cook. The Attorney General. Was it signed J. P. Cook or J. Parsons Cook? I did not observe. By Lord Campbell. I observed that the body of the cheque was not in Cook's handwriting, but that the signature was. Mr. Sergeant Shee, when that cheque of Cook's was presented, you had not funds in hands to meet it? 
No. Were funds afterwards sent up by Mr. Frail, the clerk of the course at Shrewsbury? They were to have been, but were not eventually. In the ordinary course of things, ought they to have been in your hands on the day you received the cheque? I can't positively say. Clerks of the course pay at different times, but Cook might reasonably have supposed that they would be in hand, as it was then a week after he had won the race. I informed Palmer, when I did not pay his cheque, of my reasons for not doing so. Mr. F. Butler, examined by the Attorney General. I attend races and bet. I was at Shrewsbury Races and had an account to settle with Palmer. I had to receive seven hundred pounds odd from him in respect of bets made at the Liverpool races. I had no money to receive in respect of the Shrewsbury races. I endeavoured to get my money at Shrewsbury, and I got forty pounds. I asked him for money several times, and he said he had none, but had some to receive. He did not say how much. He gave me a cheque for two hundred and fifty pounds upon the Rugeley Bank, which was not paid. I know Cook's horse, Polestar. After she had won the race at Shrewsbury, she was worth about seven hundred pounds. She was worth more after than before she won. Cross-examined by Mr. Grove. I won two hundred and ten pounds on Polestar for Palmer, and kept it on account. Mr. Stevens proved that Polestar was sold at Tattersall's on the 10th of March by auction and fetched 720 guineas. The Attorney General. That is the case for the prosecution. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Section 13. The Defence. Seventh Day Continued. Mr. Sergeant Shee then rose to open the defence. He said, In rising to perform the task which it now becomes my duty to discharge, I feel, gentlemen of the jury, an almost overwhelming sense of responsibility. Once only has it before fallen to my lot to defend a fellow creature charged with a capital offence. You can well understand that to take a leading part in a trial of this kind is sufficient to disturb the calmest temper and try the clearest judgment, even if the effort only lasts for one day. But how much more trying is it to stand for six long days under the shade, as it were, of the scaffold, conscious that the least error in judgment may consign my client to an ignominious death and public indignation? It is useless for me to conceal that which all your endeavours to keep your minds free from prejudice cannot wholly efface from your recollection. You perfectly well know that for six long months, under the sanction and upon the authority of science, an opinion has almost universally prevailed that the blood of John Parsons Cook has risen from the ground to bear witness against the prisoner. You know that a conviction of the guilt of the prisoner has impressed itself upon the whole population, and that by the whole population has been raised in a delirium of horror and indignation the cry of blood for blood you cannot have entered upon the discharge of your duty which as i have well observed you have most conscientiously endeavoured to perform without to a great extent sharing in that conviction before you knew that you would have to sit in that box to pass judgment between the prisoner and the crown you might with perfect propriety after reading the evidence taken before the coroner's jury have formed an opinion with regard to the guilt or innocence of the prisoner the very circumstances under which we meet in this place are of a character to excite in me mingled feelings of encouragement and alarm 
those whose duty it is to watch over the safety of the queen's subjects felt so much apprehension lest the course of justice should be disturbed by the popular prejudice which had been excited against the prisoner they were so much alarmed that an unjust verdict might in the midst of that prejudice be passed against him that an extraordinary measure of precaution was taken not only by her majesty's government but also by the legislature an act of parliament which originated in that branch of the legislature to which the noble and learned lord who presides here belongs and was sanctioned by him was passed to prevent the possibility of an injustice being done through the adherence to the ordinary forms of law in the case of william palmer the crown also under the advice of its responsible ministers resolved that this prosecution should not be left in private hands but that its own law officer my learned friend the attorney-general should take upon himself the responsibility of conducting it and my learned friend when that duty was entrusted to him did what i must say will for ever redound to his honour he resolved that in a case in which so much prejudice had been excited all the evidence which it was intended to press against the prisoner should as soon as he received it be communicated to the prisoner's counsel i must therefore tell my unhappy client that everything which the constituted authorities of the land everything which the legislature and the law officers of the crown could do to secure a fair and impartial trial has been done and if that unhappily an injustice should on either side be committed the whole responsibility will rest upon my lords and upon the jury a most able man was selected by the prisoner as his counsel not many weeks ago but unfortunately was prevented by illness from discharging that office i have endeavoured to the best of my ability to supply his place but i cannot deny that i labour under a deep feeling of responsibility although the national effort so to speak which has been made to ensure a fair trial is a great cause of encouragement to me i am moved by the task that is before me but i am not dismayed i have this further cause for not being altogether overcome in discussing the mass of evidence which has been laid before you when the papers in the case came into my hands i had formed no opinion as to the guilt or innocence of the prisoner my mind was perfectly free to form what i trust will prove to be a right judgment upon the case and i say it in all sincerity having read these papers i commenced his defence with an entire conviction of his innocence i believe that truer words were never pronounced than the words he uttered when he said not guilty to this charge and if i fail in establishing his innocence to your satisfaction i shall have very great misgivings that my failure is attributable only to my own inability to do justice to his case and not to any weakness in the case itself i will prove to you the sincerity with which i declare my conviction of the prisoner's innocence by meeting the case for the prosecution foot to foot and grappling with every difficulty which has been suggested by my learned friend you will see that i shall avoid no point which has been raised i will deal fairly with you and know that i shall have your patient attention to an address which must i fear unavoidably be a long one but in which no observation will be introduced which does not necessarily and properly belong to the case the proposition which my learned friend undertakes to establish entirely by circumstantial evidence may be shortly stated it is that the prisoner having in the second week in november made up his mind that it was his interest to get rid of john parsons cook deliberately prepared his body for the reception of a deadly poison by the slower poison of antimony and that he afterwards dispatched him by the deadly poison of strychnine now no jury will convict a man of the crime thus charged unless it be made clear in the first place that he had some motive for its commission some strong reason for desiring the death of the deceased in the second place 
that the symptoms before death and the appearance of the body after death are consistent with the theory that he died by poison and in the third place that they are inconsistent with the theory that death proceeded from natural causes under these three heads i shall discuss the large mass of evidence which has been laid before you and i must by adhering to that order exhaust the whole subject and leave myself no chance of evading any difficulty without immediate detection before however i proceed to grapple in these close quarters with the case for the crown allow me to restore to its proper place in the discussion a fact which although it was by no means concealed by my learned friend in that address by which he at once seized upon your judgments appeared to me to be thrown too much into the shade the fact i mean that strychnine was not found in the body of the unfortunate deceased if he died of the poison of strychnine if he died within a few hours or within a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes of the administration of a strong dose if the post-mortem examination took place within six days of the death there is not the least reason to suppose that between the time of the injection of the poison and the paroxysms of death there was any dilution of it or any ejection of it by vomiting never therefore unless chemical analysis is altogether a failure in the detection of strychnine were circumstances more favourable for its discovery but beyond all question strychnine was not found whatever we may think of the judgment and experience of dr taylor we have no reason to doubt that he is a very skilful chemist we have no reason to believe in fact we know to the contrary that he and dr rees did not do all that the science of chemical analysis could enable men to do to detect the poison they had a distinct intimation from the executor and near relative of the deceased that he for some cause or another had reason to suspect that poison had been administered they undertook an analysis of the stomach which without now going into details upon that point was not on the whole in an unfavourable condition with a firm expectation that if it was there it would be found and without any doubt as to the efficiency of their tests then in december they say quote, we do not find strychnine prussic acid or any trace of opium from the contents having been drained away not drained out of the jar you know it is now impossible to say whether any strychnine had or had not been given before death but it is quite possible for tartar emetic to destroy life if given in repeated doses and so far as we can at present form an opinion in the absence of any natural cause of death the deceased may have died from the effects of antimony in this or some other form End quote but they afterwards attended the inquest and having heard the evidence of mills of mr jones of lutterworth and of roberts who spoke to the purchase of strychnine on the morning of the death they came to the conclusion that the pills administered to cook on the monday and the tuesday night contained strychnine dr taylor came to that conclusion notwithstanding his written opinion that cook might have been poisoned by antimony and notwithstanding the fact that no trace of strychnine was found in the body i call your attention now to this circumstance in order to claim for it its proper place in the discussion the gentlemen who have come to the conclusion that strychnine may have been in the body although it was not found have arrived at that conclusion from experiments of a very partial kind indeed they contend that when strychnine has once done its fatal work and become absorbed into the into the system it ceases to be the thing it was when taken into the system it becomes decomposed its elements are separated from each other and therefore are no longer capable of responding to the tests which would certainly detect its presence if undecomposed that is their case they account for its not being found and for their belief that it destroyed cook by that hypothesis now it is only a hypothesis 
no authority for it can be drawn from experiments and it is supported by the opinion of no eminent toxicologists but themselves it is only fair to them and to dr taylor in particular to say that dr taylor does propound that theory in his book it is however only a theory of his own he does not support it by the authority of any distinguished toxicologist and when we recollect that his knowledge of the matter good humane man consists in having poisoned five rabbits twenty-five years ago and five others since this question was raised it cannot have much weight but i will call before you a number of gentlemen of high eminence in their professions as analytical chemists who will state their utter renunciation of that theory i will call dr nunnally a fellow of the royal college of surgeons and a professor of chemistry who attended the case at leeds which has been described to you and dr williams professor of materia medica at the royal college of surgeons in ireland for eighteen years surgeon to the city of dublin hospital dr letherby one of the ablest and most distinguished men of science in this great city professor of chemistry and toxicology in the medical college of the london hospital and medical officer of the city of london will tell you that he rejects the theory as a heresy unworthy the belief of scientific men dr nicholas parker of the college of physicians of london and professor of medicine dr robinson of the college of physicians and mr rogers professor of chemistry concur with dr letherby lastly i will call mr william herapath of bristol probably the most eminent chemical analyst in this country who also utterly rejects the theory all of those gentlemen contend that if not only half a grain of strychnine but even one fiftieth part or less has once entered into the human frame it can and must be discovered by the tests known to chemists they will tell you this not as the result of a few experiments for ever regretted upon five rabbits but from large experience as to the operation of the poison upon the inferior animals created as you know for the benefit of mankind and many of them from their experience as to its effects upon the human system i will satisfy you from their evidence that if you admit the correctness of the tests which were used the only safe conclusion at which you can arrive is that strychnine not having been found in the body it could never have been there they all agree too that no degree of putrefaction or fermentation in the human system could so decompose strychnine that it could no longer possess those qualities which cause it in the undecomposed state to respond to chemical tests i will now apply myself to a question which in my judgment is of equal if not greater importance the question whether in the second week of november eighteen fifty five the prisoner had a motive for the commission of this murder a strong reason for desiring that cook should die i never will believe that unless it were made clear that it was his interest to destroy cook you would come to the conclusion that he had committed such a crime it seems to me abundantly clear upon the evidence that not only was it not the interest of palmer that cook should die but that the death of cook was the very worst calamity that could befall him and that he could not possibly be ignorant that it would be followed by his own ruin that it was followed by his immediate ruin we know we know that at the time when it was said he commenced to plot cook's death he was in a condition of the greatest embarrassment an embarrassment which in its extreme intensity had come upon him but recently an embarrassment too in some degree mitigated by the circumstance that the acceptances he is said to have forged were those of his mother a lady of large fortune living in the town my learned friend's hypothesis is that not until he was in a state of the greatest embarrassment did he wish to destroy cook my learned friend stated to you quote, 
that being in desperate circumstances with ruin disgrace and punishment staring him in the face which could only be averted by means of money he took advantage of his intimacy with cook when cook had become the winner of a considerable sum to destroy him in order to obtain possession of his money End quote. let us test this theory let us relieve our minds for a moment from the anxiety we must always feel when the life of a fellow creature is at stake and looking at it as a mere matter of business let us ask ourselves whether in the second week of november palmer had any motive to commit this crime when a long correspondence is read to a jury who are without the same means of testing its importance as the judge or the counsel they frequently do not attach that weight to it which it deserves but i watched the correspondence which was read to you yesterday with an anxiety which no words can express because i firmly believe that in it the innocence of the prisoner lay concealed that it proved not only that the prisoner had no motive to kill cook but that cook's death was ruin to him allow me to call your attention to the relation in which these men stood to each other they had been intimate as racing friends for two or three years they had had many transactions together they were jointly interested in at least one racehorse pyrene they generally stayed at the same hotels they were seen together upon almost all the race courses in the kingdom they were known to be connected in adventures upon the same horses at the same races and although cook being dead the mouth of the prisoner being sealed and transactions of this kind not being recorded in regular books it is impossible to give you positive evidence as to their relations to one another it is abundantly clear that they were very closely connected in august eighteen fifty five money was wanted either by cook or palmer and palmer applied to pratt for it he seems to have wanted two hundred pounds to make up a larger sum having already one hundred and ninety pounds in pratt's hands and he offered a security for the advance his friend mr cook whom he described as a gentleman of respectability and substance we do not know the exact state of cook's affairs at that time as he might have been thrown down in a week with the life he was leading but a young man who is reckless as to the mode in which he employs his money and has only thirteen thousand pounds may for a year or two pass before the world for a man of considerable means it is not every one who will go to doctors commons to ascertain the precise amount of, of the property he has inherited mr cook of lutterworth kept his racehorses lived expensively was known to have inherited a fortune and was altogether a person whose friendship was of considerable importance to a man like palmer recollect that i am not now defending palmer against the crime of forgery nor am i defending him against the imputation of reckless improvidence in obtaining money at an enormous discount but as early as may eighteen fifty five palmer and cook were thus circumstanced what was their position in november the evidence of pratt and the correspondence which he proved can leave no doubt on our minds upon that subject among a mass of bills amounting altogether to eleven thousand five hundred pounds there were two of two thousand pounds each due the last week in october two others amounting to fifteen hundred pounds having become due some time before but being held over from month to month upon payment by palmer who was liable for them of what was called interest at the rate of sixty per cent these three sums two thousand pounds two thousand pounds and fifteen hundred pounds were the embarrassments which were pressing upon him in the second week of november and be it observed they were pressed upon him by a man who although he would doubtless have been glad to get his principal would also upon anything like security have been very well pleased to continue to receive interest how can capital if well secured be better employed than in returning forty or sixty per cent in this state of things palmer in answer to an urgent demand for money came up to town on the twenty seventh of october 
Pratt then insisted that if Palmer could not pay one of the £2,000 bills, which had just become due, he should pay instalments, in addition to the enormous interest charged upon it, and it was agreed that £250 should be paid down. £250 upon the 31st of October, and a further sum of £300 as soon afterwards as possible, making a total payment on account of that bill of £800, to quiet Pratt or his client, and to induce him to let the bill stand over. On the ninth of November the £300 was paid, and then a letter was written, to which I beg your particular attention. On the 13th of November, the day that Polestar won the race, Pratt wrote to Palmer that the case, Palmer against the Prince of Wales Insurance Company, had been laid before Sir F. Kelly, that in the opinion of several secretaries of insurance offices the company had not a leg to stand upon, and that the mere fact of the enormous premium would go a great way to get a verdict. The letter concluded, quote, I count most positively on seeing you on Saturday. Do, for both our sakes, try and make up the amount to £1,000, for without it I shall be unable to renew the £1,500 due on the ninth. End quote. Pratt had threatened to issue a writ against Palmer's mother. Palmer had almost gone upon his knees to beg him not to do so, and this letter really meant, quote, unless you give me two hundred pounds more and make up one thousand pounds, a writ shall be served upon your mother. End quote. That letter is written on the thirteenth of November. Palmer gets it at Rugeley whither he had gone from the race-course on the day that Polestar won. What does he do? He instantly returns to Shrewsbury, gets there on Wednesday, sees Cook. They say he doses him. We will see how probable that is presently. Cook goes to bed, in a state I will not describe, gets up next morning, much more sensible than he went to bed, goes upon the race-course, returns with Palmer to Rugeley upon the Thursday, goes to bed gets up next morning still uncomfortable but able to go and dine with palmer on that day friday on that day the sixteenth of november palmer writes to pratt quote, i am obliged to come to tattersall's on monday to the settling so that i shall not call and see you before monday but a friend of mine will call and leave you two hundred pounds to-morrow and i will give you the remainder on monday end quote. The person who ordinarily settled Cook's accounts was a person named Fisher, a wine merchant in Shoe Lane, who was first called in this case. And on that very day, the day on which Cook dined with Palmer, Cook writes to him, quote, It is of great importance, both to Mr. Palmer and myself, that a sum of £500 should be paid to a Mr. Pratt of 5 Queen Street, Mayfair, tomorrow, without fail. Three hundred pounds has been sent up to-night, and if you will be kind enough to pay the other two hundred pounds to-morrow, on the receipt of this, you will greatly oblige me, and I will give it to you on Monday at Tattersall's. End quote. There is a postscript, which I will read, but upon which I will at present make no observation. Quote, I am much better. End quote. What is the fair inference from these letters? I submit that the inference is that at that date Cook was making himself very useful to Palmer. Pratt was pressing for an additional sum of £200. Palmer communicated his difficulty to Cook, who at once wrote to his agent to pay the £200. More than this, the £300 referred to in the letter as having been paid to-night. The Attorney General the other day means one of these things it either means the three hundred pounds which had been sent up on the ninth of november and if it did then cook knew all about it probably had an interest in palmer's transactions with pratt or if it was a false representation put forward merely for the purpose of putting a good face upon the matter to fisher or it means that on that day three hundred pounds had somehow or other come into their hands and had been by cook made applicable to the convenience of palmer 
whichever way you take it it proves to demonstration that palmer and cook were playing into each other's hands with respect to that heavy encumbrance upon palmer and that palmer could rely upon cook as his fast friend in any such difficulties although when we take the sum total of eleven thousand five hundred pounds his difficulties sound large yet the difficulty of the day was nothing like that because in the reckless spendthrift way in which they were living putting on bills from month to month and paying an enormous interest per annum the actual outlay upon the day of putting on was not considerable i submit that this letter shows that on the day on which it is said that palmer was poisoning cook the sixteenth of november cook was acting towards him in a most friendly manner was acquainted with his circumstances and willing to relieve his embarrassments and actually did devote a portion of his earnings to palmer's purposes i will however make this plainer part of the case of my learned friend is that palmer leaving cook ill in bed at rugeley ran up to town on the monday and intending to dispatch cook that night obtained possession of his shrewsbury winnings by telling herring who was not cook's usual agent that he was authorized by cook to settle his shrewsbury transactions at tattersall's on the monday as on the tuesday cook though generally indisposed was during the greater part of the day quite well he got up and saw his trainer and two jockeys the theory of the case for the prosecution is that he was quite well because palmer was not there to dose him you will see how grossly and contemptibly absurd that is presently being well on monday and tuesday do you not think that had not cook known that palmer did not intend to go to his regular agent fisher he would have been very much surprised that he on tuesday morning received no letter from that gentleman informing him of the settlement of his transactions and could palmer as a man of business have relied upon an absence of such surprise and alarm on the part of cook we have the evidence of fisher that he at cook's request contained in the letter of the seventeenth of november advanced the two hundred pounds which he would had he settled cook's affairs have been entitled to deduct from the money he would have received at tattersall's on the monday he did not settle those affairs and the money has never been paid that explains the whole transaction cook and palmer understood each other perfectly well it was the interest of both of them that palmer should be relieved from the pressure of pratt accordingly cook said quote, this settlement shall not go through fisher's hands we have got to pay the two hundred pounds to pratt but it shall not be repaid to him on monday i will let palmer go to london and settle the whole thing through herring End quote. that was done and accordingly fisher has never been paid there is a letter to which i will particularly call your attention it is one sent by palmer to pratt on the nineteenth november eighteen fifty five quote, you will place the fifty pounds which i have just paid you and the four hundred and fifty pounds you will receive by mr herring together five hundred pounds and the two hundred pounds you received on saturday that is the two hundred pounds which fisher paid to pratt at the express request of cook towards payment of my mother's acceptance for two thousand pounds due on the twenty fifth of october making paid to this day the sum of thirteen hundred pounds taking that letter with the one which cook wrote to fisher on friday the sixteenth can you doubt that on that day cook was a most convenient friend to palmer who could not by possibility do without him it does not end there cook died at one o'clock on the morning of wednesday the twenty first of november if we want to know what influence that death had upon palmer we must take it from the letters on the twenty second of november and i am sure you will make some allowance for a day having elapsed from the death of cook palmer writes to pratt quote, ever since i saw you i have been fully engaged with cook and not able to leave home End quote. unless he murdered cook that is the truest sentence that ever was penned 
he watched the bedside of his friend he was with him night and day he attended him as a brother he called his friends around him he did all that the most affectionate solicitude could do for a friend unless he was plotting his death Quote, ever since i saw you i have been fully engaged with cook and not able to leave home i am sorry to say after all he died this day so you had better write to saunders but mind you i must have polestar if it can be so arranged and should any one call upon you to know what money or monies cook ever had from you don't answer the question till i have seen you End quote. Quote, i will send you the seventy five pounds to-morrow as soon as i have been to manchester you shall hear about the monies i sat up two full nights with cook and am very much tired out End quote. and did he not was it not true it may not be true that he sat up the whole of the nights but he was ready to be called if cook should be ill elizabeth mills says that after the first serious paroxysm on the monday night she left palmer in the armchair sleeping by the side of the man whom the prosecution say he had attempted to murder no murderers do not sleep by their victims what was pratt's answer to palmer's letter i will read it that you may see what quick run cook's death brought upon palmer that answer dated november twenty second is as follows Quote, I have your note, and am greatly disappointed at the non-receipt of the money as promised, and at the vague assurances as to any money. I can understand, tis true, that your being detained by the illness of your friend has been the cause of not sending up the larger amount, but the smaller sum you ought to have sent. If anything unpleasant occurs, you must thank yourself. The death of Mr. Cook will now compel you to look about as to the payment of the bill for five hundred pounds on the second of December. I have written to Saunders informing him of my claim, and requesting to know by return what claim he has for keeping and training. I send down copy of bill of sale to Crubble to see it enforced. End quote. So that the first effect of Cook's death was, in the opinion of Pratt, who knew all about it, to saddle palmer with the sum of five hundred pounds now i will undertake to satisfy you that the transactions out of which that bill for five hundred pounds arose were transactions for cook's benefit and in which palmer lent his name to accommodate cook upon whose death he became primarily and alone responsible for the bill let me state that the view which my learned friend the attorney-general takes of that transaction because I intend to meet his case foot by foot, and I shall, I hope, convince him that, if he had had the option, he would never have taken up this case. The crown would never have appeared in it. The universal feeling in the country was, however, such as to render it impossible that the case should not be tried. After the verdict of willful murder had been obtained upon the evidence of Dr. Taylor, and the crown felt that it would be neglecting its solemn duty to protect every one of the queen's subjects if it did not take care that a man against whom there was no such prejudice a man leading the life which palmer has led disgraced as it were by forgeries to a large amount and a gambler by profession should have a fair trial there was no way of securing that as my learned friend at once saw no possibility of, of the prisoner's being saved except by giving to the counsel who defended him all the information which my learned friend himself possessed the view which my learned friend takes of the five hundred pounds of transaction the theory on which he thinks it probable that palmer plotted the death of cook is this Quote, pratt still declining to advance the money palmer proposed an assignment by cook of two racehorses one called polestar which won the strosbury races and another called sirius that assignment was afterwards executed by cook in favour of pratt and cook therefore was clearly entitled to the money which was raised upon that security which realised three hundred and seventy five pounds in cash and a wine warrant for sixty five pounds 
palmer contrived however that the money and the wine warrant should be sent to him and not to cook mr pratt sent down his cheque to palmer in the country on a stamp as the act of parliament required and he availed himself of the opportunity now afforded by law of striking out the word bearer and writing order the effect of which was to necessitate the endorsement of cook on the back of the cheque it was not intended by palmer that those proceeds should fall into cook's hands and accordingly he forged the name of john parsons cook on the back of that cheque cook never received the money and you will see that within ten days from that period when he came to his end the bill in respect of that transaction which was at three months would have fallen due when it must have become apparent that palmer received the money and that in order to obtain it he had forged the endorsement of cook end quote. that is the view which the prosecution take of the case and i think i shall be able to satisfy you that it cannot possibly be the correct one we know from pratt exactly what took place palmer wrote to him saying quote, i have undertaken to get the enclosed bill cashed for mr cook you have the two hundred pound bill of his he is a very good and responsible man will you do it i will put my name to the bill End quote. so that it was represented to pratt as a transaction for the accommodation of cook pratt's answer to that is quote, if mr cook chooses to give me security i have no objection but he must execute a bill of sale on his two horses pole star and sirius more he must execute a power of attorney and his signature to both must be witnessed by some solicitor in the country so that i may be quite sure that it is a really valid security if cook will do that i will give him three hundred and seventy five pounds in money and a wine warrant for sixty five pounds which charging ten pounds for expenses and fifty pounds for discount will make five hundred pounds there can be no doubt that cook attached great value to sirius and polestar which mayor was probably then booked for the engagements in which he won so much money at shrewsbury and it is to the last degree improbable that he would have executed this bill of sale with a power of attorney to enable the mortgage or assignee to enforce it at once effectually and yet have received no money would he if such had been the case have remained quiet to the day of his death and never have written to pratt to say that although he had sent him the required documents he had never received the money cook was as much in want of money as palmer was and would he thus have thrown away his money is it credible that if palmer had misappropriated the cheque he could for three months have kept cook in ignorance of the transaction is it not probable that cook's name was written on the cheque with his full knowledge and consent it is not suggested that there was any attempt to imitate his handwriting is it not more probable that cook who i will prove to you from the letter wanted ready money and who would probably be put to inconvenience by receiving only a cheque which he could not get cashed for a day or two took the ready money three hundred and fifteen pounds which pratt sent at the same time to palmer and that palmer took the cheque on the sixth of september palmer wrote to pratt quote, i received the cheque for one hundred pounds and will thank you to let me have the three hundred and fifteen pounds by return of post if possible if not send it me certain by monday night's post to the post office doncaster i now return you cook's papers signed etc and he wants the money on saturday if he can have it but i have not promised it for saturday i told him he should have it on tuesday morning at doncaster so please enclose it with mine in cash in a registered letter and he must pay for it being registered do not let it be later than monday night's post to doncaster so that palmer asked that it should be sent like his own cook according to the letter wanting it in cash pratt replied to palmer acknowledging the receipt of the documents and promising that he would send him his money to doncaster on the monday and would endeavour to let cook have his at the same time on the ninth of september palmer wrote to pratt quote, 
you must send me for mr cook by monday night's post to the post office doncaster three hundred and eighty five pounds instead of three hundred and seventy five pounds and the wine warrant so that i can hand it to him with the three hundred and seventy five pounds and that will be allowing you fifty pounds for the discount etc i shall then get ten pounds and i expect i shall have to take the wine and give him the money but i shall not do so if you do not send three hundred and eighty five pounds and be good enough to enclose my three hundred and fifteen pounds with it in cash in a registered letter and direct it to me at the post office doncaster End quote. in these letters there is an intimation that cook wanted the money on the saturday he was inconvenienced by only getting a cheque upon london which he could not immediately change and therefore palmer gave him the money and took the cheque it is remarkable that when we look at the banking account of palmer at rugeley we find that the three hundred and seventy five pounds is paid in by somebody to his account but that the three hundred and fifteen pounds is not paid in to his account at all the bill was accepted for cook's accommodation cook gave security for it and he never during the three months which elapsed before his death complained to pratt that he had not received the money for it i submit that the fair version of the transaction is that which is given in a letter from palmer that palmer let cook have the cash and himself took the cheque having cook's authority to put his name at the back of it how else can you account for the silence of cook and for the fact that the three hundred and seventy five pounds is paid into the rugeley bank but there is no trace of the three hundred and fifteen pounds this being so the result of cook's death was to make palmer liable for the five hundred pounds bill on the back of which he had put his name therefore i submit to you that on the second motive suggested by my learned friend the attorney-general the case has entirely failed in addition to this however we find from these letters the difficulties which the death of cook brought upon palmer we find the disappointment of pratt that he could send no more money the bill of five hundred pounds the danger of losing polestar which palmer very much wanted to have and which pratt would unless paid the five hundred pounds bring to the hammer in order to realize his security and we find that inquiries were at once apprehended from cook's friends as to the monies which pratt had paid to cook and the probable value which the latter had received from the endorsements and acceptances which he had given there is another although not so strong a reason why it is improbable that palmer should have desired the death of cook mr weatherby has told us to-day that although it frequently happens that the monies won at a race are sent up by the clerk of the course in the week after the race yet that does not always happen on tuesday november the twentieth on the night of which day he died cook who was then perfectly sensible perfectly comfortable and happy and enjoying the society of his friend mr jones gave to palmer a cheque for three hundred and fifty pounds upon weatherby's if palmer killed cook and it happened that frail had not sent up the money so as to be there on wednesday morning weatherby's would not pay the cheque nor would they have cashed it if they had received information that cook had died during the night it actually happened that the cheque when presented was not paid because frail did not send up the money was it probable that palmer having got from cook a cheque for three hundred and eighty pounds would have run the risk of losing his money by destroying him the same night it is suggested that he obtained this cheque fraudulently and then lest cook should detect the fraud destroyed him that was not likely to answer his purpose he might be certain that directly the breath was out of cook's body jones would go to mr stevens that stevens and bradford cook's brother-in-law would go down to rugeley that the death being sudden there would most likely be a post-mortem examination and that instead of settling for the five hundred pounds bill and the three hundred and fifty pounds cheque with cook he would have to settle with hard men of business men who cared nothing for him who would probably look upon him as a leg upon the turf 
and would regard neither his feelings nor his interests but would let him go to ruin any way he might not stirring a finger to save him is it probable that a shrewd intelligent man of business would make such a choice as that more than this we know that at that very time herring held one bill for five hundred pounds and three for two hundred pounds each to which there were the names of both palmer and cook and for all of which either in the whole or in part cook must unless he rushed to his own ruin provide if palmer put cook to death he immediately became solely liable not only for these bills but for that as security for which the bill of sale was executed on sirius and polestar which could not be so easily renewed as those for the large sums on which the enormous usury was paid that bill would very likely soon find its way to his mother and that it should do so would not suit palmer for his mother is a respectable and serious person who although she loved her son did not like and gave no encouragement to his gambling nor did that excellent and most honourable man who stands by him his brother who was estranged from him for a length of time until this calamity came upon him simply because he disapproved of gambling he disapproved the gambling by which he lived cook being dead there was therefore no one to save palmer from ruin for in all this voluminous evidence there is not the smallest trace that there was any one else in the world who would lend palmer his name or would assist him to obtain money if it be as it is stated a fact that he forged the name of his mother is not that conclusive evidence that he had no other resource but the good nature the easiness perhaps the folly of cook is it then credible that under such circumstances he would have desired to bring upon himself not merely the creditors and executors of cook but their solicitors men who in the discharge of their duty to their clients can have no sympathy for any one and with whom no arrangement is possible i have therefore i hope shown you that palmer had an interest in the life of cook but more than that was it safe for him that cook should die palmer was a man who had a shrewd knowledge of the world and a knowledge of his profession and among other things of chemistry my learned friends have put in a book which was found in his house and among other notes one in which there is this quote, strychnia kills by causing tetanic fixing of the respiratory muscles End quote. in the same book there are many other notes lord campbell the attorney-general stated that he did not place much reliance upon that note mr sergeant she my learned friend did not press this note but he thought it was evidence which ought to be before you the jury i use it to satisfy you that palmer had studied his profession sufficiently to know and knew perfectly well that if strychnine were administered it would in all probability kill the victim in horrible convulsions in a very short time and in a way so striking as to be the talk of a small neighbourhood like rugeley for a month or more time enough to alarm everybody and provoke inquiry into the circumstances of the death which must certainly in all probability end in the detection of guilt if that is so was he at that time so circumstanced as to render it safe for him to run the risk of such suspicions his brother walter palmer had died in the month of august and unless his mother forgave him or recognised the acceptance his only hope of extraction from his difficulties lay in getting from the prince of wales office the money due to him as assignee of the policy on his brother's life that his chance of getting that money was good is shown by the fact that he refused the offer of the office to return the premium and that it was upon it that pratt had obtained the discounts and had resolved under the direction of palmer to put it in suit it was really the only unpledged property which he had and how he was situated with regard to it appears from the letters and from the evidence 
the insurance company annoyed at being called upon to pay so large a sum was determined to do all they could to resist it they accordingly sent inspector field and his man to stafford to make inquiries they could not do this without talking and this has been going on for some time to show that this had been the case the learned sergeant read the deposition of the witness dean who was examined yesterday so that just before the death of cook palmer knew himself to be the subject of what he appeared from his actions to consider a most unfounded and unwarrantable suspicion he put the policy into the hands of an attorney to enforce payment of the sum due upon it the office met the claim by insinuations and inquiries which were of a nature to destroy his character and to bring upon his head the suspicion of a murder the pressure by pratt upon palmer to meet the two thousand pound bills did not commence until the office disputed the payment of that policy all went as smooth as possible as long as pratt held what he believed to be a good security but when they began to dispute that pratt writes to palmer and tells him that the state of things is changed after saying that nothing can be done towards compelling the office to pay until the twenty fourth he says in his letter of the second of october quote, this you will observe quite alters arrangements and i therefore must request that you make preparations for meeting the two bills due at the end of this month in any event bear in mind that you must be prepared to cover your mother's acceptances for the four thousand pounds due at the end of the month end quote. there was the pinch the office would not pay and bills for four thousand pounds were coming due if anything occurred to increase the suspicions of the office which was very very unwilling to pay all chance of the thirteen thousand pounds was lost that thirteen thousand pounds is sure to be paid unless that man pointing to the prisoner is convicted of murder as sure as he is saved and saved i believe he will be that thirteen thousand pounds will be paid there is no defence no pretence of a defence the premium taken was an enormous one and that thirteen thousand pounds is good for him and will pay all his creditors this correspondence of which my learned friend must have taken a view different from any which i can take but which i am sure he would have put in whatever had been his view of it this correspondence saves the prisoner if there is common sense in man here is another letter from pratt to palmer dated october the sixth i have your note acknowledging receipt by your mother of the two thousand pounds acceptance due on the second of october why not let her acknowledge it herself you must really not fail to come up at once if it be for the purpose of arranging for the payment of the two bills at the end of the month remember i can make no terms for their renewal and they must be paid i will of course hold the policy for so much as it is worth but in the present position of the affair no one except your mother who is liable upon the bills can look upon it as a security that was because simpson and field were down there making inquiries do not neglect attending to this for under a recent act bills of exchange are now recovered in a few days you know and can appreciate my conduct in avoiding all trouble and annoyance to your mother but to that there is a limit i cannot by any representation be a party to inducing anybody to believe that security exists where there is doubt upon the point p s i cast no doubt upon the capability of the office to pay but in the nature of things with so large an amount in question it is not to be surprised at if they think they have grounds of objection they should temporize by delay End quote does not this show that on the sixth of october suspicions were hanging over palmer's head which would come down with irresistible momentum and crush him if there were a suspicion of another violent and sudden death do you think that a man who had written in his manual what were the effects of strychnine would risk such a scene as that poison would develop in the presence of the dearest and best friend of cook a man whom he could not influence 
and a medical man who loved cook so well as to sleep in the same room with him that he might be ready to attend him in case he needed assistance is that common sense are you going to enforce such a theory as that which dr a taylor propounded as to the effects which strychnine produces upon rabbits impossible perfectly impossible i will prove the position in which palmer stood still more clearly on the tenth of october pratt in a letter addressed to him says quote, i may add that i hear they the insurance company have been making inquiries in every direction to be sure they had field the detective officer had been at stratford where he could make inquiries as well as at rugeley but on what they ground the dissatisfaction is as yet a mystery in any event no step can be taken to compel payment until after the fourth of december End quote. it is plain that suspicions were then rife or that attempts were made to excite suspicions against him with regard to the death of walter palmer on the eighteenth of october pratt enclosed to palmer a letter from the solicitor of the company stating that the directors had determined upon declining to pay the amount claimed but that although the facts disclosed in the course of their inquiries would have warranted their retention of the premiums which had been paid they were prepared to refund them to any one who might be shown to be legally entitled to them palmer determined that the money should be paid and a case was laid before sir fitzroy kelly if anything happened to cook by foul play he had no more chance of receiving this thirteen thousand pounds than of obtaining a hundred and thirty thousand pounds from all this i infer not only that palmer had no interest in cook's death but that he had a direct pecuniary interest in his living i think it is impossible that i should be so much mistaken as that a considerable portion of what i have advanced should not be worthy of your attention and i therefore submit to you to the court and to my learned friend that the case as to this supposed motive for the crime has failed we now proceed to the facts of the case and in considering them it will be necessary to group them without entire reference to dates End of section thirteen. Section 14 of the Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Section 14. The Defence. Seventh Day Continued. I will first inquire whether the symptoms with which Cook was attacked and the appearances presented by his body after death were consistent with the theory of his having died by strychnia poison and inconsistent with that of his having died from some other natural cause it is under this head that i shall discuss i hope not unduly the medical evidence in this case and present to you such observations as occur to me on the witnesses who have been called to support the view which the crown takes of the effect of that medical testimony cook died at one o'clock in the morning of wednesday november twenty first in the presence of jones it was no sooner light than jones posted to town and saw his stepfather mr stevens mr stevens went down to rugeley and was introduced to palmer palmer went with him to the talbot arms and uncovered the corpse a bold thing to do if he had murdered him the body was so little emaciated or affected by disease that stevens wondered he could be dead but he observed some little rigidity about the muscles stevens's suspicions were roused he asked palmer to dinner questioned him about the betting book got angry that it was not produced dissembled with palmer cross-examined him went up to town met him at euston square again at wolverton at rugby and at rugeley at last he gave him to understand that he suspected him and intended to probe the whole matter to the bottom he resolved to have a post-mortem examination and that examination took place the appearances presented by the body after death were such as might have been anticipated by those who were acquainted with his course of life 
his general health, his pursuits, and not to say anything hard of him, his vices, and the drinking, racing company which he kept. His father had died at thirty years of age, his mother about the same age, a few years after her second marriage. His sister was dead, and he himself was affected with a pulmonary disorder. Cook had been suffering for a long time from a sore throat, and bore about him all the signs and indications of having led a licentious life. Indeed, he appears to have been about as dissipated a young man as can be well imagined. I do not mean to say that he was utterly depraved, or that he was lost to all sense of honour and propriety, but it does not admit of doubt that his manner of living was wild, riotous, and extravagant. His complaints indicated his excesses, and he was avowedly addicted to pursuits the reverse of commendable. When his body was opened, there was evidence of a soreness of the tongue. I do not go to the length of saying that there was anything to lead to the inference that there was an actual sore at the time of death, but there were follicles and symptoms, if not of a recent, certainly of a not very remote ulcer. The inside of the mouth had been ulcerated, and the skin taken off on both sides. There is abundant evidence to show that Cook was himself of opinion that these symptoms were syphilitic. He could scarcely be persuaded to obey the instructions of Dr. Savage, the respectable and very competent physician whom he consulted, and though it is admitted that he was not fool enough to go to quack doctors, it is very certain that he was weak enough to follow the counsels of every medical man who would venture to give him advice when coincided with his own opinion that mercury was the best thing for his complaint the spots which are the fatal characteristics of his dreadful malady had already made their appearance on his body and he was haunted by the apprehension that some day as he was running about the race-course his face would be suddenly covered over with copper blotches, which would leave no doubt on the minds of those who saw them as to the nature of his disease. Many a man similarly affected has retrieved his position, redeemed his character, and become a virtuous member of society. Far be it from me, then, to say one word that would press with undue severity on the memory of the dead but no false delicacy shall deter me from the discharge of my duty and i make these remarks not in an unkind or censorious spirit but for the sake of truth and because the state of cook's health is a most important element in this inquiry it is certain that it was his own opinion that he was suffering from virulent syphilis and in this opinion the medical men who originally attended him did not hesitate to concur that he did not correct his habits is evident from the fact that within a recent period of his death he had again become diseased when his body was opened on the second examination there were found between the delicate membrane which the spinal marrow covers and is called the arachnoid and embedded to some extent in the next covering not so delicate termed the dogma mater granules about one inch in extent and i will satisfy you upon the evidence of witnesses whose authority will not be questioned that if the body had been opened in the dead house of any hospital in this metropolis those granules would have been regarded as symptoms affording conclusive explanation of the cause of death such then was the condition of cook's health a condition but partially and imperfectly revealed by the first post-mortem examination that examination was not conducted with the same minuteness and precision that circumstances rendered necessary on a subsequent occasion and the syphilitic disease was neither ascertained nor suspected the stomach was taken out and you have heard the suggestion which were it not that the court has ruled it to be of no significance i should have been prepared to disprove that palmer attempted to interfere with the operation by shoving against the medical man engaged in it the inference sought to be deduced was that some of the stomach escaped from the jar but we have the evidence of dr devonshire himself that such was not the fact none of it did escape and it was sent up in its entirety to london 
there to be analysed by Dr. Taylor and Dr. Rees. Those gentlemen examined it with the knowledge that, owing to the report of Palmer having purchased a fatal drug from Mr. Roberts on the day of the death, there was a suspicion of foul play. Mr. Stevens talked of the fact to Dr. Taylor, and, with the consciousness of it on his mind, that gentleman wrote a letter attributing the death to antimony. Dr. Taylor intimated dissent. Well, if the letter is not to be so understood, it is at all events susceptible of this interpretation, that the death may have been caused by antimony. Dr. Taylor attends the coroner's inquest, which, in all probability, is held in consequence of his own letter. He hears the evidence of Jones, Roberts, and Mills, and it is but natural to presume that these are the witnesses whose testimony has the greatest influence on his opinion. He forms his judgment on the evidence of chambermaids, waitresses, and housekeepers, and contrary to the opinion of the medical man who attended Cook in his last illness, for be it remembered he had no encouragement from Mr. Jones, the surgeon of Lutterworth, a man of age and character, to form a sound decision on the case, he comes boldly and at once to the conclusion that his original notion about antimony having been the cause of death was a mistake, and then he has the incredible imprudence, an imprudence which has necessitated this trial, or at all events rendered it necessary that it should take place in this form and place, to declare upon his oath to the coroner's jury that he believes that the pills given to Cook on Monday and Tuesday contained strychnine, and that Cook was consequently poisoned. That evidence of his is carried on the wings of the press into every house in the United Kingdom. It becomes known throughout the length and breadth of the land that Dr. Taylor, a man who has devoted his life to science, a man of the highest personal character, and who stands well with his medical friends, has declared, not as a conjectural opinion, mark you, nor as a reserved opinion delivered in a private room to a few men whose discretion might be relied on, but that in the public room of a public inn, in a little public village, where everything that occurs is known, he has declared upon his solemn oath that it is his belief that Cook died because those pills containing strychnine were administered to him on the nights of Monday and Tuesday, he had himself failed to discover the faintest traces of strychnine, yet at the coroner's inquest he had the hardihood to declare his conviction that the pills contained strychnine and that Cook died of them. His evidence is neither consistent with itself nor with the opinion of Mr. Jones. He takes it upon him to pronounce positively, in the face of the world, that Cook's disease was nothing else than tetanus, and tetanus, too, of the kind that can be produced by poison only, and that poison strychnine. Such was Dr. Taylor's testimony, and on such testimony the coroner's jury returned their verdict. But, merciful heaven, in what position are we placed for the safety of our own lives and those of our families, if, on evidence such as this, men are to be put on their trial for foul murder as often as a sudden death occurs in any household if science is to be allowed to come and dogmatize in our courts and not science that is successful in its operations or exact in its nature but science that is baffled by its own tests and bears upon its forehead the motto a little learning is a dangerous thing if I say science such as this is to be suffered to dogmatize in our courts and to utter judgment which its own processes fail to vindicate, life is no longer secure, and there is thrown upon judges and jurymen a weight of responsibility too grievous for human nature to endure. If Dr. Taylor had detected the poison by his own tests, he, with his long experience in toxicological studies, would have been an excellent witness for the crown but he has not found the poison and not having seen the patient and knowing nothing of his deathbed symptoms beyond what he gathered from the evidence of an ignorant servant girl 
and of mr jones whose testimony does not show that he agrees with him in opinion dr taylor thinks himself justified in declaring upon his oath in a public court that the pills contained strychnine and that cook was poisoned if verdicts are to be moulded on testimony such as this what medical practitioner is safe on what ground does dr taylor vindicate his opinion he does not appear to have seen one solitary case of strychnine in the human subject yet with the full knowledge that the consequences of his assertion might be disastrous to the prisoner at the bar he has the audacity to assert that the pills which for anything he knows to the contrary were the same that dr bamford prepared contained strychnine and that cook was poisoned by it i have quoted the sentiment a little learning is a dangerous thing and assuredly to no science is that maxim so applicable as to the medical of all god's works there is no other which so eloquently attests our entire dependence on him and our own nothingness as that mortal coil in which we live and breathe and have our being we are struck with amazement as we contemplate it we feel we see we hear yet the instant we attempt to give a reason for these sensations our path is crossed by the mystery of creation and all we know is that god created man that he is our omnipotent maker and we the work of his hands yet we fancy that we can penetrate all mysteries and there are no bounds to our arrogance there has been much talk in this inquiry of the two kinds of tetanus idiopathic and traumatic dr todd urged by the court to explain the former described it as constitutional perhaps self-generating would have done as well but let that pass but how is our knowledge advanced by translating idiopathic as constitutional it is easy to give an english translation of that greek compound but the thing is to explain what the translation means what is the meaning of the phrase constitutional tetanus lord campbell tetanus not occasioned by external injury mr sergeant sheen just so my lord or in other words tetanus not referable to any known cause but in truth idiopathic means in general sense unaccountable not that constitutional tetanus is always and invariably so but that cases of tetanus do continually occur of which you can only suspect the cause and attribute it by hypothesis to a cold or some other vague accident in such cases you say that the disease is idiopathic and not traumatic the crown will have it that cook's was the tetanus of poison but it is almost an assumption to say that it was tetanus at all that he died of convulsions or immediately after them is certain and that they were convulsions similar to those from which he suffered on the preceding night is beyond all doubt but what pretence is there for positively asserting that they were tetanus at all the evidence of mr jones fairly interpreted cannot be construed otherwise than as intimating an impression that they were convulsions which partook of the tetanic character that might be and yet the malady might not be tetanus it is bad reasoning most defective logic to argue without positive proof of the fact that the disease was tetanus and no other tetanus in the world than that produced by poison following in the trail dragged for them by the toxicologists the crown have thought proper to impute the death of this man to the poison of strychnine it is for them to prove the fact we contest it but it by no means follows that we should be bound to explain the death on other grounds we can satisfy you that this man was assailed by any one of the numerous kinds of convulsions to which humanity is liable and that he was asphyxiated or deprived of life when writhing in some sudden spasm or paroxysm we shall have done all that can in fairness be demanded of us unless indeed the crown shall be prepared to prove that cook's symptoms were irreconcilable with any other doctrine than that of death by strychnine this they have not done and cannot do 
i propose to call your attention to the statements of the witnesses mills and jones with respect to the symptoms which they observed in cook on the evenings of monday and tuesday and having done so i will submit to your candid judgment whether those symptoms may not be more naturally accounted for by attributing them to convulsions which are not tetanic at all and most assuredly not tetanic in the distinctive character of strychnine but which may rather be classed under those ordinary convulsions by means of which it constantly pleases providence to strike men down without leaving upon their bodies the faintest indications from which the cause of death may be inferred you have it upon the authority of medical men of the highest distinction that it sometimes occurred that men in the prime of life and in the full vigour of health are smitten to death by convulsions that leave no trace upon the body of the sufferer the statements mills and jones are such as to render it entirely unnecessary to resort to the hypothesis of any kind of tetanus much less to that of strychnine in accounting for the death of cook regard being had to the delicate state of his health and to the continually recurring derangement of his constitution it is far safer to conclude that he died of ordinary convulsions than of any description of tetanus whether traumatic idiopathic or that produced by poison nor must we omit to inquire into the state of his mind he went to shrewsbury races on the imminent peril of returning from thence a ruined man his father-in-law mr stevens assured palmer that there would not be four thousand shillings for those who had claims on his estate from the necessity he was under of raising money at an enormous discount we may easily infer that he was in desperate difficulties and that unless some sudden success on the turf should retrieve his fortunes his case was hopeless his health shattered his mind distracted he had long been cherishing the hope that polestar would win and so put him in possession of a sum amounting in stakes and winnings to something like a thousand guineas the mare it is true was hardly his own she had been mortgaged and if she should lose she would become the property of another person picture to yourself what must have been the condition mental and bodily of that young man when he rose from his bed on the morning of the races it is scarcely possible that as he went down to breakfast this thought must not have crossed his mind my fate is trembling in the balance this is the crisis of my destiny unless my horse shall win and give me one chance more of recovering myself to-night i am a beggar with these feelings he repairs to the race-course another race is run before polestar is brought out his impatience is extreme he looks on in a state of agonizing excitement will the minutes never fly at last arrives the decisive moment the time has come for the race the flag is dropped the horses start his mare wins easily and he her master has won a thousand guineas for three minutes he is not able to speak so intense is his emotion slowly he recovers his utterance and then how rapturous is his joy he is saved he is saved another chance to retrieve his position one chance more to recover his character and yet at all events he will not be a disgrace to his family and his friends conceive him to be with all his faults an honourable young man and you may easily imagine what his ecstasy must have been he loves the memory of his dead mother he still reverences the name of his father he is jealous of his sister's honour and it may be that he cherishes silently in his heart the thought of some other being dearer still than all to whom the story of his ruin would bring bitter anguish but he is not ruined he will meet his engagements like an honourable man there is now no danger of his being an outcast an adventurer a blackleg he will live to redeem his position and to give joy to those who love him with such thoughts in his heart he returns to his inn in a state of indescribable elation and with a revulsion from despair he must have convulsed though not in the sense of illness every fibre of his frame his first idea is to entertain his friends and he does so the evidence does not prove that he drank to excess but he gave a champagne dinner 
and we all know that it is a luxurious entertainment at which there is no stint and not much self-respect that evening he did not spend in the society of palmer indeed it is not clear in whose company he spent it but we find him on the evening of wednesday at the unicorn with saunders his trainer and a lady on thursday he walks upon the course and herring remonstrates with him for doing so as the day is damp and misty and the ground wet that night he is seized with illness and he continues ailing until his death at rugeley arrived at rugeley it is but natural to suppose that a reaction of feeling may have set in then the dark side of the picture may have presented itself to his imagination the chilling thought may have come upon him that his winnings were already forestalled and would scarcely suffice to save him from destruction it is when suffering from a weakened body and an irritated and excited mind he is attacked with a sickness which clings to his system leaves him without any rest incapacitates him from taking food distracts his nerves and places him in imminent danger of falling a victim to any sudden attack of convulsions to which he may have a predisposition he relished no society so much as that of palmer whose residence was immediately opposite the talbot arms inn where he was lying on his sick-bed for two nights he had been taking opiate pills prescribed by dr bamford on sunday night at twelve o'clock he started as from a dream in the state of the utmost excitement and alarm he admitted afterwards that for two minutes he was mad but could not ascribe to it anything unless to his having been awakened by a swabble in the street but do no such things happen to people of sound constitutions and regular habits do no such people awaken in agony and delirium because there is a noise under their windows no these are the afflictions of the dissipated and the anxious whose bodies are shattered and whose minds are distracted next day monday he was pretty well but not so well as to mount his horse or to take a walk in the fields he could converse with his trainer and jockey but he took no substantial food and drank not a drop of brandy and water you will bear in mind that palmer was not with him that day in the middle of the night he was seized with an attack similar in character to that of the night preceding but manifestly much milder for he retained his consciousness throughout it and was not mad for a moment the evidence of elizabeth mills is conclusive on the point the learned sergeant read some passages from the deposition of the witness in question at three o'clock on the following day tuesday mr jones the surgeon of lutworth arrived and spent a considerable time probably from three to seven o'clock in his company they had abundant opportunity for conversing confidentially and they were likely to have done so for they were very intimate and jones appears to have been on more familiar terms with cook than was any other person not even excepting mr stevens nothing occurred in the entire and unbounding confidence which must have existed between mr cook and mr jones to raise any suspicions in the minds of mr jones and at the consultation which took place between seven and eight o'clock on tuesday evening between jones palmer and bamford as to what the medicine for that evening should be the fit of the monday night was not mentioned that is a remarkable fact the crown may say that it is remarkable inasmuch as palmer knew it and said not a word about it but i think that it shows that the fit was so little serious in the opinion of cook that he did not think it worth mentioning to his intimate friend jones if cook had not given to elizabeth mills a rather exaggerated description of what had occurred would he not have said to mr jones when he came from lutterworth to see him you can't judge of my condition from my appearance now for i was in a state of perfect madness overnight and in fact i thought i was going to die evidently he would have said something of that sort and if he had mr jones would have mentioned it at the consultation my inference then is that the first statement which was made by elizabeth mills was the correct statement of what occurred 
palmer in the presence of jones administered two pills to mr cook which it is supposed poisoned him which contained the substance which sometimes does its deadly work in a quarter of an hour which has done it in less and which rarely exceeds half an hour and we are asked to believe that in spite of cook's objecting in the presence of his friends to take the pills palmer positively forced them down his throat at the imminent peril of the man falling down in a few minutes in convulsions evidently tetanic as in the course of the examination of mr jones the word tetanus was used it is right that i should say a word upon that subject the word tetanus is not in his deposition but i tell you what is in it and it is one of the most remarkable features of this case because it shows how people when they get a theory into their heads will fag that theory how they will stretch it to the very utmost and make it fit into the exact place in which they wish to put it we have it now in the evidence of dr taylor that at the inquest he sat next to mr dean the attorney's clerk and suggested the questions which it was necessary in his judgment to put in order to elicit the truth as to the symptoms of mr cook's disease now fancy dr taylor who had had a letter telling him that there was a suspicion of strychnine and who had all but made up his mind at that time to state positively upon oath his opinion that the pills given on monday and tuesday nights contain strychnine fancy the attorney-general i am sorry that my learned friend should be misled upon a matter of fact but i am told that dr taylor was not present when mr jones was examined mr shee continued then the observation which i was about to make does not apply and all i can say is that mr jones had probably in his mind's eye when he gave that evidence a recollection of what he had seen on the tuesday night he could not have seen very accurately however for he said that there was only one candle in the room and that he had not light enough to see the patient's face and that he could not tell whether there was much change in the countenance of the deceased a very important fact when the doctors all say that cook's disease cannot have been traumatic tetanus because there is always a peculiar expression on the countenance in those cases which was not observable in cook however mr jones who is a competent professional man gave his evidence and it is quite clear that the notion of tetanus must have entered into his mind because i find it in the depositions that the coroner's clerk first put down tetanus and the probability i think is that the disease did occur to mr jones at the time and that he used the word because the clerk never could have invented it then tetanus is struck out then the word convulsions is written and also struck out and as the sentence stands it is quote, there were strong symptoms of violent convulsions end quote. what is the fair inference from that why that the man who saw cook in the paroxysm did not think himself justified in saying that it was a tetanic convulsion at all though it was very like tetanus now i will just call your attention to the features of general convulsions as described in cross-examination by the medical witnesses in order to show that the convulsions of which cook died were not tetanic properly speaking but were of that strong and irregular kind which cannot be classed under the head of tetanus either traumatic or idiopathic but under the head of general convulsions i propose upon this part of the case to read an extract from the work of dr copland which will enable you to judge whether cook's complaint bears a greater resemblance to general convulsions than to traumatic tetanus or strychnine tetanus before doing so however i would observe that the only persons who can be supposed to know anything of tetanus not traumatic are physicians and that not one of those most honourable class of men who see the attacks of patients in their beds and not in the hospital has been called by the crown with the exception of dr todd who is a most respectable man and who gave his evidence in such a way as to command the respect of every one but even his practice appears to be not so much that of a physician as of a surgeon i am instructed that i shall be able to show by the most eminent men in the profession that the description which i am about to read from dr copland's book 
the dictionary of practical medicine is the true description of general convulsions in that book i find the following under the head of convulsions Quote, definition violent and involuntary contractions of a part or of the whole of the body sometimes with rigidity and tension tonic convulsions but more frequently with tumultuous agitations consisting of alternating shocks clonic convulsions that come on suddenly either in recurring or in distant paroxysms and after irregular and uncertain intervals End quote. the article then goes on quote, if we take the character of the spasm in respect of permanency rigidity relaxation and recurrence as a basis of arrangement of all the diseases attended by abnormal action of voluntary muscles we shall have every grade passing imperceptibly from the most acute form of tetanus through cramp epilepsy eclampsia convulsions etc down to the most atonic states of chorea and tremor End quote. as to the premonitory symptoms it says quote, the premonitory symptoms of general convulsions are inter alia vertigo and dizziness irritability of temper flushings or alternate flushing and paleness of the face nausea retching or vomiting or pain and distension of stomach and left hypochondrium unusual flatulence of the stomach and bowels or other dyspeptic symptoms end quote in further describing these convulsions the article says quote, in many instances the general sensibility and consciousness are but very slightly impaired particularly in the more simple cases and when the proximate cause is not seated in the encephalon but in proportion as this part is affected primarily or consecutively and the neck and face tumid and livid the cerebral functions are obscured and the convulsions attended by stupor delirium etc or rapidly pass into or are followed by these states End quote. then it adds quote, the paroxysm may cease in a few moments or minutes or continue for some or even many hours it generally subsides rapidly the patient experiencing at its termination fatigue headache or stupor but he is usually restored in a short time to the same state as before the seizure which is liable to recur in a person once affected but at uncertain intervals after repeated attacks the fit sometimes becomes periodic the convulsio recurrence of authors End quote. and in detailing the origin of these convulsions it says quote, the most common causes are inter alia all emotions of the mind which excite the nervous power and determine the blood to the head as joy anger religious enthusiasm excessive desire etc or those which greatly depress the nervous influence as well as diminish and derange the actions of the heart as fear terror anxiety sadness distressing intelligence frightful dreams etc the syphilitic poison and repulsion of gout or rheumatism End quote. do you believe if dr taylor had read that before the inquest that he would have dared to say that the man died from strychnine is there one single symptom in the statement made in the depositions by elizabeth mills and mr jones which may not be classed under one of the varieties of convulsions which dr copland describes it is not for me to suggest a theory but the gentlemen whom i shall call before you men of the highest eminence in their profession and not mere hospital surgeons who have seen nothing of this nature but traumatic tetanus will tell you that mr cook's symptoms were those of general convulsions and not of tetanus my belief is and i hope you will confirm it by your verdict that mr cook's complaint was not tetanus at all though it may well have been according to the descriptions to which i shall call your attention some form of traumatic or idiopathic tetanus there being no broad general distinction or certain confine between idiopathic or self-generating tetanus and many forms of convulsions the tetanic form of convulsions is pretty much the same thing as idiopathic tetanus 
and when we are told by medical witnesses that they never saw a case of idiopathic tetanus my answer to that is that they must have had very limited experience it is not a disease of very frequent occurrence it is true but there are gentlemen here who have seen cases of idiopathic tetanus and they are by no means of that rare occurrence which has been represented to you by the witnesses for the prosecution there is one gentleman here of very large practice at leeds whom i shall call before you who attended at the bedside of mrs dove who has himself seen four cases of idiopathic tetanus traumatic tetanus very frequently occurs in hospitals in fact it often supervenes upon the operations of the surgeon but the persons to give you correct information upon idiopathic tetanus are the general practitioners who enjoy the confidence of families and who have the opportunity of visiting at their dwellings both rich and poor when they are attacked by any of those convulsive diseases or fits which heads of families and brothers and sisters are so careful not to disclose to the world at large dr watson is a general practitioner and he says in his lectures on the principles and practices of physic that most cases of tetanus may be traced to one or two causes which are exposure to the cold or sudden alternations of temperature and bodily injury it has been known to arise he says from causes so slight as these the sticking of a fishbone in the forces the air caused by a musket shot the stroke of a whiplash under the eye leaving the skin unbroken the cutting of a corn the biting of a finger by a tame sparrow the blow of a stick on the neck the insertion of a seton the extraction of a tooth the injection of a hydrocele the operation of cupping it goes on to say that when the disease arises from exposure to the cold or damp it comes on earlier than on other occasions often in a few hours so that if the exposure takes place in the night the complaint may begin to manifest itself next morning he also says that although tetanus may be occasioned by a wound independently of exposure to cold or by exposure to cold without bodily injury there is good reason for thinking that in many instances one of the causes would fail to produce it where both together would call it forth dr watson adds that although the pathology of tetanus is obscure we may fairly come to the conclusion that the symptoms are the result of some peculiar condition of the spinal cord produced and kept up by irritation of the substance and that the brain is not involved in the disease the modern french writers upon the disease hold that it is an inflammable complaint and that it consists essentially of inflammation of the spinal marrow now who shall say that these symptoms which were spoken to on the day of the inquest by elizabeth mills and mr jones may not be ranged under one of those forms of tetanus idiopathic tetanus is so like general convulsions that in many cases it cannot be distinguished from them and to such an extent is this so that dr copland states that convulsions frequently assume a tetanic appearance it is true that traumatic tetanus begins in four cases out of five by a seizure of the lower jaw but then in the fifth case it does not so commence and sir b brodie mentions two instances in which it began in the limb which was wounded now having gone so far and having endeavoured to satisfy you that the symptoms which were spoken to by those two witnesses in their depositions may be as i am told and instructed that they are rather referable to a violent description of general convulsions than to any form of tetanus let us proceed to inquire whether or not the symptoms are consistent with what we know of tetanus produced by strychnine because if you shall be satisfied upon full investigation that they are not consistent with the symptoms which are the unquestionable result of strychnia tetanus then the hypothesis of the crown entirely fails and john parsons cook can't have died of strychnine poisoning whether that be so or not will depend in a great degree as it strikes me although of course that will be for you to decide upon what you think of the evidence of elizabeth mills but 
before i go to that evidence i will call your attention to the description of strychnia tetanus as given by two very eminent gentlemen dr taylor and dr christison who were called for the crown the other day and if you find from their description that strychnia tetanus is a different thing from the picture first given of the attack and paroxysms by elizabeth mills and mr jones you will i think have great difficulty in determining that mr cook died from strychnine let us first take dr taylor's description of strychnia tetanus i am not sure whether he stated that he had ever seen a case of strychnia tetanus in a human subject but we must be just to dr taylor he has had large and extensive reading on the subject on which he writes and it is not to be supposed that he has set down in his book what he has not found established upon respectable authority therefore although we have it second hand in the book we must suppose that dr taylor knows something of the subject in his work upon strychnine poisoning dr taylor says quote, that in from five to twenty minutes after the poison has been swallowed the patient is suddenly seized with tetanic symptoms affecting the whole of the muscular system the body becoming rigid the limbs stretched out and the jaws so fixed that the considerable difficulty is experienced in introducing anything into the mouth End quote. but according to the statement of the witnesses mr cook was sitting up in bed beating the bedclothes talking frequently telling the people about him to go for palmer asking for the remedy and ready to swallow whatever was given him there was no considerable difficulty in introducing anything into the mouth and the paroxysm instead of beginning within from five to twenty minutes after the poison was supposed to have been swallowed did not begin for an hour and a half afterwards dr taylor further on states quote, after several such attacks increasing in severity the patient dies asphyxiated End quote. now i submit although there are some of these symptoms in this case as there will be in every case of violent convulsions that this is not a description of the case of john parsons cook the other medical authority to whom i said i should refer is dr christison he says that the symptoms produced by strychnine are very uncommon and striking the animal begins to tremble and is seized with stiffness and a starting of the limbs those symptoms increase till at length the animal is attacked by general spasms the fit is then succeeded by an interval of calm during which the senses are impaired or are unnaturally acute but another paroxysm soon sets in and then another and another until at last a fit occurs more violent than any that had preceded it and the animal perishes suffocated now who can say that that description at all tallies with the account of mr cook's symptoms i know exactly what dr christison means by this description because i have had the advantage of having had several experiments performed in my presence by dr leatherby which enable me to understand it one of these experiments was this a dog had a grain of strychnine put into his mouth and for about twenty or twenty-five minutes he remained perfectly well suddenly he fell down upon his side and his legs were stretched out in a most violent way he was as stiff as it was possible to be in that state the dog remained with an occasional jerk for two or three minutes in a short time he recovered and got up but he appeared to be dizzy and uncomfortable and was afraid to move he shrunk and twitched and after another minute down he went again he got up again and fell down again and at last he had a tremendous struggle and then he died that is what dr christison means by his description if the dose had not been sufficient to kill the dog it would have been longer in producing an effect the paroxysms would have occurred at more distant intervals and they would have been less and less severe until the animal recovered but if the dose be strong enough to kill the interval between the paroxysms is short and at last one occurs which is strong enough to kill just before the animal dies the limbs become as supple and free as it is possible to conceive the limbs of an animal to be whichever way you put the limbs of the animal after it is quite dead 
the rigor mortis comes on after a time and they remain in any position in which they are placed i saw an experiment performed also upon two rabbits the symptoms were substantially the same the limbs of both of them were quite flaccid immediately upon death and during the intervals between the paroxysms the animals shuddered and were extremely touchy now gentlemen i will give you my reasons for saying that according to their own principle as adduced in evidence by the crown mr cook's death cannot have resulted from strychnia poison i object to the theory of it having resulted from strychnia poison first on the ground that no case can be found in the books in which while the paroxysms lasted the patient had so much command over the muscles of animal life and voluntary motion as mr cook had upon monday and tuesday night the evidence is that he was sitting up in his bed beating the bedclothes calling out and that so far from being afraid of people touching him he actually asked to have his neck rubbed and it was rubbed i now come to the next reason why we say that death in this case did not result from strychnine poison and i assert that there is no authentic case of tetanus from strychnine in which the paroxysm was delayed so long after the ingestion of the poison as it was in mr cook's case dr taylor says in page seventy four of his book that from five to twenty minutes after the poison has been swallowed the tetanic symptoms commence and then in support of this statement he proceeds to cite a number of cases one young lady was instantly deprived of the power of walking and fell down in the next case which was that of a girl tetanic symptoms came on in half an hour the next is a german case taken from the lancet and there a young man aged seventeen was attacked in about a quarter of an hour then there is the case of dr warner who took half a grain of sulphate of strychnine and died in fifteen minutes then there is the case of a young woman who took two or three drachms of nux vomica and died in between thirty and forty minutes another case is given of dr watson in his book which he himself observed in the middlesex hospital where strychnine pills intended for paralytic patients were taken by mistake one twelfth of a grain was intended to be administered every six hours but unluckily a whole grain was given at one time about seven o'clock in the evening and in half an hour it began to exhibit its effects dr watson says that any attempt at movement even touching the patient by another person brought on a recurrence of the symptoms it is clear then from all these cases that the interval which elapsed between the supposed ingestion of the poison and the commencement of the paroxysm was much too long three times too long to warrant the supposition that strychnia poison had been taken in this case thirdly i submit and i shall prove that there is no case in which the recovery from a paroxysm of strychnine poison has been so rapid as it was in cook's case upon monday night or in which a patient has endured so long an interval of repose or exemption from its symptoms afterwards in this case of mr cook according to the theory of the crown the paroxysms would not have been repeated at all if a second dose had not been given there was an end of it when elizabeth mills left palmer sleeping by the side of his friend in an armchair how easy would it have been then if he had been so disposed to administer another dose and to have hurried into elizabeth mill's room and called out that cook was in another fit dr taylor says in his book that the patient is suddenly seized with spasms affecting the whole system and that after several such attacks increasing in severity the patient dies asphyxiated dr christison holds precisely the same language but i submit that here there is a broad distinction between the case of cook and that which these gentlemen state to be the distinguishing feature of the disease i now come to the post-mortem examination dr leatherby was good enough to dig up from his garden in order that i might see it an animal which had been killed by strychnine with a view to this inquiry a month before and to examine the heart before me the heart of that animal was quite full the heart also of the dog that was killed in my presence was 
quite full, and so were the hearts of both the rabbits that I saw killed. Now I am told by a gentleman whom I shall call before you, who is not afraid of dogs, and remember that this is rather a matter for experiment than of theory. I am told that the result of an enormously large proportion of such examinations, and indeed of all of them if they are properly conducted, is that the heart is invariably full. At the same time, I am told that if the examiners do the thing clumsily, they may contrive to get an empty heart. If there be any doubt in your minds, however, as to the heart being full in these cases, I hope that some morning you will desire that a reasonable number of animals should be brought into one of the yards here, and that you will see them die by strychnine, and examine their hearts, and form an opinion for yourselves. I have now discussed what may be said to be the theory of these matters, but I have not yet met the strong point which was made by the crown of the evidence of Elizabeth Mills. I, upon all occasions, am most reluctant to attack a witness who is examined upon his or her oath, and particularly if he be in a humble position of life. I am very reluctant to impute perjury to such a person, and I think that a man who has been as long in the profession as I have been must, in most cases, be put a little to his wit's end when he rushes upon the assumption that a person whose statements have, after a considerable lapse of time, materially varied, is therefore necessarily deliberately perjured. The truth is, we know perfectly well, that if a considerable interval of time occurs between the first story and the second story, and if the intelligent and respectable persons who are anxious to investigate the truth, but who still have a strong moral conviction, upon imperfect information, of the guilt of an accused person, will talk to witnesses and say, Was there anything of this kind? Or anything of that kind? The witnesses at last catch hold of the phrase or opinion that you should form of that witness. The witnesses at last catch hold of the phrase or term which has been so often used to them, and having in that way adopted it, they fancy that they may tell it in court. This might have been the case with Elizabeth Mills, and let me point out to you what occurs to me to be the right opinion that you should form of that witness. I submit to you that in this case of life and death, or indeed in any case involving a question of real importance to liberty or to property, that young woman's evidence would not be relied on. In the ordinary administration of justice in the civil courts, if a person has upon material points told two different stories, juries are rarely willing to believe that person. And in criminal cases, the learned judges, without altogether rejecting the evidence, point out to the jury the discrepancies which have taken place, and submit whether, under all the circumstances, it would be safe to rely upon the testimony last given, differing from the statement which was made when the impression was fresh upon the witness's mind. It cannot be said in this case that Elizabeth Mills was not fully and fairly examined. I submit that my learned friend, the Attorney General, really made a false point. The most unfortunate in the course of the prosecution in attacking upon this ground the coroner, Mr. Ward. Just place yourselves, gentlemen, for a moment in the position of the coroner, and to enable you the better to do so, just recollect what has passed in the course of this trial in this court. Recollect, if you can, how many questions have been put by my learned friends and by me, on account of which it has been necessary for counsel to interpose and to ask the learned judges whether the question was a proper one. Our rules of examination are strict, but they are most beneficial, because they exclude from the minds of the jury that loose and general sort of information, which, in country towns especially, is the subject of pothouse stories and market gossip, and substitute for it the evidence of actual facts, which have been seen and are deposed to by the witnesses. Imagine the coroner in a large room at a tavern, just under the bedroom, where poor Cook died, a crowd of excited villagers in the room, all full of suspicion produced by the inquiries of the Prince of Wales Insurance Office about Walter Palmer, and Inspector Field there, and Inspector Simpson, 
and all impressed with the belief that whatever the london doctor said must be true and that if dr alfred swain taylor had made up his mind that it was poison poison it was the whole town was in a state of uproar and excitement every question that occurred to everybody must be put before the coroner did you hear so and so didn't somebody tell you that someone had said so and so and so on how is it possible under such circumstances to conduct an inquiry with the dignity and decorum that are observed in the superior courts there was a celebrated trial some years ago in france in which i remember to have taken great interest of the ministers of king charles x upon that occasion one witness actually proved that he had read all the pamphlets that had been published on the subject and he came forward to state what upon the whole was the result which those pamphlets had made upon his mind it is true that this was in revolutionary times but it shows to what an extent the introduction of a loose system of questioning may go i don't say that dr taylor suggested any but proper questions but you must consider the difficulties under which the coroner had to labour but i am told that he is an exceedingly good lawyer and a most respectable man dr taylor said that the coroner's omission to ask questions arose in his opinion rather from want of knowledge than from intention of course the coroner would not be likely to know the proper questions to put in such a case but when he did know them he seems to have put them he was right in refusing to put irrelevant questions to gratify an inquisitive juryman we are ourselves constantly being rebuked by the learned judges and told to adhere to the rules and not to put questions which are irrelevant End of section 14section fifteen of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson section fifteen the defence seventh day continued i have now pointed out such discrepancies in the evidence given by mills before the coroner and before you as will i think make it clear to you that you cannot rely upon her testimony since she first gave her evidence she has had the means of knowing what is the case on the part of the crown i do not mean to say she has been tutored by the crown i believe that my learned friend would not have called her if he thought she had but she has had the opportunity of discovering by interviews with several different people that the case for the prosecution is that palmer having first prepared the body of cook for deadly poison by the poison of antimony afterwards dispatched him with the deadly poison of strychnine their case is that there was an administration of something which had the effect of producing retching nausea and irritation of the stomach those symptoms are therefore attributed to the persevering intention of the prisoner to reduce cook to such a state of weakness that when once ingestion of the poison occurred he was sure to be carried off in her evidence before the coroner she was asked whether she had tasted the broth she said she had and she thought it very good she did not then say anything about the ill effects the broth had produced but she has since learnt that it is part of the case of those out of whose hands the crown has taken the prosecution and that it is the theory of dr taylor but all this retching and vomiting was the result of a constant dosing with antimonial poison she has probably been frequently asked whether she was not sick after drinking the broth perhaps she may have been sick on some sunday or other and she has persuaded herself for i do not wish to impute perjury to her that she was made sick by the two tablespoonfuls of broth which she drank it is not to the last degree incredible that a shrewd intelligent man like palmer should have exposed himself to such a chance of detection as sending broth which he had poisoned from his house to stand by the kitchen fire of the talbot arms when sure as fate the cook would taste it did you ever know a cook who would not taste broth sent by another person 
and said to be particularly good it is not in the nature of things a cook is a taster she tastes everything and palmer must have known that as sure as ever he sent into the kitchen broth containing antimony the cook would take it and be ill her statement is not credible and cannot be relied on then she said in her evidence before the coroner that on saturday cook had coffee and vomited directly he swallowed it and that up to the time she gave him the coffee she had not seen palmer she was not then aware that the theory of the gradual preparation of the body by antimony was to fit into the theory of death from strychnine but by the time she came here she had become acquainted with that part of the case my learned friend stated that palmer ordered him to drink coffee on saturday morning it was brought in by the chambermaid elizabeth mills and given to the prisoner who had an opportunity of tampering with it before giving it to cook there is all the difference between this statement of my learned friend and that first made by mills before the coroner but the young woman did not go quite so far as that she went however to this extent palmer came over at eight o'clock and ordered a cup of coffee for cook i gave it to him i believe palmer was in the bedroom at the time i did not see him drink it i observed afterwards that the coffee had been vomited her statement was not so strong as that of my learned friend but a great deal stronger than the one she made before the coroner the two statements are essentially different and the difference between them consists in this the one supports the theory suggested by the prosecution the other is totally inconsistent with it can you rely on a woman who makes such alterations in her testimony that is not all the case suggested for the crown now is that cook expressed reluctance to take the pills ordered for him and that his reluctance was overruled by palmer mills's first statement was that cook said the pills made him ill here she said that the pills which palmer gave him made him ill before the coroner too she did not say that palmer was in the bedroom between nine and ten on monday night as she has stated here she makes him more about the bedside of the man she gives him a greater opportunity of administering pills and medicine she shows an animus the result according to the most charitable construction that can be put upon it of a persuasion that palmer must be guilty but still an animus which shows that she is not to be relied on how easily may persons in her condition make mistakes without intending to deceive it is the just punishment of old falsehood that when a lie has once been told it cannot be retracted without humiliation and when once this young woman had been induced to vary her statement in a material particular she had not the moral courage to set herself right but the particulars i have mentioned are nothing to those to which i will now call your attention i impeach her testimony on the ground that she here gesticulated and gave her evidence in such a manner that if it had been natural and she had adopted it at the inquest it must have attracted the attention of dr taylor the remarkable contortions into which she put her hands her mouth and her neck would if they had been observed at the inquest have been reduced to verbal expression and recorded in the depositions I am told by Dr. Nunnally, Dr. Robinson, and other gentlemen that the symptoms she described are inconsistent with any known disease. There was an extraordinary grouping of symptoms, some of them quite consistent with tetanus produced by strychnine administered under peculiar circumstances, others quite inconsistent with it. Now, in the last week of February, a frightful case of strychnine occurred in Leeds. A person having the means of access to the bedside of a patient was supposed to have administered small doses day by day and after keeping her for some time in a state of irritation to have at last killed her the person who attended the patient spoke of her symptoms for about a week before her death and said she had twitchings in the legs that she was alarmed at being touched in the intervals between the spasms i will now call your attention to the evidence of mills she states quote, cook said i can't lie down i shall be suffocated if i lie down 
I'll fetch Mr. Palmer. The last words he said very loud. I did not observe his legs, but there was a sort of jumping or jerking about his head and neck and the body. Sometimes he would throw back his head upon the pillow and then raise it up again. He had much difficulty in breathing. The balls of his eyes projected very much. He screamed again three or four times while I was in the room. He was moving and knocking about all the time. He asked me to rub his hands. I did rub them, and he thanked me. I noticed him twitch. I gave him toast and water. His body was still jerking and thumping. When I put the spoon in his mouth, he snapped at it, and got it fast between his teeth, and seemed to bite at it very hard. In snapping at the spoon, he threw forward his head and neck. He swallowed the toast and water, and with it the pills. Palmer then handed him a draught in a wine glass. Cook drank this. He snapped at the glass, as he had done at the spoon. He seemed as though he could not exactly control himself. End quote. The expression she used, particularly the word twitching, are remarkable. It may well be that when this case became public, she may have had her attention called to it, and then had questions put to her with regard to the symptoms of Cook, which induced her to alter the evidence she had before given. I cannot otherwise account for the remarkable variance in her evidence. From the time she left the Talbot Arms till she came here, she seems to have been a person of remarkable importance. She went to Dolly's, where Stevens visited her five or six times. What for? Stevens was unquestionably, and within proper limits he is not to be blamed for it, indignant at the circumstances of Cook's death. He is not in the same condition of life as Mills. Why did he call on her? Why did he converse with her in a private room? He came, she said, to inquire after her health and see how she liked London. Mr. Gardner also saw her in the street, but he only asked her how she was and talked of other things. I do not say that these gentlemen went to her with the deliberate intention of inducing her to say what was false, but they did go with the deliberate intention of stimulating her memory upon points as to which they thought it required stimulating. Mr. Hatton, the police officer of Rugeley, also saw her a few times. They could have gone to her for no purpose but that of taking her evidence. I may mention a circumstance which shows how differently minor matters may be stated by witnesses who do not wish to assert what is false. When Palmer went into the bedroom after being called up, he remarked, I do not think I ever dressed so quickly in my life, and it is suggested that he never went to bed but waited up for the commencement of the paroxysm. Mills answered the question I put to her upon that point pretty fairly. She said, he came in his dressing gown, and I do not recollect that there was anything like a day-shirt about his neck. On the other hand, Lavinia Barnes, who gave her evidence in a most respectable manner, said that he was quite dressed, that he wore his usual dress. People get talking about what they have witnessed. The real image of what occurred becomes confused or altogether obliterated from their minds, and they at last unconsciously tell a story which is very different from the truth. Mills was examined three times before the coroner, and if that officer acted improperly on those occasions, it was quite competent for the Crown to bring him here and give him an opportunity of vindicating himself but he ought not to be blamed upon the evidence of a witness like her. In the course of her examination, however, there came out a fact which is worthy of remark. Is there not something extraordinary in the periodicity of the attacks she described in their recurrence on three nights nearly at the same hour? There are numerous cases in the books in which attacks of this kind occurred at the same distance of time after the patient has gone to bed. Without going into unnecessary details, I will now state what I intend to prove upon this part of the case. I shall call a great number of most respectable medical practitioners and surgeons in general practice, with a large experience in great cities, who will support the theory that these fits of Cook were probably not tetanus at all, but violent convulsions, the result of a weak habit of body, increased by a careless mode of life by at least a sufficient amount of disease to render violent mineral poisons in their opinion desirable and by habits which led to a chronic ulceration of the tonsils and difficulty in swallowing 
they will prove that men with constitutions weakened by indulgence have often under the influence of strong mental excitement and violent emotion of any kind been suddenly thrown into such a state of convulsion that symptoms have been exhibited in the voluntary muscles of violent disease and that persons suffering from those symptoms have constantly died asphyxiated or of exhaustion leaving no trace whatever as to the cause of death in addition i will call several gentlemen who will speak to experiments they have made upon animals who will be ready to show you those experiments in any yard belonging to this building if my lords should think fit they will tell you on the authority of orfila that no degree of putrescence will decompose strychnine and that if it is in the body they will be sure to find it even now lord campbell said that the court could not see the experiments made but witnesses might be called to prove them mr sergeant she i have now done with that branch of the case and will proceed to the last matter to which i propose to direct your attention i propose to discuss whether the circumstantial evidence is inexplicable on the supposition of the prisoner's innocence and if i show you that in all its broad and salient features it is not so i am sure that you will be only too happy to acquit him recollecting that you represent the country which is uninformed upon the case which has no opportunity of hearing the witnesses on either side lord campbell in the language of the law which country you are mr sergeant she which country you are you are responsible not to render this kingdom liable to the charge of having in a paroxysm of prejudice propagated by a professional man with no knowledge of his own upon the matter condemned an innocent person in discussing the circumstantial evidence i will avoid no point that seems at all difficult but not to waste time i will not after the intimation which i have received from the bench trouble you with such matters as the pushing against dr devonshire during the post-mortem examination or the cutting of a slit in the cover of the jar which might be done accidentally with any of the sharp instruments which were being used or the putting it at the further end of the room lord campbell what was said referred only to the pushing mr sergeant she i take leave to suggest that in an examination in the town of rugeley where palmer was perfectly well known the fact of there having been a little apparent shoving which may for the moment have disturbed the operator is not to be allowed to have weight against the prisoner especially as mr devonshire said nothing was lost the matter was one in which all present took considerable interest and a little leaning over might easily have produced the effect which was spoken to then as to the removal of the jar it was not taken out of the room it could not have been taken away without its removal being observed and it would have been to the last degree foolish for any guilty person to attempt to remove it that a man who knew himself to be innocent should be very unwilling that the jar should be removed out of the hands of persons upon whom he could rely for honest dealing is very probable palmer knew that there were some persons who did not want to pay him thirteen thousand pounds and who had for a long time been doing all they could to undermine his character and to put to him most wicked conduct with regard to the death of a relation suspicions in which none of his relatives had joined it is clear from his observation quote, well doctor they won't hang us yet End quote, that he knew that it was intended to ground a suspicion or a complaint upon the post-mortem examination and it was exceedingly natural that he should like to have the jar kept in safe custody even in the crowded room all his conduct is consistent with this explanation to dr harland with whom he does not appear to have been particularly intimate he says quote, i am very glad you are come because there is no knowing who might have done it End quote. that is the conduct of a respectable man who knew that his conduct would bear investigation if it were properly conducted i dare say there are in rugeley many excellent and very serious people to whom the prisoner's habits of life his running about to races and so on would not much recommend him and who he had reason to know entertained prejudices against him 
as to his objection to the jar being taken to mr frere's there had i believe been some slight difference arising out of thirlby's palmer's assistant having come to him from mr frere i do not do mr frere the injustice to think that this slight dispute would have led him to put anything into the jar but it may account for palmer's caution let us now come to the more prominent features of palmer's conduct upon which in accordance with instructions my learned friend principally relied i will first call your attention to the evidence of myatt the postboy at the talbot arms mr stevens had come down from london and had acted towards palmer in such a way as would have induced some men to kick him assuming palmer to be innocent stevens's conduct was most provoking he dissembled with palmer cross-questioned him pretended to take his advice scolded him in a harsh tone of voice almost insulted him threatened a post-mortem examination and acted throughout under the impression that some one had been guilty of foul play towards cook which ought to be brought to light and punished stevens had been there during the whole of the post-mortem examination a gloomy miserable day it must have been poring over the remains of that poor dead man the jar was ready and the fly was at the door to take himself and boycott to stafford in order that this jar might be sent to london out of palmer's ken and notice so that if there was anybody base enough to do it either in support of a theory or to maintain a reputation god forbid that i should suggest that to the prejudice of dr taylor i do not mean to do so but if there was anybody capable of acting so great a wickedness it might be done and it was but a reasonable concern that palmer should be anxious that it should stop at dr harland's he did not like its going with stevens to london stevens had been particularly troublesome he had been vexatious and annoying to the last degree the fly was ready when palmer met myatt the postboy and learned that he was going to drive mr stevens to stafford according to myatt's evidence palmer then asked him if he would upset them that word was first used in this court to designate the jars but as there was at that time but one jar it must have been intended to apply to mr stevens and his companion palmer's conduct to stevens had been most exemplary and he must have been irritated to the last degree to find that he was suspected of stealing a paltry betting book which was of no use to any one and of having played foully and falsely with the life of his friend the deceased that he was much annoyed was proved by his observation to dr harland in the morning Quote, there has been a queer old fellow down here making inquiries who seems to suspect that everything is wrong he thinks i have stolen a betting book which every one who knows anything knows can be of no use to any one now that poor cook is dead End quote. this shows that palmer's mind was impressed with the sense that stevens had ill-treated him he no doubt said to himself he stevens has encouraged and brought back suspicions which have well nigh destroyed me already and which if he proceeds in this course of bringing another charge against me will probably render it impossible to get the sum which would be sufficient to release me from my embarrassments in this state of mind palmer met the postboy who was ready to drive mr stevens to stafford what occurred then was thus described by myatt Quote, he said he supposed i was going to take the jars what did you say then or what did he say i said i believed i was after you said you believed you were what did he say he says do you think you could upset them what answer did you make i told him no did he say anything more he said if i could there was a ten pound note for me what did you say to that i told him i should not did he say any more to you i told him that i must go for the horse was in the fly waiting for me to start End quote. in cross-examination he was asked quote, were not these the words palmer used i should not mind giving ten pounds to break mr stevens's neck i do not recollect him saying to break his neck were they not words to that effect 
I should not mind giving him ten pounds to break his neck. I do not recollect that. Then, ten pounds to upset him. Yes. Those were the words, were they? Them were the words, to the best of my recollection. Did he appear to have been drinking at the time? I cannot say. When he said to upset him, did he use any epithet? Did he describe him in any way, such as upset the fellow? He did not describe him in any way. Did he say anything about him at the time? He did say something about it. It was a humbugging concern, or something to that effect. That he was a humbugging concern, was that it? No. That it was a humbugging concern, or something to that effect? Yes. End quote. I submit to you that, after this evidence, you can only regard this expression about upsetting them, in its milder and more innocent sense, as a strong expression used by a man vexed and irritated by the suspicious and inquisitive manner which Stevens had from the first exhibited. That this is the correct view of the matter is confirmed by the fact that at the time of the inquest nothing was known of this, and Myatt was not called. Myatt was engaged at the Talbot Arms, and must frequently have conversed about the death of Cook and the post-mortem examination with servants and other persons about that inn. Had any serious weight been attached to this offer of Palmer, it would have excited attention and would have been given in evidence before the coroner. On the other hand, it is to the last degree improbable that a medical man, knowing that he had given a large dose of strychnine, with the violent properties of which he was well acquainted, should have supposed that by the accidental spilling of a jar, the liver, spleen, and some of the tissues remaining behind, he could possibly escape detection. I will next call your attention to the evidence of Charles Newton, who swore that he saw Palmer at Mr. Salt's surgery at nine o'clock on Monday night, when he gave him three grains of strychnine in a piece of paper. He did not bring this to the knowledge of the Crown until the night before this trial commenced. He was examined before the coroner, but although then called to corroborate the statement of Roberts as to the presence of Palmer at Hawkins's shop, where he was said to have purchased strychnine, he then said nothing about the purchase on the Monday night. A man who so conducts himself, who when first sworn omits a considerable portion of what he tells three weeks afterwards, and again comes forward at the last moment, and tells more than enough in his opinion to drive home the guilt of the person who is accused, that man is not to be believed upon his oath. There are other circumstances which render Newton's statement in the highest degree improbable. That Palmer should once in a way purchase strychnine in Rugeley is not to be wondered at. It is sold to kill vermin, to kill dogs, and whatever the evidence as to the galloping of the mares and the dropping their foals, it shows that Palmer had occasion for it. And for other purposes but that, having bought enough for all ordinary purposes, he should go and buy more the next day, and should purchase it at the shop of a tradesman with whom he had dealt for two years, is in the highest degree incredible. Nobody would believe it. Nobody can or ought to believe it. But observe this also. Palmer had been in London on the Monday, and in London there is no difficulty in procuring strychnine. It is sold to any one who, by writing down the technical description of what he wants, shows that he has had a medical education. Why did he not get it in London? And if he could not get it in London, why did he not get it at Stafford, or at any of the other places to which he had been? If he had bought it for this guilty purpose, would he not, as a wary man, have taken care that when his house was searched, there should be found in it the paper containing the exact quantity of strychnine which he had purchased. What could have been easier to do than that? Newton's story, therefore, cannot be believed, but, in addition, I will show that Palmer, who is stated by Herring to have been in London at a quarter past three o'clock, could not have been in Rugeley at the time at which Newton says he was at Mr. Salt's. Palmer attended the post-mortem examination, 
and is it credible that he a skilful medical man who studied in a london hospital and made a note upon one of his books to the effect of strychnine would ask that stupid sort of fellow newton anything about its action upon a dog and would when the answer was given snap his fingers and say it is all right then it cannot be found no one will believe it for a moment the animus of newton is shown by his admitting the word poor and representing palmer as having said you will find this fellow suffering from a disease of the throat he has had syphilis and then when cross-examined upon the subject by my learned friend mr grove replying i don't know whether he said poor or rich as if that had anything to do with the question i will now take you back to what occurred at shrewsbury the case for the crown is that as early as wednesday the fourteenth november the scheme of poisoning cook begun to be executed at shrewsbury it is suggested that cook was dosed with something that was put into his brandy and water you will remember that i read to you a letter from cook to fisher dated the sixteenth of november to which there is this postscript quote, i am better end quote. that must have referred to his illness at shrewsbury it is the postscript to a letter in which he speaks of the object he has in view which is of great importance to himself and palmer is his writing in that tone consistent with his having a belief that palmer had drugged him with poison for the purpose of destroying his life at shrewsbury what did palmer say about it quote, cook says i have put something in his glass i don't play such tricks End quote. he treated it as though it had never been understood to be more than the expression of a man who if not actually drunk was very nearly so palmer did not arrive at the raven until after the dinner hour we have no evidence how cook fared there but we shall be able to prove that he went from there to the unicorn where he arrived pretty flush and where he sat drinking brandy and water with saunders the trainer and a lady seven or eight glasses of brandy and water did this good young man drink and the result was that his unfortunate syphilitic throat was in a very dreadful state if not of actual laceration at least of soreness and irritation the learned sergeant here read to the jury a long extract from an article which had appeared in some newspaper which he did not mention in which the occurrences at shrewsbury were described in a style which seemed intended to be humorous and in which cook's sickness was attributed to his having taken too much brandy upon champagne in order to restore his british solidity the learned sergeant said that this entirely concurred with his own view of the case he then continued cook's own conduct afterwards proved that his illness was owing to his having drunk too much he got up in the morning breakfasted with palmer was good friends with him and went with him to rugeley they received pratt's letter of the thirteenth in consequence of which palmer wrote to pratt to say that some one would call upon him and pay him two hundred pounds and cook wrote to fisher and asked him to call on pratt and pay this money does that look as though he thought there had been an attempt to poison him mrs brooks who gave her evidence in a most creditable manner proved that there was much sickness among the strangers who were at shrewsbury and the rest of her evidence did not tell much against palmer who might after cook's complaint very naturally have been looking at the tumbler to see if anything had been put into it cook got worse and at last had the good sense to put his money into fisher's hands and go to bed he was still very sick and a doctor was sent for who recommended an emetic cook made himself sick by drinking warm water and putting the handle of a toothbrush down his throat he took a pill and a black draught went to sleep and next morning was quite well this is really too ludicrous to receive a moment's consideration a person named myatt was in the room at the raven all the evening he has been put into the box but i shall call him and you will hear his account palmer and cook having got back to rugeley the history of the slow poisoning continues 
they were there together and probably talked on the way of their difficulties and the mode of getting out of them and of the small way that the winnings at shrewsbury would go to effect that object both seeing ruin staring them in the face unless the prince of wales insurance office could be made to pay the money which was due and they could meanwhile remain free from all suspicion of insolvency or any sort of misconduct when they got to rugeley they provided for the temporary difficulty by sending two hundred pounds to pratt they were then evidently on friendly terms cook's winnings being at palmer's service and probably both effecting their objects because as it would appear from what palmer said cook had some interest in the bills which were outstanding probably his name might not be upon them but as they were engaged in these racing transactions were joint owners of one horse and had the same trainer they were very probably equally interested in these bills were in fact what i remember to have once heard a nobleman well known upon the turf call confederates the frequency of palmer's visits to cook during the illness of the latter at rugeley affords no ground of suspicion against the prisoner on the contrary it tells in his favour cook had no friend in the town but palmer with whom he may almost be said to have been on a visit for though he did not sleep in palmer's house palmer was in continual attendance on him and owing to the close proximity of his own residence was enabled to bring him many little delicacies not easily obtainable at an inn had he neglected the sick man and only visited him occasionally the inference of the crown would probably have been that he was a black-hearted scoundrel who only looked in now and then to give him his poison but as he was zealously and laboriously attentive to him the conclusion is that he must have murdered him it is said that palmer was guilty of a falsehood in representing cook as suffering from diarrhoea and that is to put a very violent and a very uncharitable construction on his words for you will remember that bamford swore to cook having told him that his bowels had been affected once or twice that his bowels had been affected twice or three times on sundays but leaving these minor points i come to one which in this case of circumstantial evidence is of the very last importance and should be deemed decisive of the prisoner's innocence the supposition of the crown is that palmer intended to dose cook with antimony to keep his stomach in continual irritation by vomiting in order that he might the more surely dispatch him with strychnine and that during sunday the day on which he insisted on his taking the broth cook was under the influence of this insidious treatment now supposing this to be true and assuming it to be the fact that palmer was indeed bent upon destroying cook by this singular process is it not manifest that there is one man who of all the men in the world would have been the very last whom he would have selected to be a witness of his proceedings that man is a surgeon in the prime of life a man intimately acquainted with cook and very much attached to him mr jones of lutterworth yet this is the very man to whom when he is about to set out for london palmer writes a letter informing him that cook is ill and urging him to come over and see him without delay i entreat of you to appreciate the full importance of that fact the more you think of it the more profound will become your conviction that it affords evidence irrefragable of palmer's innocence the imputation is that palmer meant to kill cook to possess himself of his winnings who was with cook when the race was won who was by his side on the shrewsbury racecourse for the three minutes that he was speechless who saw him take out his pocket-book and count up his winnings who but jones jones was his bosom friend his companion his confidant and who knew to the last farthing the amount of his gains jones was of all men living the most likely to be the recipient of cook's confidence and the man who was bound by every consideration of honour friendship and affection to protect him to vindicate his cause and to avenge his death yet this was the man for whom palmer sent that he might converse with cook receive his confidences minister to him in his illness and even sleep in the same room with him 
How, if Palmer is the murderer they represent him, are you to account for his summoning Jones to the bedside of the sick man? If Cook really suspected, which we are assured he did, that Palmer was poisoning him, Jones was the man to whom he would most willingly have unbosomed himself, and in whose faithful ear he would have eagerly disburdened the perilous stuff that weighed upon his own brain. Palmer and Jones were both medical men, and it is not improbable that, in the course of his studies, the latter may have noted in his class-book the very passages respecting the operation of strychnine, which also attracted the attention of the former. Is it conceivable that if Palmer meant to slay Cook with poison in the dead of the night, he would have previously ensured the presence, in his victim's bedroom, of a medical witness, who would know from the symptoms that the man was not dying a natural death? He brings a medical man into the room and makes him lie within a few inches of the sick man's bed, that he may hear his terrific shrieks and witness those agonizing convulsions which indicate the fatal potency of poison. Can you believe it? He might have dispatched him by means that would have defied detection, for Cook was taking morphia medicinally, and a grain or two more would have silently thrown him into an eternal sleep. But, instead of doing so, he sends to Lutterworth for Jones. You have been told that this was done to recover appearances. Done to cover appearances? No, no, no. You cannot believe it. It is not in human nature. It cannot be true. You cannot find him guilty. You dare not find him guilty on the suspicion of its truth. The country will not stand by you if you believe it to be true. You will be impeached before the world if you say that it is true. I believe in my conscience that it is false, and that, consistently with the rules that govern human nature, it cannot possibly be true. Sensation and murmurs of applause. With respect to the interviews and dialogues that took place between the prisoner and Mr. Stevens, I contend that, so far from telling against the former, they are in his favour. There is nothing but the evidence of a kind and considerate nature in the fact of his having ordered a shell and a strong oak coffin for the deceased, nor is it possible to torture into a presumption of guilt the few words of irritation that may have fallen from the prisoner in the course of a conversation in which Mr. Stevens treated him with scorn, not to say insolence. With respect to the betting book, many persons had access to Cook's room, servants both men and women undertakers men and barbers and though i do not venture to mark out any particular person for suspicion any one of them may have purloined the book and been afraid to return it it is not fair in a case of this momentous importance to affix the opprobrium on a man who is not proved to have ever had it in his hand the Crown had no doubt originally intended to rely upon the prisoner's medical books as affording damning proof of his guilt, but I will refer to those volumes for evidences that will speak eloquently in his favour. In youth and early manhood there was no such protection for a man as the society of an innocent and virtuous woman to whom he is sincerely attached. If you find a young man devoted to such a woman, loving her dearly and marrying her for the love he bears her, you may depend upon it that he is a man of a humane and gentle nature, little prone to deeds of violence. To such a woman was Palmer attached in his youth, and I will bring you proof positive to show that the volumes cited against him were the books he used when a student and that the manuscript passages are in the handwriting of his wife. His was a marriage of the heart. He loved that young and virtuous woman with a pure and generous affection. He loved her as he now loves her firstborn, who awaits with trembling anxiety the verdict that will restore him to the arms of his father, or drive that father to an ignominious death upon the scaffold. The prisoner here covered his face with his hands and shed tears. Here in this book I have conclusive evidence of the kind of man that Palmer was seven years ago. 
I find in its pages the copy of a letter addressed by him while still a student to the woman whom he afterwards made his wife. It is as follows. Quote, my dearest Annie, I snatch a moment from my studies to write to your dear, dear little self. I need scarcely say that the principal inducement I have to work is the desire of getting my studies finished so as to be able to press your dear little form in my arms. With best, best love, believe me, dearest Annie, your own William. End quote. Now this is not the sort of letter that is generally read in courts of justice. It was no part of my instructions to read that letter. But the book was put in to prove that this man is a wicked, heartless, savage desperado, and I will show what he was seven years ago, that he was a man who loved a young woman for her own sake, loved her with a pure and virtuous affection, such an affection as would, in almost all natures, be a certain antidote against guilt. Such is the man whom it has been my duty to defend upon this occasion, and upon the evidence that is before you I cannot believe him to be guilty. Don't suppose, gentlemen, that he is unsupported in this dreadful trial by his family and his friends. An aged mother, who may have disapproved of some part of his conduct, awaits with trembling anxiety your verdict. A dear sister can scarcely support herself under the suspense which now presses upon her. A brave and gallant brother stands by to defend him, and spares neither time nor trouble to save him from an awful doom. I call upon you, gentlemen, to raise your minds to a capacity to estimate the high duty which you have to perform. You have to stem the torrent of prejudice. You have to vindicate the honour and character of your country. You have, with firmness and courage, to do your duty, and to find a verdict for the Crown if you believe that guilt is proved. But, if you have a doubt on that point, depend upon it that the time will come when the innocence of that man will be made apparent, and then you will deeply regret any want of due and calm consideration of the case which it has been my duty to lay before you. The speech of the learned sergeant occupied exactly eight hours in its delivery. There were some slight indications of an attempt to applaud at its conclusion, but they were instantly repressed. The court then adjourned till ten o'clock next morning. End of section 15section sixteen of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson eighth day may the twenty second his royal highness the duke of cambridge was among the distinguished persons who were accommodated with seats upon the bench the learned judges lord campbell mr baron alderson and Mr. Justice Cresswell took their seats at ten o'clock. The prisoner was at once placed at the bar. His demeanour was, as on the previous days of his trial, calm and attentive, but betrayed no additional anxiety. Immediately after the learned judges took their seats, Lord Campbell said, Before the proceedings commence, I must express a most earnest hope that until this trial is concluded the public journals will continue to abstain from any comments upon the merits of the case or upon any part of the evidence the propriety of this course is so obvious as to need no explanation this warning ought to extend to the insertion of letters as much as to that of editorial articles thomas nunnally examined by mr grove I am Fellow of the College of Surgeons and Professor of Surgery at the Leeds School of Medicine. I am also a member of several medical and learned societies, foreign and English, and have been in practice between twenty and thirty years. I have a large practice and have seen cases of both traumatic and idiopathic tetanus. Of the latter disease I have seen four cases. They did not all commence with lockjaw. One did not commence so, 
nor did lockjaw become so marked in it as to prevent swallowing once during the course of the disease i have heard the evidence as to the symptoms of cook and had previously read the depositions as to that part of the case judging from those symptoms i am of opinion that death was caused by some convulsive disease i found that opinion upon the symptoms described in the depositions and the evidence before the court lord campbell said that the witness could only be examined as to his opinion founded upon the viva voce evidence before the court mr grove said that his object was to distinguish between the opinion founded on the viva voce evidence and that founded on the depositions examination continued from the symptoms described by the witness in court i am of opinion that death was caused by some convulsive disease looking at cook's general state of health mr baron alderson you have nothing to do with that you must only give an opinion upon the symptoms described in evidence examination continued by mr sergeant she i have been in court during the whole of the trial i have heard the evidence as to the symptoms of mr cook's health previous to his final attack at rugeley the description of the actual symptoms during the paroxysms and the appearance of the body on the post-mortem examination do you remember the account of the syphilitic sores the attorney-general objected to this mode of putting the question because it was an assumption that these sores existed a medical man ought to be asked his opinion on the supposition only that certain symptoms existed mr justice cresswell let the witness describe what he assumes to have been the state of cook's health and you will then see whether he is justified in his assumption examination continued i assumed that cook was a man of very delicate constitution that for a long period he had felt himself to be ailing for which indisposition he had been under medical treatment that he had suffered from syphilis that he had disease of the lungs and that he had old standing disease of the throat that he led an irregular life that he was subject to mental excitement and depression and that after death appearances were found in his body which show this to have been the case there was an unusual appearance in the stomach the throat was in an unnatural condition the back of the tongue showed similar indications the air vessels of the lungs were dilated in the lining of the aorta there was an unnatural deposit and there was a very unusual appearance in the membranes of the spinal marrow one of the witnesses also said there was a loss of substance from the penis that scar on the penis could only have resulted from an ulcer a chancre is an ulcer but an ulcer is not necessarily a chancre the symptoms at the root of the tongue and the throat i should ascribe to syphilitic inflammation of the throat supposing these symptoms to be correct i should infer that cook's health had for a long time not been good and that his constitution was delicate his father and mother died young supposing that to have been his state of health it would make him liable to nervous irritation that might be excited by moral causes any excitement or depression might produce that effect a person of such health and constitution would be more susceptible of injurious influence from wet and cold than would one of stronger constitution upon such a constitution as that which i have assumed cook's to have been convulsive disease is more likely to supervene i understand that cook had three attacks on succeeding nights occurring about the same hour as a medical man i should infer from this that the attacks were of a convulsive character i infer that in the absence of other causes to account for them according to my personal experience and knowledge from the study of my profession convulsive attacks are as various as possible in their forms and degrees of violence it is not possible to give a definite name to every convulsive symptom there are some forms of convulsion in which the patient retains his consciousness there are forms of hysteria sometimes found in the male sex it is also stated that there are forms of epilepsy in which the patient retains consciousness 
by lord campbell i cannot mention a case in which consciousness has been retained during the fit no such case has come under my notice examination continued i know by reading that that although rarely does sometimes occur the degree of consciousness in epilepsy varies very much in some attacks the consciousness is wholly lost for a long time convulsive attacks are sometimes accompanied by violent spasms and rigidity of the limbs convulsions properly so called sometimes assume a titanic complexion i heard the passage from the works of dr copland read to the court yesterday i agree with what he states convulsions arrive from almost any cause from worms in children affections of the brain in adults hysteria and in some persons the taking of chloroform adults are sometimes attacked by such convulsions affections of the spinal cord or eating indigestible food will produce them i know no instance in which convulsions have arisen from retching and vomiting i agree with dr copland that these convulsions sometimes end immediately in death the immediate proximate cause of death is frequently asphyxia by lord campbell death from a spasm of the heart is often described as death by asphyxia examination continued i have seen convulsions recurring i have seen that in various cases the time at which a patient recovers his ease after a violent attack of convulsions varies very much it may be a few minutes or it may be hours from an interval between one convulsion and another i should infer that the convulsions arise from some slight irritation in the brain or the spinal cord when death takes place in such paroxysms there is sometimes no trace of organic disease to be found by a post-mortem examination granules between the dura mater and the arachnoids are not common at any age i should not draw any particular inference from their appearance they might or might not lead to a conjecture as to their cause and effect i do not form any opinion upon these points they might produce an effect upon the spinal cord there are three preparations in museums where granules are exhibited in the spinal cord in which the patients are said to have died from tetanus those are at st thomas's hospital to ascertain the nature and effect of such granules the spinal cord ought to be examined immediately after death not the most remote opinion could be formed upon an examination made two months after death more especially if the brain had been previously opened independently of the appearance of granules it would not after that period be possible to form a satisfactory opinion upon the general condition of the spinal cord if there were a large tumour or some similar change it might be exhibited but neither softening nor induration of the structure could be perceived the nervous structure changes within two days of death to ascertain minutely its condition it is necessary to use a lens or microscope that is required in an examination made immediately after death i have attended cases of traumatic tetanus that disease commonly begins with an attack upon the jaw one of the four cases of idiopathic tetanus that i have seen was my own child in three of those cases the disease began with lockjaw the fourth case commenced in the body the facility of swallowing remaining i have within the last twelve months made post-mortem examinations of two persons who had died from strychnia i did not see the patients before death in both cases i ascertained by chemical analysis that death had been caused by strychnia in both i found the strychnia in one case that of a lady aged twenty-eight years i made my examination forty-two hours after death and in the other thirty hours in the former case the body had not been opened before i commenced my examination the witness read a report of this examination in which it was stated that the eyelids were partially open and the globes flaccid and the pupils dilated the muscles of the trunk were not in the least rigid indeed they were so soft that the body might be bent in any direction 
the muscles at the hip and shoulder joints were not quite so flaccid but they allowed these joints to be easily moved while those of the head and neck forearms etc were rigid the fingers were curved and the feet somewhat arched all the muscles when cut into were found soft and dark in colour the membranes of the liver were exceedingly vascular the membrane of the spinal cord was much congested there was bloody serum in the pericardium the lungs were distended and some of the air cells were ruptured the lining membrane of the trachea and bronchial tubes were covered with a layer of dark bloody mucus of a dark chocolate colour the thoracic vessels and membranes were much congested and the blood was everywhere dark and fluid after reading this report the witness continued in the second case i made my examination thirty hours after death i first saw the body about twelve hours after death it was a woman somewhere near twenty years of age the witness also read the report of the examination in this case the appearances of the body were substantially similar to those presented in the previous case in two other cases i have seen a patient suffering from overdoses of strychnia neither of those cases was fatal in one case i had prescribed the twelfth of a grain and the patient took one-sixth that was for a man of middle age strychnia had been given in solution in a few minutes the symptoms appeared they were a want of power to control the muscles manifested by twitchings rigidity and cramp more violent in the legs than in any other part of the body the spasms were not very violent they continued six hours before they entirely disappeared during that time they were intermittent at various intervals as the attack passed off the length of the intervals increased at first their length was but a few seconds the spasms were not combated by medical treatment the other case was a very similar one the quantity taken was the same double what i had prescribed i have experimented upon upwards of sixty animals with strychnia those animals were dogs cats rats mice guinea pigs frogs and toads the symptoms of the attack in all animals present great resemblances some animals are however much more susceptible of its influence than others are the period elapsing between the injection of the poison and the commencement of the symptoms has been from two minutes to thirty more generally five or six i administered the poison occasionally in solution but more generally in its solid state it was sometimes placed dry upon the back of the tongue and some fluid poured down the throat sometimes it was enclosed between two portions of meat sometimes mixed up with butter or suet sometimes rolled up in a small piece of gut to frogs and toads it was administered by putting them into a solution of strychnia i have also applied it direct to the spinal cord and in some other cases to the brain the first symptom has been a desire to be quite still then hurried breathing then slavering at the mouth when the poison had been given through that organ then twitching of the ears trembling of the muscles inability to walk convulsions of all the muscles of the body the jaws being generally firmly closed the convulsions attended by a total want of power in the muscles which on the least touch were thrown into violent spasms with a galvanic like shock spasms also come on if the animal voluntarily attempts to move that is usually the case but occasionally the animal is able to move without inducing a recurrence of the spasms these spasms recur at various periods but do not always increase in violence the animals die after periods varying from three hours to three hours and a half in the cases where the animals live longest the paroxysms occur at the longest intervals in all cases in the interval before death the rigidity ceases i know no exception to this and the muscles become quite soft powerless and flaccid the limbs may be put in any position whatever there is but little difference from ordinary cases of convulsive death in the time at which the rigor mortis comes on 
I have destroyed animals with other poisons, and there is very little difference between the rigidity in their cases and that in the cases of death from strychnia. In the two women I have mentioned, the rigor mortis was much less than is usual in cases of death from natural disease. I have known fatal cases of poisoning animals by strychnia, in which there has between the first and the second paroxysm been an interval of about half an hour, but that is not common. I have examined the bodies of upwards of forty animals killed by strychnia. I have invariably found the heart full on the right side very generally the left ventricle firmly contracted and the blood usually dark and often fluid there is no particular appearance about the spine i have experimented with other poison upon upwards of two thousand animals and have written upon this subject it very often happens that in the case of animals dying suddenly from poisoning the blood is fluid after death that also happens in cases of sudden death from other causes i have attended to the evidence as to the symptoms exhibited by cook on the sunday monday and tuesday night the symptoms on sunday night i assume to have been great excitement cook described himself as having been very ill and in such a state that he considered himself mad for a few minutes he stated that the cause of this was a noise in the street these symptoms on the three nights i have mentioned do not resemble those which I have seen follow the administration of strychnia. Cook had more power of voluntary motion than I have observed in animals under the influence of this poison. He sat up in bed and moved his hands about freely, swallowed, talked, and asked to be rubbed and moved, none of which, if poisoned by strychnia, could he have done. The sudden accession of the convulsions is another reason for believing that they were not produced by strychnia other reasons for believing that the convulsions were not produced by strychnia are their sudden accession without the usual premonitory symptoms the length of time which had elapsed between their commencement and the taking of the pills which are supposed to have contained poison and the screaming and vomiting i never knew an animal which had been poisoned with strychnia to vomit or scream voluntarily i apprehend that where there is so much spasm of the heart there must be inability to vomit in the cases related in which attempts were made to produce vomiting they did not succeed there is such a case in the tenth volume of the journal de pharmacie in which an emetic was given without success the symptoms exhibited after death by animals poisoned by strychnia differ materially from those presented by the body of cook in his case the heart is stated to have been empty and uncontracted lord campbell i do not remember that i think it was said that it was contracted mr baron alderson according to my note dr harland said that the heart was contracted and contained no blood examination continued the lungs were not congested nor was the brain in the case of animals which have recovered the paroxysms have subsided gradually i never knew a severe paroxysm followed by a long interval of repose i have experimented upon the discovery of strychnia in the bodies of animals in various stages of decomposition from a few hours after death up to the forty-third day in which latter case the body was quite putrid it has never happened to me to fail to discover the poison i have experimented in about fifteen cases supposing a person to have died under the influence of strychnia poison in the first paroxysm and his stomach to have been taken out and put into a jar on the sixth day after death must strychnia have by a proper analysis been found in the body yes if the strychnia be pure such as is almost invariably found among medical men and druggists the test is nitric acid which gives a red colour which in a great measure disappears on the addition of protochloride of tin. If the strychnia be pure, it does not undergo any change on the addition of sulfuric acid, but on an addition of a mixture of bichromate of potash with several other substances, it produces a beautiful purple, which changes to varying shades until it gets to be a dirty red there are several other tests in this case the stomach was not in my opinion 
in an unfavourable condition for examination the circumstances attending its position in the jar and its removal to london would give a little more trouble but would not otherwise effect the result if the deceased had died from strychnia poison it ought to have been found in the liver spleen and kidneys i have seen this poison found in similar portions of animals which had been killed by it i have also seen it found in the blood that was by mr herapath of bristol could the analyses be defeated or confused by the existence in the stomach of other substance which would produce the same colours no supposing that pyroxantine and salicine were in the parts examined their existence would not defeat the analyses pyroxantine is very unlikely to be found in the stomach it is one of the rarest and most difficult to be obtained the distinction between pyroxantine and strychnia is quite evident pyroxantine changes to a deep purple on the addition of sulfuric acid alone and the bichromate of potash spoils the colour in strychnia no change is produced by sulfuric acid it requires the addition of the bichromate to produce the colour supposing the death to have been caused by a dose of strychnia not more than sufficient to destroy the animal would it be so diffused by the process of absorption that you would not be able by these tests to detect it in any portion of the system no i believe it would not had that question occupied your attention before you were called upon to give evidence upon this trial it had what is your reason for stating that strychnine when it has done its work continues as strychnine in the system those who say that some change takes place argue that as food undergoes a change when taken into the body so does the poison it becomes decomposed but the change in food takes place during digestion consequently its traces are not found in the blood substances like strychnine are absorbed without digestion and may be obtained unchanged from the blood they may be administered in various ways in your judgment will any amount of putrefaction prevent the discovery of strychnine to say that it is absolutely indestructible will be absurd but within ordinary limits no i have found it at the end of forty days what is the probable relative rapidity of the action of strychnine in an empty and a full stomach the emptier the stomach the quicker the action cross-examined by the attorney-general i am a lecturer on surgery mr morley who was called for the prosecution is a lecturer on chemistry part perhaps half of the experiments on the sixty animals were made by me and mr morley jointly there was nothing to distinguish the experiments which i made alone from those which i made jointly with him i state the apparent results of the whole my experiments were spread over a period of thirty years many of them have been made since the leeds case some of them were made in reference to this case i can't say how many now don't put yourself in a state of antagonism to me but tell me how many of your experiments were made in reference to this particular case i cannot answer that question the great bulk certainly were not i was first concerned in this case about the time of the death of the person at leeds i was applied to i was in correspondence with the attorney for the defence the details of the leeds case were forwarded to him by me and i called his attention to them the general dose in these experiments was from half a grain to two grains half a grain is sufficient to destroy life in larger animals i have seen both a dog and cat die from that dose but not always some animals as a species are more susceptible than those of a different species and among animals of the same species some are more susceptible than others the symptoms in the experiments i have mentioned did not appear after so long a period as an hour we have had to repeat the dose of poison in some instances when half a grain has been given that happened in the case of a cat symptoms of spasm were produced but the animal did not die she had not however swallowed the doses i think i have known animals of the cat species killed with half a grain have you any doubt about it 
Yes. Half a grain, then, is the minimum dose which will kill a cat. I think it would be the minimum dose in the case of an old, strong cat. If administered in a fluid state, I think a smaller dose would suffice. Harried breathing is one of the first symptoms. Afterwards, there are twitching and tremblings of the muscles, then convulsions. Is there any diversity, as in the intervals and the order of the symptoms, in animals of the same species? They certainly don't occur after the same intervals of time, but I should say they generally occur in the order I have described. There is some difference in the periods at which the convulsions take place. Some animals will die after less convulsion than others, but an animal generally dies after four or five. In one or two instances, an animal has died after one convulsion. In those instances, a dose has been given equal in amount to another dose which has not produced the same effect. The order in which the muscles are convulsed varies to some extent. The muscles of the limbs are generally affected first. The convulsions generally occur simultaneously. Do you know any case of strychnine in which the rigidity after death was greater than the usual rigor mortis? I think not. I don't think there is any peculiar rigidity produced by strychnine. Have you never found undue rigidity in a human subject after death from strychnine? Considerably less. In the anonymous case to which we have referred, were not the hands curved and the feet arched by muscular contraction? No more than is usual in cases of death from ordinary causes. The limbs were rigid, but not more than usual. In the face of the medical profession, I ask you whether you signed a report stating that, quote, the hands were curved and the feet decidedly arched by muscular contraction, end quote, and whether you meant by those words that there was no more than the ordinary rigidity of death. Certainly, I stated so at the time. Where? In the report? No, in conversation. Allow me to explain that a distinction was drawn between the muscles of the different parts of the body. I heard Mr. Morley's evidence with regard to experiments on animals, and his statement that, after death, there was an interval of flaccidity, after which rigidity commenced more than if it had been occasioned by the usual rigor mortis. You don't agree with that statement? I do not. I generally found the right side of the heart full. Does the fact of the heart in Cook's case having been found empty lead you to the conclusion that death was not caused by strychnine? Among other things, it does. I heard the evidence of Dr. Watson as to the case of Agnes Sennett, in which the heart was found distended and empty, also that of Mr. Taylor, as to the post-mortem examination of Mrs. Smith. No doubt he stated that the heart in that case was also empty, and do those facts exercise no influence on your judgment? They would not, unless I knew how the post-mortem examination had been made. If it was commenced at the head, the blood being fluid, the large drains would be opened, and the blood, from natural causes, would drain away. Do you know how the post-mortem examination was made in this case? No, excuse me, I do. The chest and the abdomen, not the head, were first opened. The heart, then, was not emptied in the first instance? No. Then what occasioned the contraction of the heart? When the heart is emptied, it is usually contracted. But how do you account for its contraction and emptiness? I cannot say that I am able to account for it. Lord Campbell, would the heart contract if there were blood in it? No. Lord Campbell, when you find the heart contracted, you know, then, that it was contracted at the moment of death. It is necessary to draw a distinction between the two cavities. It is very common to find the left ventricle contracted and hard, while the right is uncontracted. Lord Campbell. That is death by asphyxia? Precisely. By the Attorney General. In Cook's case, the lungs were described as not congested. Entosema is of two kinds one of them consists of dilation of the cells the other of a rupture of the cells 
when animals die from strychnine emphysema occurs i don't know the character of the emphysema in cook's case it did not occur to me to have the question put to the witnesses who described the post-mortem examination to what constitutional symptoms about cook do you ascribe the convulsions from which he died not to any was not the fact of his having syphilis an important ingredient in your judgment upon his case it was i judge that he died from convulsions by the combination of symptoms what evidence have you to suppose that he was liable to excitement and depression of spirits the fact that after winning the race he could not speak for three minutes anything else mr jones stated that he was subject to mental depression excitement will produce a state of brain which will be followed at some distance by convulsions i think dr bamford made a mistake when he said the brain was perfectly healthy do you mean to set up that opinion against that of dr devonshire and dr harland who were present at the post-mortem my opinion is founded in part upon the evidence taken at the inquest in part on the depositions with the brain and the system in the condition in which cooks were i believe it quite possible for convulsions to come on and destroy a person i do not believe that he died from apoplexy he was under the influence of morphia i don't ascribe his death to morphia except that it might assist in producing a convulsive attack i should think morphia not very good treatment considering the state of excitement he was in do you mean to say on your oath that you think he was in a state of excitement at rugeley i wish to give my evidence honestly morphia when given in an injured state of the brain often disagrees with the patient but what evidence have you as to the injured state of the brain sickness often indicates it i can't say whether the attack of sunday night was an attack of convulsions i think that the sunday attack was one of a similar character but not so intense as the attack of tuesday in which he died i don't think he had convulsions on the sunday but he was in that condition which often precedes convulsions i think he was mistaken when he stated that he was awoke by a noise i believe he was delirious that is one of the symptoms on which i found my opinion any intestinal irritation will produce convulsions in a tetanic form i have known instances in children i have not seen an instance in an animal medical writers state that such cases do occur i know no name for convulsions of that kind have you ever known a case of convulsions of that kind terminating in death in which the patient remained conscious to the last i have not where epilepsy terminates in death consciousness is gone i have known four cases of traumatic and five or six of idiopathic tetanus you heard mr jones make this statement of the symptoms of cook after the commencement of the paroxysms after he swallowed the pills he uttered loud screams threw himself back in the bed and was dreadfully convulsed he said raise me up i shall be suffocated the convulsions affected every muscle of the body and were accompanied by stiffening of the limbs i endeavoured to raise cook with the assistance of palmer but found it quite impossible owing to the rigidity of the limbs when cook found we could not raise him up he asked me to turn him over he was then quite sensible i turned him on his side i listened to the action of his heart i found that it gradually weakened and asked palmer to fetch some spirits of ammonia to be used as a stimulant when he returned the pulsations of the heart were gradually ceasing and life was almost extinct cook died very quietly a very short time afterwards when he threw himself back in bed he clinched his hands and they remained clinched after death when i was rubbing his neck his head and neck were unnaturally bent back by the spasmodic action of the muscles after death his body was so twisted or bowed that if i had placed it upon its back it would have rested upon the head and the feet now i ask you to distinguish in any one particular between those symptoms and the symptoms of tetanic convulsions it is not tetanus at all 
not idiopathic tetanus. I quite agree with you that it is not idiopathic tetanus, but point out any distinction that you can see between these symptoms and those of real tetanus. I do not know that there is any distinction, except that in a case of tetanus I never saw rigidity continue till death and afterwards. Can you tell me of any case of death from convulsions in which the patient was conscious to the last? I do not know of any. Convulsions occurring after poison had been taken are properly called tetanic. We were told by Sir B. Brodie that while the paroxysms of tetanic convulsion last, there is no difference between those which arise from strychnine and those which arise from tetanus properly so called, but the difference was in the course the symptoms took. Now what do you say is the difference between tetanus arising from strychnine and ordinary tetanus? The hands are less violently contracted. The effect of the spasm is less in ordinary tetanus. The convulsion, too, never entirely passes away. I have stated that tetanus is a disease of days, strychnine of hours and minutes. The convulsive twitching are in strychnine the first symptoms, the last in tetanus. That in tetanus the hands, feet and legs are usually the last affected, while in strychnine they are the first. I gave that opinion after the symptoms in the case of the lady at Leeds, which were described by the witness with them, and I still adhere to it. I never said that Cook's case was one of idiopathic tetanus. I do not think it was a case of tetanus in any sense of the word. It differed from the course of tetanus from strychnine, in the particulars I have already mentioned. Repeat them. There was a sudden accession of the convulsions. Sudden? After what? After the rousing by Jones. There was also the power of talking. Don't you know that Mrs. Smith talked and retained her consciousness to the end? That her last words were, turn me over? She did say something of that kind. No doubt those were the words she used. I believe that in poison from tetanus the symptoms are first observed in the legs and feet. In the animals upon which I have experimented, twitchings in the ears and difficulty of breathing have been the premonitory symptoms. When Cook felt a stiffness and a difficulty of breathing, and said that he should be suffocated on the first night, what were those but premonitory symptoms? Well, he asked to be rubbed, but as far as my experience goes with regard to animals... The Attorney General they can't ask to have their ears rubbed, of course. A laugh. Mr. Sergeant Shee said that the witness was about to explain the effect of being rubbed upon the animals. Cross-examined, continued. In no single instance could the animals bear to be touched. Did not Mrs. Smith ask to have her legs and arms rubbed? In the Leeds case, the lady asked to be rubbed before the convulsions came on but afterwards she could not bear it, and begged that she might not be touched. Can you point out any one point, after the premonitory symptoms, in which the symptoms in this case differ from those of strychnine tetanus? There is the power of swallowing, which is taken away by inability to move the jaw. But have you not stated that locked jaw is the last symptom that occurs in strychnine tetanus? I have. I don't deny that it may be. I am speaking of the general rule. In the Leeds case, it came on very early, more than two hours before death, the paroxysms having continued about two hours and a half. In that case, we believed that the dose was four times repeated. Poison might probably be extracted by chemical process from the tissues, but I never tried it, except in one case of an animal. I am not sure whether poison was in that case given through the mouth. We killed four animals in reference to the Leeds case, and in every instance we found strychnine in the contents of the stomach. In one case we administered it by two processes, and one failed and the other succeeded. Re-examined In making reports upon cases such as that which have been referred to, we state ordinary appearances. We state the facts without anything more. Mr. William Herapath, examined by Mr. Grove, Q.C. 
I am a professor of chemistry and toxicology at the Bristol Medical School. I have studied chemistry for more than 40 years and toxicology for 30. I have experimented on the poison of strychnine. I have seen no case of a human subject during life, but I have examined a human body after death. In one case I examined the contents of the stomach and I found strychnine about three days after death. There are several tests, sulfuric acid and bichromate of potash, sulfuric acid and puce-coloured oxide of lead, sulfuric acid and peroxide of lead, sulfuric acid and peroxide of manganese, etc. The lower oxides of lead would not succeed. These are all colour tests and produce a purple colour passing to red. Another class of tests give a different colour with impure but not with pure strychnia. The process used previous to these tests is for the purpose of producing strychnia. I obtained evidence of strychnia by the colour tests in the case I have mentioned. I have experimented upon animals with regard to strychnine in eight or nine cases. I have analysed the bodies in two cases in which I destroyed the animals myself. Both of them were cats. I gave the first one grain of strychnia in a solid form. The animal took the poison at night, and I found it dead in the morning. It was dreadfully contorted and rigid, the limbs extended, the head turned round, not to the back, but to the side, the eyes protruding and staring, the iris expanded so as to be almost invisible. I found strychnine in the urine, which had been ejected, and also in the stomach by the tests I have mentioned. I administered the same quantity of strychnine in a solid form to another cat. It remained very quiet for fifteen or sixteen minutes, but seemed a little restless in its eyes and in breathing. In thirty-five minutes it had a terrible spasm, the extremities and the head being drawn together, and the feet extended. I watched it for three hours. The first spasm lasted a minute or two, the saliva dripped from its mouth, and it forcibly ejected its urine. It had a second spasm a few minutes afterwards. It soon recovered and remained still, with the exception of a trembling all over. It continued in that state for three hours. During nearly two hours and a half, it was in a very peculiar state. It appeared to be electrified all through. Blowing upon it or touching the basket in which it was placed, produced a kind of electric jump like a galvanic shock. I left it in three hours, thinking it would recover, but in the morning I found it dead, in the same indurated and contorted condition as the former animal. I examined the body thirty-six hours after death, and found strychnia in the urine, in the stomach and upper intestine, in the liver and in the blood of the heart. I have discovered strychnia in all other cases by the same tests, but I took extraordinary means to get rid of organic matter. In all cases in which strychnia has been given, I have been able to find it, and not only strychnia, but also the nux vomica from which it is taken. I have found nux vomica in a fox and in other animals. The detection of nux vomica is more complicated than that of strychnia. In one case, the animal had been buried two months. I have experimented with strychnia, not in a body, but mixed purposely with organic putrefying matter. I have found it in all cases, whatever was the state of decomposition of the matter. Are you of opinion that where strychnia has been taken in a sufficient dose to poison, it can and ought to be discovered? Yes, unless the body has been completely decomposed, that is, unless decomposition has reduced it to a dry powder. I am of opinion, from the accounts given by Dr. Taylor and the other witnesses, that if it had existed in the body of Cook, it ought to have been discovered. I am aware of no cause for error in the analyses, if the organic matter had been properly got rid of. The experiments I have mentioned were made in Bristol. I have made experiments in London and found strychnia in the stomach, liver and blood of an animal cross-examined by the attorney-general i don't profess to be a physiologist i have principally experimented on the stomach until lately 
I tried my chemical process on the 8th of this month with a view to the present case. The experiment here was on a dog. I experimented on the tissues of a cat at Bristol and of a dog in London. I found strychnia in the blood, the heart, and the urine of the cat, besides the stomach. One grain was given to the dog. It was a large dog. I have seen a cat killed with a quarter of a grain. I have said that Dr. Taylor ought to have found strychnine. Have you not said that you had no doubt strychnine had been taken, but that Dr. Taylor had not gone the right way to find it? I may have said so. I had a strong opinion from reading various newspaper reports, among others the Illustrated Times, that strychnia had been given. I have expressed that opinion no doubt freely. People have talked a great deal to me about the matter, and I can't recollect every word I have said, but that was my general opinion. Re-examined by Mr. Grove What is the smallest quantity of strychnia that your process is capable of detecting? I am perfectly sure I could detect the fifty-thousandth part of a grain if it was unmixed with organic matter. If I put ten grains in a gallon or seventy thousand grains of water, I could discover its presence in the tenth part of a grain of that water. It is more difficult to detect when mixed with organic matter. If a person had taken a grain, a very small quantity would be found in the heart, but no doubt it could be found. I made four experiments with a large dog, to which I had given the eighth part of a grain. I have discovered it by change of colour in the thirty-second part of the liver of a dog. Mr. Grove said he believed his lordship was of opinion that experiments could not be shown. Lord Campbell, we have intimated that that is our clear opinion. End of section 16section seventeen of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson eighth day may the twenty second part two mr rogers examined by mr gray i am professor of chemistry at st george's school of medicine in london i have made experiments upon one animal a dog poisoned by strychnia the experiments commenced at the close of last december and ended about ten days since i gave it two grains of pure strychnia in meat three days after death i removed the stomach and contents and some of the blood the blood became putrid in about ten days and i then analyzed it with a view to find strychnine i separated the strychnine by color tests I cannot say how much it was by weight. In a month or five weeks, when the matter had putrefied, I analysed the stomach and its contents. I treated it with acidulated distilled water, and succeeded in discovering strychnia in large quantities about ten days ago. I never analysed a human subject with a view to find strychnia, but I have many times done so to find other poisons strychnia must unquestionably have been discovered in this case if it had been present and the proper tests have been used cross-examined by the attorney-general i have only made one experiment if the contents of the stomach were lost it would make a difference but not if they were only shaken up the operation would then be more difficult i am a medical man i did not analyze the tissues of the body of the dog if I had tried the tissues of Cook's body, it might have been found if it were there, notwithstanding the time that had elapsed since he died. I don't say that the time would prevent its discovery if there. Re-examined by Mr. Gray. If strychnia were in the stomach, a portion would probably be smeared over the mucous membrane, and then I should expect to find it on the surface. Dr. Henry Leatherby, examined by Mr. Keneally. I am a Bachelor of Medicine, Professor of Chemistry and Toxicology in the London Hospital of Medicine, and Medical Officer of Health to the City of London. 
I have been engaged for a considerable time in the study of poisons and their action on the living animal economy. I have also been frequently engaged on behalf of the Crown in prosecutions in cases of this nature during the last fourteen years. I have been present during the examination of the medical witnesses and have attended to the evidence as to the symptoms which have been described as attending the death of Cook. I have witnessed many cases of animals poisoned by strychnine and many cases of poisoning by nux vomica in the human body, one of which was fatal. The symptoms described in this case do not accord with the symptoms I have witnessed in the case of those animals. They differ in this respect. In the first place, I never witnessed the long interval between the administration of the poison and the commencement of the symptoms which is said to have elapsed in this case. The longest interval I have known has been three quarters of an hour, and then the poison was administered under the most disadvantageous circumstances. It was given on a very full stomach, and in a form uneasy of solution. I have seen the symptoms begin in five minutes. The average time in which they begin is a quarter of an hour. In all cases I have seen the system has been in that irritable state that the very lightest excitement, such as an effort to move, a touch, a noise, a breath of air, would send the patient off in convulsions. It is not at all probable that a person, after taking strychnia, could pull a bell violently. Any movement would excite the nervous system and bring on spasms. It is not likely that a person in that state could bear to have his neck rubbed. When a case of strychnia does not end fatally, the first paroxysm is succeeded by others, gradually shaded off, the paroxysms becoming less violent every time, and I agree with Dr. Christison that they would subside in twelve or sixteen hours. I have no hesitation in saying that strychnine is, of all poisons, either mineral or vegetable the most easy of detection. I have detected very minute portions of strychnia. When it is pure, the twenty thousandth part of a grain can be detected. I can detect the tenth part of a grain most easily in a pint of any liquid, whether pure or putrid. I gave one animal half a grain, and I have the strychnia here now within a very small trifle. I never failed to detect strychnine where it had been administered. I have made post-mortem examinations on various animals killed by it. I have always found the right side of the heart full. The reason is that the death takes place from the fixing of the muscles of the chest by spasms, so that the blood is unable to pass through the lungs, and the heart cannot relieve itself from the blood flowing to it, but therefore becomes gorged. The lungs are congested and filled with blood. I have administered strychnia in a liquid and a solid form. I agree with Dr. Taylor that it may kill in six or eleven minutes when taken in a solid state, in the form of a pill or bolus. I also agree with him that the first symptom is that the animal falls on its side, the jaws are spasmodically closed, and the slightest touch produces another paroxysm. But I do not agree with him that the colouring tests are fallacious. I do not agree that it is changed when it is absorbed into the blood, but I agree with its absorption. I think it is not changed when the body is decomposed. The shaking about of the contents of the stomach with the intestines in a jar would not prevent the discovery of strychnia if it had been administered. Even if the contents of the stomach were lost, the mucous membrane would, in the ordinary course of things, exhibit traces of strychnia. I have studied the poison of antimony. If a quantity had been introduced into brandy and water and swallowed at a gulp, the effect would not be to burn the throat. Antimony does not possess any such quality as that of immediate burning. I have turned my attention to the subject of poison for 17 or 18 years. Cross-examined by the Attorney General. I am not a member of the College of Physicians or of Surgeons. I do not now practice. I have been in general practice for two or three years. I gave evidence in the last case of this sort, tried in this court, in 1851. 
I gave evidence of the presence of arsenic. The woman was convicted. I stated that it had been administered within four hours of death. I was the cause of her being respited, and the sentence was not carried into effect. In consequence of a letter I wrote to the Home Office, other scientific gentlemen interfered and challenged the soundness of my conclusions before I wrote that letter. I have not since been employed by the Crown. Mr. Justice Cresswell, I was present at the trial. I perfectly remember it. Cross-examination continued. I detected the poison. I said in my letter that I could not speak as to possibilities, but merely as to probabilities. I have experimented on animals for a great number of years, on five recently. I have never given more than a grain, and it has always been in a solid form, in pills or bread. In the case where poison was administered under disadvantageous circumstances, it was kneaded up into a hard mass of bread. Mr. Baron Alderson, did the animal bolt it or bite it? Witness. I opened the mouth and put it into the throat. About half an hour elapsed before the symptoms appeared, in one case in which half a grain had been given. In another case, death took place within thirteen minutes. I have noticed twitching of the ears, difficulty of breathing, and other premonitory symptoms. There are little variations in the order in which the symptoms occur. I have known frequent instances in which an animal has died, in the first paroxysm. I heard the evidence of Mrs. Smith's death, and I was surprised at her having got out of bed when the servant answered the bell. It is not consistent with the cases I have seen. That fact does not shake my opinion. I have no doubt that Mrs. Smith died from strychnine. Cook's sitting up in the bed and asking Jones to ring the bell is consistent with what I have observed in strychnine cases. If a man's breath is hurried, is it not natural for him to sit up? It is. I have seen cases of recovery of human subjects after taking strychnine. There is a great uniformity in its effects, that is, in their main features, but there is a small variation as to the time in which they are produced. What do you attribute Cook's death to? It is irreconcilable with everything with which I am acquainted. Is it reconcilable with any known disease you have ever seen or heard of? No. Re-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. We are learning new facts every day, and I do not at present conceive it to be impossible that some peculiarity of the spinal cord, unrecognizable at the examination after death, may have produced symptoms like those which have been described. I, of course, include strychnia in my answer but it is irreconcilable with everything I have seen or heard of. It is as irreconcilable with strychnia as with everything else. It is irreconcilable with every disease that I am acquainted with, natural or artificial. Touching an animal during the premonitory symptoms will bring on a paroxysm. Vomiting is inconsistent with strychnia. The Romsey case was an exceptional one from the quantity of the dose. The ringing of the bell would have produced a paroxysm. I am still of opinion that the evidence I gave on the trial in 1851 is correct. I am not aware that there is any ground for an imputation upon me in respect of that evidence. I have no reason to think government was dissatisfied with me. I have since been employed in Crown prosecutions. After that case, Dr. Pereira came to my laboratory and asked me, as an act of mercy to write a letter to him to show to the home office admitting the possibility of the poison which i found in the stomach having been administered longer than four hours before death i wrote the letter drawing a distinction between what was possible and probable and the woman was transported for life mr r e gay examined by mr sergeant she I am a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. I attended a person named Forster for tetanus in October 1855. He had a sore throat, muscular pains in the neck, and in the upper portion of the cervical vertebrae. 
he was feverish and had symptoms ordinarily attending catarrh i put him under the usual treatment for catarrh and used embrocations externally to the muscles of the neck and throat and also gargles about the fourth day of my attendance the muscular pains extended to the face difficulty of swallowing came on the pains of the cervical vertebrae increased and those of the muscles of the face particularly the lower jaw in the evening of the same day the jaw became completely locked and pains came on in the muscles of the bowels the legs and the arms he became very much convulsed throughout the entire muscular system had frequent involuntary contractions of the arms and hands and legs his difficulty of swallowing increased and not a particle of food solid or liquid could be introduced into his mouth attempting to swallow the smallest portions brought on violent convulsions so strong were they throughout the system that i could compare him to nothing but a piece of warped board the head was thrown back the abdomen thrust forward and the legs frequently drawn up and contracted the attempt to feed with a spoon the opening of a window or placing the fingers on the pulse brought on violent convulsions while the patient was suffering in this manner he continually complained of great hunger and repeatedly exclaimed that he was hungry and could not eat he was kept alive to the fourteenth day entirely by injections of a milky and farinaceous character he screamed repeatedly and the noises that he made were more like those of a wild man than anything else on the twelfth day he became insensible and continued in that state until he died which was in the fourteenth day from the commencement of the attack of lockjaw the man was an omnibus driver and when i first attended him he had been suffering from sore throat for several days there was no hurt or injury of any kind about his person that would account for the symptoms i have mentioned his body was not opened after death because it was considered unnecessary i consider his disease was inflammatory sore throat from cold and exposure to the weather and that the disease assumed a tetanic form on account of the patient being a very nervous excited and anxious person his condition in life was that of an omnibus conductor he was a hard-working man and had a large family dependent upon him and this no doubt acting upon his peculiar temperament tended to produce tetanic symptoms the witness in conclusion said he had not heard all the evidence in this case but he thought it right to communicate to the prisoner's solicitor the particulars of the case to which he had now referred as he considered it had an important bearing upon the charge against the prisoner cross-examined by the attorney-general the case i have mentioned was undoubtedly one of idiopathic tetanus it is the only one of the kind i ever had to deal with it arose from exposure to cold acting upon a nervous and irritable temperament i have a good many patients who are nervous and irritable but i never met with such another case the disease was altogether progressive from the first onset and although for a short time there was a remission of the symptoms they invariably recurred the locking of the jaw was one of the very first symptoms that made their appearance sergeant shee then addressed the court and said that the next witness he proposed to call would occupy some time in examination and as it was now nearly six o'clock he suggested it would be better to adjourn the examination to the next day the lord chief justice said he had no objection to the course proposed by the learned sergeant and he then inquired of him how much time the case for the defence was likely to occupy sergeant she said he hoped to conclude the defence to-morrow and he should endeavour to do so if he possibly could the lord chief justice said there was no desire to hurry him it was most essential in so important an inquiry that the most ample opportunity should be allowed for a full and satisfactory investigation the court then adjourned till the following morning at ten o'clock end of section seventeen
Section 18 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Ninth Day, May the 23rd. There was a great crowd as usual in court this morning, long before the commencement of the proceedings. The Duke of Wellington, the Earl of Albemarle, Lord Donamore, Lord Dufferin, Lord Feversham, Sir J. Packington, Mr. Harcourt Vernon, General Peel, Mr. Tolomac, Mr. S. Warren, and other members of Parliament were present. The learned judges, Lord Campbell, Mr. Baron Alderson, and Mr. Justice Cresswell, took their seats upon the bench at about ten o'clock, and the prisoner having been placed at the bar, the examination of witnesses for the defence was resumed. No alteration has taken place in the prisoner's demeanour. Counsel for the Crown The Attorney General, Mr. E. James Q.C., Mr. Wellesby, Mr. Bodkin, and Mr. Huddleston. For the prisoner, Mr. Sergeant Shee, Mr. Grove Q.C., Mr. Gray, and Mr. Keneally. Mr. J. B. Ross, examined by Mr. Grove. I am house surgeon to the London Hospital. I recollect a case of tetanus being brought into the hospital on the 22nd of March last. A man, aged 37, was brought in about half-past seven o'clock in the evening. He had had one paroxysm in the receiving room. His pulse was rapid and feeble. His jaws were closed and fixed. There was an expression of anxiety about the countenance. The features were sunken. He was unable to swallow, and the muscles of the abdomen and the back were somewhat tense. After he had been in the ward about ten minutes, he had another paroxysm, and his body became arched. It lasted about a minute. He was afterwards quieter for a few minutes, and then he had another attack, and died. The whole lasted about half an hour. There was an inquest held on the body. It was examined, and no poison was found. I think tetanus was the cause of death. There were three wounds on the body, two at the back of the right elbow, each about the size of a shilling, and one on the left elbow, about the size of a sixpence. The man had had those wounds for twelve or sixteen years. They were old chronic indurated ulcers, circular in outline, the edges thickened and rounded, and covered with a white coating, without any granulation. I am unable to say what was the origin of those ulcers, but I have seen other wounds like them. I have seen old chronic syphilitic wounds like them in other places. Those wounds were the only things which would account for tetanus. Cross-examined by the Attorney General. I ascertained that poultices had been applied to the wounds a day or two before, but I am not certain as to the exact time. The man's wife had objected to their application. They were made of linseed meal. The man's jaws were fixed so as to render him perfectly incapable of swallowing anything. He said he had first been taken with symptoms of lockjaw at eleven o'clock, as he told me at dinner. But as he told my colleague at breakfast, he was able to speak but could not open the jaw. That is a symptom of tetanus. There were symptoms of rigidity about the abdominal and lumbar muscles. He did not say how long he had felt that rigidity. I gathered that some other medical man, a surgeon, had seen him in the afternoon before he came to the hospital, but I am not certain as to that. He was a labouring man. Have you any doubt that the disease had been coming on since morning? No doubt at all. The sores were ugly sores of a chronic character, ulcers. There was an integument which connected the two on the right arm, so that they would be likely to run into one another. The wounds continued under the skin, and there were no signs of healing. They had the appearance of old, neglected sores. They were at the seat of the ulnar nerve, a very sensitive nerve, that which is commonly called the funny bone. I believe he had successive paroxysms all the afternoon before he came to the hospital. I think his attack arose from tetanus. My opinion is founded upon the facts that he had had wounds, that he had died of spasms, that he had lockjaw, that the muscles of the abdomen and back were rigid, and that he complained of pain in the stomach. 
I did not hear the account of the symptoms of Cook's death. An affection of the ulnar nerve was peculiarly liable to produce tetanus. Re-examined by Mr. Grove. Strychnine was suspected in that case. The nerves of the tongue are very delicate, as are also those of the throat and forces. I have read descriptions of tetanus in the books. The case described by Mr. Gay was idiopathic, having been caused by a cold. An injury to any delicate nerve would decidedly be a cause of tetanus. Mr. Reiner's Mantel, examined by Mr. Gray. I am a house surgeon at the London Hospital. I saw the case mentioned by Mr. Ross, and his statement with respect to the symptoms is correct. In my judgment, the disease of which the patient died was tetanus, produced by the sores on the arms. Dr. Wrightson, examined by Mr. Keneally. I was a pupil of Liebig at Gießen. I am a teacher of chemistry in a school in Birmingham. I have studied the nature and acquired a knowledge of poisons, and I have been engaged by the Crown in the detection of poison in a prosecution. I have experimented upon strychnia. I have found no extraordinary difficulty in the detection of strychnia. It is certainly to be detected by the usual tests. I have tested and discovered it both pure and mixed with impure matter after decomposition has set in. I have detected it in a mixture of bile, bilious matter, and putrefying blood. Strychnia can be discovered in the tissues. I have discovered it in the viscera of a cat, in the blood of one dog, and in the urine of another dog, both of them having been poisoned by strychnia. I am of opinion that strychnia does not undergo decomposition in the act of poisoning or in entering into the circulation. If it underwent such a change, if it were decomposed, I should say it would not be possible to discover it in the tissues. It might possibly be changed into a substance in which, however, it would still be detectable. It can be discovered in extremely minute quantities indeed. When I detected it in the blood of a dog, I had given the animal two grains. To the second dog, I gave one grain, and I detected it in the urine. Half a grain was intended to have been given to the cat, but a considerable portion of it was lost. Assuming that a man was poisoned by strychnine, and if his stomach was sent to me for analysation within five or six days after death, I have no doubt that I should find it generally. If a man had been poisoned by strychnine, I should certainly expect to detect it. Cross-examined by the Attorney General Supposing that the whole dose were absorbed into the system, where would you expect to find it? In the blood. Does it pass from the blood into the solids of the body? It does, or, I should rather say, it is left in the solids of the body. In its progress towards its final destination, the destruction of life, it passes from the blood, or is left by the blood in the solid tissues of the body. If it be present in the stomach, you find it in the stomach. If it be present in the blood, you find it in the blood. If it be left by the blood in the tissues, you find it in the tissues? Precisely so. Suppose the whole had been absorbed, then I would not undertake to find it. Suppose the whole had been eliminated from the blood and had passed into the urine, should you expect to find any in the blood? Certainly not. Suppose that the minimum dose which will destroy life had been taken, and absorbed into the circulation, then deposited in the tissues, and then a part of it eliminated by the action of the kidneys, where should you search for it? In the blood, in the tissues, and in the ejections, and I would undertake to discover it in each of them. Re-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. Suppose you knew a man to have been killed by strychnia, administered to him one and a half hours before he died. In your judgment, would that strychnia certainly be detected in the stomach in the first instance? Yes. Suppose it to have been administered in the shape of pills, and completely absorbed and got out of the stomach, would it still be found? I can't tell. If it were found, it would be in the liver and kidneys. Could it be detected under those circumstances in the coats of the stomach? Not knowing the dose administered and the power of absorption, 
I cannot say that it would certainly be detected, but probably it could. When death has taken place after one paroxysm, and an hour and a half after ingestion of the poison, can you form an opinion as to whether the dose was considerable or inconsiderable? I cannot. Mr. Baron Alderson, how do you suppose strychnine acts when taken into the stomach? I cannot form an opinion. Mr. Baron Alderson, it goes, I suppose, from the stomach to the blood, and from the blood somewhere else, and arriving at that somewhere else, it kills. Lord Campbell, I cannot allow this witness to leave the box without expressing my high approbation of the manner in which he has given his evidence. Mr. Sergeant Shee requested to be allowed to ask the witness whether a strong dose was likely to pass through all the stages his lordship had mentioned. Mr. Baron Alderson, that depends on where the killing takes place. Professor Partridge, examined by Mr. Grove. I have been many years in extensive practice as a surgeon, and I am a professor of anatomy in King's College. I have heard the evidence as to Cook's symptoms and post-mortem examination. I have heard the statements as to the granules that were found on his spine. They would be likely to cause inflammation, and no doubt that inflammation would have been discovered if the spinal cord or its membranes had been examined shortly after death. It would not be likely to be discovered if the spinal cord was not examined until nine weeks after death. I have not seen cases in which this inflammation has produced tetanic form of convulsions, but such cases are on record. It sometimes does, and sometimes does not, produce convulsions and death. Can you form any judgment as to the cause of death in Cook's case? I cannot. No conclusion or inference can be drawn from the degree or kind of the contractions of the body after death. Lord Campbell, can you not say, from the symptoms you heard, whether death was produced by tetanus, without saying that it was the cause of tetanus? Witness. Hypothetically, I should infer that he died of the form of tetanus which convulses the muscles. Great varieties of rigidity arise after death from natural causes. The half-bent hands and fingers are not uncommon after natural death. The arching of the feet, in this case, seemed to me rather greater than usual. Cross-examined by the Attorney-General. Granules are sometimes, but not commonly, found about the spine of a healthy subject. Not on the cord itself, they may exist consistently with health. No satisfactory cases of the inflammation I have described have come under my notice without producing convulsions. It is a very rare disease. I cannot state from the recorded cases the course of the symptoms of that disease. It varies in duration, sometimes lasting only for days, sometimes much longer. If the patient lives, it is accompanied with paralysis. It produces no effect upon the brain, which is recognizable after death. It would not affect the brain prior to death. I do not know whether it is attended with loss of sensibility before death. The size of the granules, which will produce it, varies. This disease is not a matter of months, unless it terminates in palsy. I never heard of a case in which the patient died after a single convulsion. Between the intervals of the convulsions, I don't believe a man could have twenty-four hours repose. Pain and spasms would accompany the convulsions. I cannot form a judgment as to whether the general health would be affected in the intervals between them. You have heard it stated that from the midnight of Monday till Tuesday, Cook had complete repose. Now I ask you, in the face of the medical profession, whether you think the symptoms which have been described proceeded from that disease. I should think not. Did you ever know the hands completely clinched after death, except in case of tetanus? No. Have you ever known it even in idiopathic or traumatic tetanus? I have never seen idiopathic tetanus. I have seen the hands completely clinched in traumatic tetanus. A great deal of force is often required to separate them. Have you ever known the foot so distorted as to assume the form of a club foot? No. You heard Mr. Jones state that if he had turned the body upon the back, it would have rested on the head and the heels. Have you any doubt that that is an indication of death from tetanus? No. 
It is a form of tetanic spasm. I am only acquainted with tetanus resulting from strychnine by reading. Some of the symptoms in Cook's case are consistent, some are inconsistent with strychnine tetanus. The first inconsistent symptom is the interval that occurred between the taking of the supposed poison and the attacks. Are not symptoms of bending of the body, difficulty of respiration, convulsions in the throat, legs and arms, perfectly consistent with what you know of the symptoms of death from strychnine? Perfectly consistent. I have known cases of traumatic tetanus. The symptoms in those cases have been occasionally remitted, never wholly remitted. I never knew traumatic tetanus run its course to death in less than three or four days. I never knew a complete case of the operation of strychnine upon a human subject. Bearing in mind the distinction between traumatic and idiopathic tetanus, did you ever know of such a death as that of Cook, according to the symptoms you have heard described? No. Re-examined by Mr. Grove. Besides the symptoms which I have mentioned as being inconsistent with the theory of death by strychnine, there are others, namely sickness, beating the bedclothes, want of sensitiveness to external impressions, and sudden cessation of the convulsions and apparent complete recovery. There was apparently an absence of the usual muscular agitation. Symptoms of convulsive character arising from an injury to the spine vary considerably in their degrees of violence, in their periods of intermission, and in the muscles which are attacked. Intermission of the disease occurs, but is not frequent, in traumatic tetanus. I don't remember that death has ever taken place in fifteen hours. It may take place in forty-eight hours during convulsions. Granules about the spine are more unusual in young people than in old. I don't know of any case in which the spine can preserve its integrity, so as to be properly examined, for a period of nine weeks. I should not feel justified in inferring that there was no disease from not finding any at the end of that time. A period of decomposition varies from a few hours to a few days. It is not in the least probable that it could be delayed for nine weeks. By the Attorney General Supposing the stomach were acted on by other causes, I do not think sickness would be inconsistent with tetanus. John Gay, examined by Mr. Gray. I am a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, and I have been a surgeon to the Royal Free Hospital. A case of traumatic tetanus in a boy came under my observation in that hospital in 1843. The patient was brought in during the time he was ill. He was brought on the 28th of July, and died on the 2nd of August. He had met with an accident a week before. During the first three days, he had paroxysms of unusual severity. His mother complained that he could not open his mouth, and he complained of stiff neck. During the night, he started up and was convulsed. On the following night, he was again convulsed. At times, the abdominal muscles, as well as those of the legs and back, were rigid. The muscles of the face were also in a state of great contraction. On the following third day, he was in the same state. At two o'clock, there was much less rigidity of the muscles, especially those of the abdomen and back. On the following morning, the muscular rigidity had gone. He opened his mouth and was able to talk. He was thoroughly relieved. He had no return of spasms till half-past five the following day. He then asked the nurse to change his linen, and as she lifted him up in the bed to do so, violent convulsions of the arms and face came on, and he died in a few minutes. About thirty hours elapsed between the preceding convulsion and the one which terminated his life. Before the paroxysm came on, the rigidity had been completely relaxed. I had given the patient tartar emetic, containing antimony, in order to produce vomiting on the second day. It produced no effect. I gave a larger dose on the third day, which also produced no effect. I gave no more after the third day. Cross-examined by the Attorney General the accident which had happened to him was that a large stone had fallen upon the middle toe of the left foot and completely smashed it. The wound had become very unhealthy. I amputated the toe. The mouth was almost closed up when I first saw him. 
the jaw remained closed until the first of august but i could manage to get a small quantity of tartar emetic into the mouth the convulsions were intermitted during the day but the muscles of the body chest abdomen back and neck were all rigid and continued so for the two days on which i administered tartar emetic rigidity of the muscles of the chest and stomach would no doubt go far to prevent vomiting the symptoms began to abate on the morning of the first of august the fourth day and gradually subsided until the rigidity entirely wore off i then thought he was going to get well the wound might have been rubbed against the bed when he was raised but i don't think it probable some peculiar irritation of the nerves would give rise to the affection of the spinal cord no doubt the death took place in consequence of something produced by the injury to the toe re-examined by mr gray there may be various causes for that irritation of the spinal cord which ends in tetanic convulsions it would be very difficult merely from seeing symptoms of tetanus and in the absence of all knowledge as to how it had been occasioned to ascribe it to any particular cause dr w macdonald examined by mr keneally i am a licentiate of the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh i have been in practice for fourteen years and have had considerable experience practical and theoretical of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus i have seen two cases of idiopathic tetanus and have made that disease the subject of medical research tetanus will proceed from very slight causes an alteration of the secretions of the body exposure to cold or damp or mental excitement would cause it sensual excitement would produce it the presence of gritty granules in the spine or brain might produce tetanic convulsions i have seen cases in which small gritty tubercles in the brain were the only assignable cause of death which had resulted from convulsions i believe that in addition to the slight causes which i have named tetanic convulsions result from causes as yet undiscoverable by human science in many post-mortem examinations of the body of persons who had died from tetanus no trace of any disease could be discovered beyond congestion or vascularity of some of the vessels surrounding the nerves strychnia however is very easily discoverable by a scientific man i remember the case of a woman catherine watson who is now present and who was attacked with idiopathic tetanus on the twentieth of october eighteen fifty five the witness read a report of the circumstances attending this case the subject of which was a young woman twenty-two years of age who after going about her ordinary occupation during the day was attacked with tetanus at ten o'clock at night by the administration of chloroform the violence of the spasms was gradually diminished and she recovered after her recovery she slept for thirty-six hours in that case there was lockjaw which set in about the middle of the attack it is generally a late symptom i had a patient named coopland who died of tetanus it must have been idiopathic as there was no external cause the patient died in somewhat less than half an hour before i could reach the house i have made a number of experiments upon animals with reference to strychnia poison i have found the post-mortem appearances very generally to concur the vessels of the membranes of the brain have generally been highly congested the sinuses gorged with blood in one case there was hemorrhage from the nostrils that was a case of very high congestion in some cases there have been an extraversation of blood at the base of the brain i have cut through the substance of the brain and have found in it numerous red points the lungs have been either collapsed or congested the heart has invariably been filled with blood on the right side and very often on the left side too the liver has been congested the kidneys and spleen generally healthy the vessels of the stomach on the outer surface have been congested and on the mucous or inner surface highly vascular the vessels of the membranes of the spinal cord have been congested and sometimes red points have been displayed on cutting it through from a post-mortem examination you may generally judge of the cause of death 
I have, in a great many cases, experimented for the discovery of strychnia. You may discover in the stomach the smallest dose that will kill. If you kill with a grain, you may discover traces of it. By traces, I mean evidences of its presence. You can discover the fifty thousandth part of a grain. I have actually experimented so as to discover that quantity. The decomposition of strychnia is a theory which no scientific man of eminence has ever before propounded. I first heard of that theory in this court. In my opinion, there is no well-grounded reason whatever for it. It has disproved the theory by numerous experiments. I have taken the blood of an animal poisoned by two grains of strychnia, about the least quantity which would destroy life and have injected it into the abdominal cavities of smaller animals, and have destroyed them, with all the symptoms and post-mortem appearances of poisoning by strychnia. Strychnia being administered in pills would not affect its detection. If the pills were hard, they would keep it together, but you might find its remains more easily. I do not agree with Dr. Taylor that colour tests are fallacious. I believe that such tests are a reliable mode of ascertaining the presence of strychnia. I have invariably found strychnia in the urine which has been ejected. Strychnia cannot be confounded with pyrozanthi. After strychnia has been administered, there is an increased flow of saliva. In my experiments, that has been a very marked symptom. Animals to which strychnia has been given have always been very susceptible to touch. The stamp of a foot or a sharp word would throw them into convulsions. Even before the paroxysms commenced, touching them would be likely to throw them into tonic convulsions. Lord Campbell. As soon as the poison is swallowed? No, it would be after a certain time. The first symptom of poisoning must have been developed. Examination continued. I do not think rubbing them would give them relief. I think it extremely improbable that a man who had taken a dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life could, after the symptoms had made their appearance, pull a bell violently. I have attended to the evidence as to Cook's symptoms. To the symptoms I attach little importance, as a means of diagnosis, because you may have the same symptoms, developed by many different causes. A dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life would hardly require an hour and a half for its absorption. I think that death was, in this case, caused by epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications. I form that opinion from the post-mortem appearances being so different from those that I have described as attending poison with strychnia, but from the supposition that a dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life in one paroxysm could not, so far as I am aware, have required even an hour for its absorption before the commencement of the attack. If the attack were of an epileptic character, the interval between the attacks of Monday and Tuesday would be natural, as epileptic seizures very often recur at about the same hours of successive days. Assuming that a man was in so excited a state of mind that he was silenced for two or three minutes after his horse had won a race, that he exposed himself to cold and damp, excited his brain by drink, and was attacked by violent vomiting, and that after his death deposits of gritty granules were found in the neighbourhood of the spinal cord, would these causes be likely to produce such a death as that of Cook? Any one of these causes would assist in the production of such a death. As a congeries, would they be still more likely to produce it? Yes cross-examined by the attorney-general i am a general practitioner and am parochial medical officer i have had personal experience of two cases of idiopathic tetanus what i have said about mental and sensual excitement and so on has not come within my own observation in the case of catherine watson i saw the patient at about half past ten at night she had been ill nearly an hour and had five or six spasms she had gone about her usual duties up to evening. She felt a slight lassitude for two days previous to the attack. It was only by close pressing that I ascertained that lockjaw came on about an hour or two after I was called in. The case of Poopland was that of a young child between three and four years old. I was attending the mother, 
and saw the child in good health half an hour before it came on. It was seized with spasm, and what I conjectured to be of the diaphragm, and died in about half an hour. I had seen the child asleep, but I did not examine him. I don't know whether I saw the face of the child, but it was in bed. I judged that it was asleep. Is that the same as seeing it asleep? Sometimes a medical man can form a better judgment than a lawyer. Mr. Smith applied to me to be a witness in this case. I communicated to him the case of Catherine Watson as resembling the case of Cook. I furnished my notes to be copied the night before last. I have been here since the commencement of the trial. I have been at all the consultations. I began the experiments for this case in January. I have made experiments before. That was eight or ten years ago. I then found out that strychnia could be discovered by chemical and physiological tests. I killed dogs, cats, rabbits, and fowls. The doses I administered were from three quarters up to two grains. To dogs, the smallest quantity administered was a grain. In four cases, I killed with one grain, five with a grain and a half, one with a grain and a quarter, and two with two grains. I never killed a dog with half a grain of strychnia, and therefore never experimented to find that quantity after death. I have always found the brain and heart highly congested. The immediate course of the fullness of the heart is that the spasm drives the blood from the small capillaries into the large vessels. The spasm of the respiratory muscles prevents the expansion of the lungs. One lasted five or six days, the other six or seven days, and the patient recovered. I have never seen a case of strychnia in the human subject. So far as I can judge, Cook's was a case of epileptic convulsions, with tetanic complications. Nobody can say from what epilepsy proceeds. I have not arrived at any opinion on the subject. I have seen one death from epilepsy. The patient was not conscious when he died. I can't mention a case in which a patient dying from epilepsy has preserved his consciousness to the time of death. You have been reading up on the subject? I am pretty well up in most branches of medicine. A laugh. I know of no case in which a patient dying from epilepsy has been conscious. My opinion is Cook died of epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications. By Lord Campbell. That is a disease well known to physicians. It is mentioned in Dr. Copland's dictionary. Examination continued. I believe that all convulsive diseases, including the epileptic forms and the various tetanic complications, arise from the decomposition of the blood acting upon the nerves. Any mental excitement might have caused Cook's attack. Cook was excited at Shrewsbury, and wherever there is excitement, there is consequent depression. I think Cook was afterwards depressed. When a man is lying in bed and vomiting, he must be depressed. This gentleman was much overjoyed at his horse winning, and do you think he vomited in consequence? It might predispose him to vomit. I am not speaking of mites. Do you think that the excitement of the three minutes on the course at Shrewsbury on the Tuesday accounts for the vomiting on the Wednesday night? I do not. I find no symptoms of excitement or depression reported between that time and the time of his death. The white spots found in the stomach of the deceased might, by producing an inflammatory condition of the stomach, have brought on the convulsions which caused death. The Attorney General. But the gentlemen who made the post-mortem examination say that the stomach was not inflamed. Witness. There were white spots which cannot exist without inflammation. There must have been inflammation. The Attorney General. But these gentlemen say that there was not inflammation. Witness. I do not believe them. A laugh. Sensual excitement might cause epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications. The chancre and syphilitic sores were evidence that Cook had undergone such excitement. That might have occurred before he was at Shrewsbury. Might sexual intercourse produce epilepsy a fortnight after it occurred? There is an instance on record in which epilepsy supervened upon the very act of intercourse. 
"'Have you any instance in which epilepsy came on a fortnight afterwards?' "'A laugh. "'It is within the range of possibility. "'Do you mean, as a serious man of science, to say that?' "'The results might. "'What results were there in this case?' "'The chancre and the syphilitic sores. "'Did you ever dream of such a thing?' I never heard of it. Did you ever hear of any other form of syphilitic disease producing epilepsy? No, but tetanus. The Attorney General. But you say this was epilepsy. We are not talking of tetanus. Witness. You forget the tetanic complications. Roars of laughter. The Attorney General. If I understand right, then, it stands thus. The sexual excitement produces epilepsy and the chancre superad tetanic complications witness i say that the results of sexual excitement produce epilepsy mr baron alderson said he had heard some person in court clap his hands on an occasion on which a man is being tried for his life such a display was most indecent examination continued i cannot remember any fatal case of poisoning by strychnia in which so long a period as an hour and a half intervened between the taking of the poison and the appearance of the first symptoms what would be the effect of morphia given a day or two previously would it not retard the action of the poison no i have seen opium bring on convulsions very nearly similar what quantity a grain and a half from my experience i think that if morphia had been given a day or two before it would have accelerated the action of the strychnia i have seen opium bring on epileptic convulsions if this were a case of poisoning by strychnia i should suppose that as both opium and strychnia produce congestion of the brain the two would act together and would have a more speedy effect if congestion of the brain was coming on when morphia was given to cook on the sunday and monday nights it might have increased rather than allayed it but the gentlemen who examined the body say that there was no congestion after death but dr bamford says there was you stick to dr bamford yes i do because he was a man of experience could judge much better than younger men and he was not so likely to be mistaken but dr bamford said that cook died of apoplexy do you think this was apoplexy no it was not what then do you think of dr bamford who certified that it was that was a matter of opinion but the existence of congestion in the brain he saw the attorney-general the other medical men said there was none lord campbell that is rather a matter of reasoning than of evidence re-examined by mr sergeant shee i have seen a great many children asleep and can tell whether they are so without seeing their faces. In the case of the child who died of tetanus, the mother had told me that it was asleep. Dr. Mason Good is a well-known author upon convulsions. From my reading of his work and others, I have learned that there are convulsions which are not, strictly speaking, epilepsy, although they resemble it in some of its features. I also know the works of Monsieur Esquirol, from reading those and other works i know that epileptic convulsions sufficiently violent to cause death frequently occur without the patient entirely losing his consciousness epilepsy properly so called is sudden in its attack the patient falls down at once with the shriek that disease occurs very often at night and in bed it sometimes happens that during such convulsions actual epilepsy comes on and the patient dies of an internal spasm it sometimes happens that its existence is known to a young man's family without his knowing anything about it convulsions of an epileptic character are sometimes preceded by premonitory symptoms it sometimes happens that during such convulsions actual epilepsy comes on and the patient dies of an internal spasm it often happens that, if a patient has suffered from epilepsy and convulsions of an epileptic kind during the night, he may as well be next day as if nothing had happened, more especially when an adult is seized for the first time. In such cases, it often happens that such fits succeed each other within a short period. I heard the deposition of Dr. Bamford. 
if it were true that the mind of the deceased were distressed and irritable the night before his death i should say that he was suffering from depression from what cook said about his madness in the middle of the sunday night i should infer that he had been seized by some sudden cramp or spasm supposing that there was no such cramp i should refer what he said to nervous and mental excitement there might be some disturbance of the brain i do not believe that inflammation can be absent while spots on the stomach be present about eighteen months ago i examined the stomach of a person who had died from fever in which i found white spots i consulted various authors in an essay on the stomach by dr sprodboyne a medical man who practised in edinburgh i found mention of similar spots in the stomach of a young woman who had died suddenly dr bainbridge examined by mr grove i am a doctor of medicine and medical officer to the st martin's workhouse i have had much experience of convulsive disorders such disorders present great variety of symptoms they vary as to the frequency of the occurrence and as to the muscles affected periodicity or recurrence at the same hours days or months is common i had a case in which a patient had an attack on one christmas night and on the following christmas night at the same hour he had a similar attack the various forms of convulsions so run into each other that it is almost impossible for the most experienced medical men to state where one terminates and the other begins in both males and females hysteria is frequently attended by tetanic convulsions epileptic attacks are frequently accompanied by tetanic complications cross-examined by the attorney-general hysteric convulsions very rarely end in death i have known one case in which they have done so that occurred within the last three months it was the case of a male it occurred in st martin's workhouse the man had for years been subject to this complaint on the occasion on which he died he was ill only a few minutes i did not make a post-mortem examination i was told he was seized with sudden convulsions fell down on the ground and in five minutes was dead there was slight clinching of the hands but i think no locking of the jaw the man was about thirty-five years of age he was the brother of the celebrated aeronaut lieutenant gale in many cases of this description consciousness is destroyed it is not so in all i have met with violent cases in which it has been preserved i never knew a case in which during the paroxysm the patient spoke epilepsy is sometimes attended with opisthotonus i have seen cases of traumatic tetanus in such cases the patient retains his consciousness i have known many cases of epilepsy ending in death loss of consciousness not universally but generally accompanies epilepsy i never knew a case of death from that disease where consciousness was not destroyed i have known ten or twelve such fatal cases re-examined by mr grove persons almost invariably fall asleep after an epileptic attack the attorney-general and after taking opium yes edward austin steady examined by mr gray i am a member of the royal college of surgeons and am in practice at chatham in june eighteen fifty four i attended a person named sarah ann taylor for trismus and pleurotothonus when i first saw the patient she was bent to one side the convulsions came on in paroxysms the pleurotothonus and trismus lasted about a fortnight the patient then so far recovered as to be able to walk about about a twelvemonth afterwards on the third of march eighteen fifty five she was again seized that seizure lasted about a week she is still alive the friends of the patient said that the disease was brought on by depression arising from a quarrel with her husband cross-examined by mr james i do not know how long before the attack this quarrel occurred during it the woman received a blow on her side from her husband during the whole fortnight the lockjaw or trismus continued in march eighteen fifty five she was under my care about a week during the whole of which the trismus continued dr george robinson examined by mr keneally 
I am a licentiate of the Royal College of Physicians, and physician to the Newcastle-on-Tyne Dispensary and Fever Hospital. I have devoted considerable attention to the subject of pathology. I have practised as a physician for ten years. I have heard the whole of the medical evidence in this case. From the symptoms described, I should say that Cook died of tetanic convulsions, by which I mean not the convulsions of tetanus, but convulsions similar to those witnessed in that disease. The convulsions of epilepsy sometimes assume a tetanic appearance. I know no department of pathology more obscure than that of convulsive diseases. I have witnessed post-mortem examinations after death from convulsive diseases, and have sometimes seen no morbid appearance whatever, and in other cases the symptoms were applicable to a great variety of diseases. Convulsive diseases are always connected with the condition of the nerves. The brain has a good deal to do with the production of convulsive diseases, but the spinal cord has more. I believe that gritty granules in the region of the spinal cord would be very likely to produce convulsions, and I think they would be likely to be very similar to those described in the present case. I think that from what I have heard described of the mode of life of the deceased, it would have predisposed him to epilepsy. I have witnessed some experiments with strychnia, and have performed a few. I have also prescribed it in cases of paralysis. By the Attorney General I have seen twenty cases where epilepsy has been attended by convulsions of a tetanic character. I have never seen the symptoms of epilepsy proceed to anything like the extent of the symptoms in Cook's case. I never saw a body in a case of epilepsy so stiff as to rest upon the head and the heels. I never knew such symptoms to arise in any case except tetanus. When epilepsy presents any of these extreme forms, it is always accompanied by unconsciousness. In almost every case of epilepsy, the patient is unconscious at the time of the attack. In cases of epilepsy, I have found gritty granules on the brain, and any disturbing cause in the system, I think, would be likely to produce convulsions. I believe that the granules in this case were very likely to have irritated the spinal cord, and yet that no indication of that irritation would have remained after death. I think that these granules might have produced the death of Mr. Cook. The Attorney General. Do you think that they did so? Witness. Putting aside the assumption of death by strychnia, I should say so. The Attorney General. Are not all the symptoms spoken to by Mr. Jones indicative of death by strychnia? Witness. They certainly are. The Attorney General. Then it comes to this, that if there were no other cause of death suggested, you would say that the death in this case arose from epilepsy. Witness. Yes. By Sergeant Shee. Epilepsy is a well-known form of disease which includes many others. Dr. Richardson said, I am a physician practising in London. I have never seen a case of tetanus properly so called but I have seen many cases of death by convulsions. In many instances they have presented tetanic appearances without being strictly tetanus. I have seen the muscles fixed, especially those of the upper part of the body. I have observed the arms stiffened out, and the hands closely and firmly clinched, until death. I have also observed a sense of suffocation in the patient. In some forms of convulsions I have seen contortions both of the legs and the feet, and the patient generally expresses a wish to sit up. I have known persons die of a disease called angina pectoris. The symptoms of that disease, I consider, resemble closely those of Mr. Cook. Angina pectoris comes under the denomination of spasmodic diseases. In some cases the disease is detectable upon post-mortem examination. In others, it is not. I attended one case. A girl ten years old was under my care in 1850. I supposed she had suffered from scarlet fever. She recovered so far that my visits ceased. I left her amused and merry in the morning. At half-past ten in the evening, I was called in to see her, and I found her dying. She was supported upright at her own request. Her face was pale, the muscles of the face rigid the arms rigid, the fingers clinched, 
the respiratory muscles completely fixed and rigid and with all this there was combined intense agony and restlessness such as i have never witnessed there was perfect consciousness the child knew me described her agony and eagerly took some brandy and water from the spoon i left for the purpose of obtaining some chloroform from my own house which was thirty yards distant when i returned her head was drawn back and i could detect no respiration the eyes were then fixed open and the body just resembled a statue she was dead on the following day i made a post-mortem examination the brain was slightly congested the upper part of the spinal cord seemed healthy the lungs were collapsed the heart was in such a state of firm spasm and solidity and so emptied of blood that i remarked that it might have been rinsed out i could not discover any appearance of disease that would account for the death except a slight effusion of serum in one pleural cavity i never could ascertain any cause for the death the child went to bed well and merry and immediately afterwards jumped up screamed and exclaimed i am going to die by the attorney-general i consider that the symptoms i have described were those of angina pectoris it is the opinion of dr jenner that this disease is occasioned by the ossification of some of the small vessels of the heart i did not find that to be the case in this instance there have been many cases where no cause whatever was discovered it is called angina pectoris from its causing such extreme anguish to the chest i do not think the symptoms i have described were such as would result from taking strychnia there is this difference that rubbing the hands gives ease to the patient in cases of angina pectoris i must say there will be great difficulty in detecting the difference in the cases of angina pectoris and strychnia as regards symptoms i know of no difference between the two i am bound to say that if i had known so much of these subjects as i do now in the case i have referred to i should have gone on to analysis to endeavour to detect strychnia in the second case i discovered organic disease of the heart which was quite sufficient to account for the symptoms the disease of angina pectoris comes on quite suddenly and does not give any notice of its approach i did not send any note of this case to any medical publication it is not at all an uncommon occurrence to find the hands firmly clinched after death in cases of natural disease by mr sergeant she there are cases of angina pectoris in which the patient has recovered and appeared perfectly well for a period of twenty-four hours and then the attack has returned i am of opinion that the fact of the recurrence of the second fit in cook's case is more the symptom of angina pectoris than of strychnia poison dr wrightson was recalled and in answer to a question put by sergeant she he said it was his opinion that when the strychnia poison was absorbed in the system it was diffused throughout the entire system by the attorney-general the longer time that elapsed before the death would render the absorption more complete if a minimum dose to destroy life were given and a long interval elapsed to the death the more complete would be the absorption and the less the chance of finding it in the stomach by sergeant she i should expect still to find it in the spleen the liver and blood Catherine watson said i live in garnkirk near glasgow i was attacked with a fit in october of last year i had no wound of any kind on my body when i was attacked i did not take any poison by the attorney-general i was taken ill at night i had felt heavy all day from the morning but had no pain till night the first pain i felt was in my stomach and then i had cramp in my arms and after that i was quite insensible I have no recollection of anything after I was first attacked, except that I was bled. Sergeant She then said that he was now about to enter into another part of the case for the defence, and, probably, the court would think it a convenient period to adjourn. The Lord Chief Justice said that the court had no objection to adjourn if the learned sergeant thought it would be a convenient time to do so. The Attorney-General requested that before the court was formally adjourned, a witness named saunders whose name was upon the back of the bill and who was not in attendance and who he believed had not made his appearance during the trial 
should be called upon his recognizances he added that he believed this witness was also subpoenaed on behalf of the prisoner but he the attorney-general intended to have called him for the crown the court directed that the witness should be called upon his recognizances and this was done but he did not appear the court then adjourned until ten o'clock on saturday morning End of section 18section 19 of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson tenth day may the twenty fourth the lord chief justice campbell mr baron alderson and mr justice cresswell took their seats at ten o'clock the interest felt in this extraordinary trial was by no means diminished notwithstanding the tedious length to which the proceedings have extended the interior of the court was crowded in every part crowds were collected outside and numbers of persons who had considered themselves fortunate in obtaining orders of admission from the sheriff were ranged in long rows along the passages leading to the court anxiously awaiting the only chance of admission which was afforded them by some more fortunate brother spectator vacating his position the counsel for the crown were as on previous days the attorney-general mr james q c mr bodkin q c mr wellsby and mr huddleston counsel for the prisoner mr sergeant shee mr grove q c mr gray and mr Keneally. close of the medical evidence the names of the jurors having been called over mr oliver pemberton lecturer on anatomy of queen's college birmingham and surgeon to the general hospital of that town was sworn and examined by mr grove q c witness said i was present at the examination of the body of cook after its exhumation in january and closely examined the condition of the spinal cord it was not however in such a condition as to enable me to say confidently in what state it was immediately after death the upper part where the brain had been separated was green in colour from the effects of decomposition the remaining portion though fairly preserved for the body had been buried two months was so soft as to prevent my drawing any opinion of its state immediately after death cross-examined by the attorney-general i saw the body on the day after the bony canal had been opened the opening of that canal would to a certain extent expose the cord but the outer covering or dura mater was not opened to the best of my recollection until i arrived i attended the examination on the part of the prisoner mr bolton professor of queen's college birmingham was also present on the occasion on the part of palmer by mr sergeant shee was there any difference of opinion expressed on that occasion by the medical men the attorney-general objected to the question lord campbell decided that it could not be put mr sergeant shee said that this witness brought to a conclusion the medical evidence on the part of palmer general evidence henry matthews examined by mr grove i am inspector of police at the euston square railway station i was stationed there on monday nineteenth november last at two o'clock in the afternoon of that day a train left london which would stop at rugeley no train after that hour stops at rugeley the express train left at five in the afternoon it is due at stafford at eight forty two p m it did not arrive till eight forty five the distance from stafford to rugeley by railway is nine miles i do not know the distance by road the shortest and quickest mode of getting to rugeley after the two o'clock train would be by the five o'clock express to stafford and thence by road to rugeley joseph foster examined by mr gray i am a farmer and grazier at sibbertoft in northamptonshire i kept the george hotel at welford in that county up to lady day last i knew the late john parsons cook for many years previous to his death i have met him at various places in the hunting field at dinners and elsewhere 
I have had opportunities of judging his health. I think he was of a very weak constitution. I form that judgment from having been with him on several occasions when he suffered from bilious attacks. Those are the only circumstances upon which I formed that opinion. Cross-examined by Mr. James. I knew Mr. Cook for ten years. He hunted regularly for the last two years in Nottinghamshire. He kept sometimes two and sometimes three horses. I have known him to hunt three days a week when he was well. I knew Mr. George Pell. There was a cricket club at Welford. I do not know whether Cook was a member of the club. I have seen him there. I saw Cook for the last time at Lutterworth, about the middle of October last. I last knew him to have a bilious sick headache about a year and a half ago. Laughter. Lord Chief Justice Campbell. I most strongly implore that there will be no expression of any sensation evinced at the answers given by any of the witnesses. By Mr. James. I saw Cook at my own house when he complained of suffering. He did not hunt on that day. He came to my house to meet the hounds, but did not go. He was dressed in his hunting dress. I could not swear, but I did not see him next, within a week afterwards, in the hunting field. By Lord Campbell. I never saw Cook sick on any other occasion, except about seven years previous at Market Harborough, at the cricket match after dinner. George Myatt, Sadler, examined by Mr. Gray. I was at Shrewsbury Races on the day when Polestar won. I was at the Raven Hotel on the evening of that day, Wednesday. I saw Cook and Palmer there about twelve o'clock on the night of that day. I was waiting in the room at the hotel when they came in. I considered Cook was the worst for liquor. They proposed having a glass of brandy and water each before they went to bed. Each of us had a glass of brandy and water. When Cook commenced to drink, he made a remark that he fancied it was not good. He drank part of it off, and said he thought there was something in it. He then gave it to someone near him to taste. Cook proposed to have some more, and Palmer said he would not have any more, except Cook drank his up. They had no more brandy and water, and Palmer and I went to bed. I slept in the same room with Palmer. The brandy was brought in a decanter, and the brandy which I had was poured out of the decanter, I don't know by whom. I did not leave the room during the time when Palmer and Cook came in to me until we went to bed. I did not see anything put into the brandy and water, and I do not think anything could have been put in without my seeing it. Palmer and I went into the bedroom and left Cook in the sitting room. I slept in the same bedroom as Palmer. When I went to bed I locked the door, and Palmer did not go out of the room during the night. When Palmer got up in the morning, he asked me to go and call Cook. I did so. I went to Cook's bedroom door, rapped at it, and he told me to come in. I went in, and he told me how ill he had been during the night, and that he had been obliged to send for a doctor. He asked me what it was that was put into the brandy and water, and I told him I did not know that anything had been put into it. He asked me to send for the doctor, meaning Palmer. I did so. I next saw Cook when he came in to his breakfast. Palmer was in the room. Palmer and I breakfasted first, and Cook came in directly after we had finished, and had breakfast in the same room. On the evening of that day, Cook, Palmer, and myself left for Rugeley, having previously dined together at the Raven. We started for Rugeley about six o'clock in the evening. We travelled by the express train from Shrewsbury. Palmer paid for the three railway tickets. On the way, Palmer was sick, and both Cook and he said they could not account for the circumstance of their being sick. Palmer vomited on the road between Stafford and Rugeley. We left the train at Stafford, at the junction, and then we got into a fly and proceeded to Rugeley, there being no train for that place. It was on the way to Rugeley that Palmer was ill and vomited. Palmer said he could not account for it, unless it was that Cook had some brass vessel which he had drunk out of, or that the water was bad. There had been a great many people ill during the Shrewsbury races. I heard several people speak of their having been ill, who could not account for it. The distance by road from Stafford to Rugeley is about nine miles. Cross-examined by Mr. James. I have known Palmer all my life. He deals with me for saddlery. 
I have not been in the habit of going to the races with him, but I have gone now and then. I was at Shrewsbury races with him. I never was at Doncaster with him. I was there once with a gentleman named Robinson. I was at Wolverhampton races in August last. I went with Palmer. I did not sleep in the same room with him at Wolverhampton. I did not stop in the same hotel with him. I stopped with my brother-in-law in Wolverhampton. I believe I was there a couple of days. I did not dine or breakfast with Palmer. I was at Litchfield races with Palmer in September. Litchfield course is within ten miles of Rugeley. I did not sleep at Litchfield. I did not either go to Litchfield or come home with Palmer. I believe I have never slept in a double-bedded room with Palmer anywhere but at Shrewsbury. I never did. I never was at Worcester in my life. I paid my own expenses to Shrewsbury. Palmer paid the expenses of my living at the hotel at Shrewsbury and the fare back. He has never paid my expenses at any other races. If he has paid any expenses for me, I have deducted them from his bill. I dare say I went to some races with him the year before, I think two or three, but I can't call to mind how many. I had an interview with Palmer in Stafford Jail. I was with him a couple of hours. I should think that that was a month or five weeks ago. I cannot say when it was that I saw him. I cannot say whether it was before or after Stafford Assizes. Mr. Smith said he was going, and I thought I should like to see Palmer. I have stood half a sovereign, or a sovereign with him occasionally. I know what putting on a horse means. I did not bet at Shrewsbury. I did not back Cook's mare, Polestar. I have stood a sovereign with Palmer on a horse. The first time when I saw Cook at the Raven on the Wednesday evening was as near twelve o'clock as possible. I had not been dining with Palmer. I had dined at home at Rugeley. I arrived at Shrewsbury about eight o'clock. I went to the Raven. I knew the room which Palmer generally had, and I went up to see if he was there. That was between eight and nine o'clock. I went there direct from the railway station. I saw Cook at the door outside. He asked me what brought me there. I told him I was come to see how they were getting on. I found that Palmer had gone out, and I then went into the town. I was away about an hour, and then returned to the Raven. I went into Palmer's sitting room. Palmer was not there. I waited in the sitting room till he came. There was a man named Shelley there. He was a betting man. I waited about a couple of hours before Palmer came in. I think he came in about twelve o'clock, but I can't say exactly. He came in with Cook. I saw that Cook was the worse for liquor. He was not very drunk, but I could see that he was the worse for liquor. The brandy and water was brought in directly. The brandy was in a decanter. I believe the water was on the table, but I cannot say. I should say the brandy and the tumbler were brought up together. I don't remember Mrs. Brooks coming. I don't remember Palmer being called out of the room. I remember a gentleman coming in. I know now that he was Mr. Fisher. Before Fisher came in, Palmer had not left the room. That I will swear. Palmer never left the room until he went to bed. I swear that positively. I was close to him the whole time. When Fisher came in, Cook asked Palmer to have some more brandy and water. Palmer said he would not have any more unless Cook drank his. It was evident to anyone that Cook was the worse for liquor. Cook said, I'll drink mine, and he drank it as a draught. Directly after he drank it, he said, there's something in it. He did not say, it burns my throat dreadfully. He said that the brandy was not good. I will swear he did not say, it burns my throat dreadfully, or anything of that kind. He gave it to someone to taste. I believe it was Fisher, but will not swear. I can't say whether it was Palmer or Cook who gave it to Fisher to taste. I believe there were only four persons in the room at that time. I can't say whether any other person came into the room before we went to bed. Cook had emptied the glass as nearly as possible. There was a little left in it. I can't swear whether Palmer touched the glass or not. I believe he did taste. I believe Palmer said he could not taste anything that was the matter with the brandy and water, and he gave it to Fisher. I don't recollect Fisher saying, It's no good giving me the glass, it is empty. I can't swear whether he said so or not. I should think we remained in the room twenty minutes after that. Cook did not leave the room before we went to bed. 
Palmer and I went straight up to bed. We left Cook in the sitting-room. I did not hear that night that Cook had been vomiting and was ill. I took one glass of brandy and water. We had one glass each. The water was cold. On the following day I dined with Palmer at the Raven. Mr. Cook served me with what I had to eat. During the first two days of the inquest I was at home at Rugeley. I did not go to the inquest. Re-examined by Mr. Grove. I was not subpoenaed for the Crown. I was examined, but not summoned. The deputy governor was not present all the time I was with Palmer at Stafford. He went out once, but another officer came in. Palmer did not say a word about this case. There was an officer present the whole time. The Attorney General. I wish to ask the witness whether he did not tell Mr. Gardner, when he was asked about the brandy and water, that he knew nothing about it. The Lord Chief Justice. There is no objection to that question. Witness. I never spoke to him about brandy and water at all. The Attorney General. Did you meet him at Heddensford, where Saunders lives? Yes. The Attorney General. Did you not tell him that you could recollect nothing about brandy and water? No. The Attorney General. Had you no conversation at all? I had with Mr. Stevens. The Attorney General. Did you not say in Mr. Gardner's presence that you could recollect nothing about the brandy and water? I did not. The Attorney General. Were you not examined by Mr. Crisp and Mr. Sweeting before the inquest was held, and did you not tell them that you knew nothing about the brandy and water? No, I did not. The Attorney General. You swear you did not tell them anything about it? Yes. John Sargent, examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I am not in any business or profession. I am in the habit of attending almost all public races in the kingdom. I knew the late Mr. Cook intimately, and also the prisoner Palmer. I received a letter from Cook during the Shrewsbury races. I was subpoenaed on the part of the Crown. I have not had any notice to produce that letter. I have not got it. I have searched for it, but I had sent it to Saunders, the trainer. I have made application to Saunders for it. The application was by letter. I received a letter in answer. I have seen Saunders since. I have done everything I could to get Cook's letter. I have not a copy of it, but I know what its contents were. The court decided that the contents of the letter could not be received at that moment, as Saunders perhaps might attend before the conclusion of the day. Examination continued. I was not at Shrewsbury, and only know what Cook stated in his letter. Shortly before Cook's death I had an opportunity of noticing the state of his throat. I was with him at Liverpool the week previous to the Shrewsbury meeting. We slept in adjoining rooms. In the morning he called my attention to the state of his throat. The back part of the throat was a complete ulcer, and the throat was very much inflamed. His tongue was swollen. I said I was surprised, on seeing the state of his mouth, that he could eat anything. He said he had been in that state for weeks and months, and now he did not take notice of it. That was all that passed respecting the sore throat on that occasion. He had shown his throat to me previously, at almost every meeting we attended. On the platform at Liverpool, after the races, he took a gingerbread cayenne nut by mistake. I saw him take it. He did not know it was a cayenne nut. He told me afterwards that it nearly killed him. He did not state more particularly then the effect which it had produced on him. I know that Cook was very poor at the Liverpool meeting. That was the week before the Shrewsbury races. He owed me twenty-five pounds and gave me ten pounds on account, and said he had not sufficient to pay his expenses at Liverpool, but that I should have the balance of twenty-five pounds at the Shrewsbury meeting. Cook and Palmer were in the habit of putting on horses for each other. They did so at the Liverpool meeting. I put money on at Liverpool for Palmer, and Palmer told me that Cook stood it along with him. I heard Cook, a short time before his death, apply to Palmer to supply him with black wash. I don't know whether it is a mercurial lotion. I never saw Cook's throat dressed by anybody. Cross-examined by Mr. James the black wash was not to be drunk. A laugh. The application was made to Palmer at the Warwick Spring meeting in 1855. 
Cook was at Newmarket. I lived in the same house with him there. He was at nearly all the race meetings last year. His appetite was very good, and that surprised me. The cayenne nut is made up for a trick and mixed with other gingerbread nuts. Cook got one of those. I have tasted them. Some of them are stronger than others. Jeremiah Smith by Mr. Sergeant Shee I am an attorney at Rugeley. I am acquainted with the prisoner and was acquainted with Cook. I saw Cook at the Talbot Arms on Friday the 16th of November. He was in his bedroom. I saw him about ten o'clock. I was present at his breakfast. A small tray was put on the bed. He took tea for breakfast and had a wine glass of brandy in it. I dined with him at Palmer's house. I am not quite positive that I had seen him between breakfast and dinner. We had a rump steak for dinner. We had some champagne at dinner. We drank port wine after dinner. He had three bottles altogether, and Cook took his share. Cook, myself, and Palmer dined together. We left the house about six in the evening. Cook and I left the house together. We went to my house, and afterwards to the Albion Hotel, which is next door. We had a glass of cold brandy and water. Cook left me there. He said he felt cold, and warmed himself at the fire. He said he had borrowed a book, and would go home and read it in bed. That was between seven and eight o'clock, but I can't say exactly. In the afternoon, after dinner, we were talking about racing. I asked Cook for money, for fifty pounds. He gave me five pounds. When he was taking the note out of his pocket case, I said, Mr. Cook, you can pay me all. He said, No, there is only forty-one pounds ten shillings due to you. He said that he had given Palmer money, and would pay me the remainder when he returned from Tattersall's on the Monday. On the night following, Saturday night, he was not well, and I slept in his room. It was late when I went, I should think about eleven or twelve o'clock. I had been at a concert during the early part of the night on which Cook was unwell. He had got some toast and water and was washing his mouth. He was sick. There was a night chair in the room before the fire. I saw him sitting there. He tried to vomit, but whether he did so or not I cannot say, for I did not get out of bed. I went to sleep about two o'clock. I slept until Palmer and Bamford came into the room in the morning. I lay still in bed and heard a conversation between the doctor and Cook. Bamford said, Well, Mr. Cook, how are you this morning? Cook said, I am rather better this morning. I slept from about two or three o'clock after the house had become quiet. Bamford said, I'll send you some medicine. I don't recollect any further conversation. I know Mrs. Palmer, prisoner's mother. She sent a message to me on Monday, and I went to her and saw her. In consequence of what had passed, I went to look for the prisoner to see if he had arrived. That was about nine o'clock. I saw Palmer at ten minutes past ten. He came from the direction of Stafford in a car. He said to me, Have you seen Cook today? I said, No, I have been to Litchfield on business. On which Palmer said, he had better go and see how he was before he went to his mother's. Palmer and I went to Cook's room together. Cook said, You are late, doctor, tonight. I did not expect you to look in. I have taken the medicine which you gave me. We did not stay more than two or three minutes, and I think Cook asked me why I did not call earlier, and I said I had been detained on business. Cook said Bamford had sent him some pills which he had taken and he intimated that he would not have taken them if Palmer had come earlier. Cook told Palmer that he had been up talking with Saunders, and Palmer said, You ought not to have done so. Palmer and I left the room together, and we went straight to his mother's. The distance of Mr. Palmer's house from the Talbot Arms is about four or five hundred yards. We were there about half an hour. We both left together and went to Palmer's house. I entered with him, I asked him to let me have a glass of grog, but did not get it. I then went home. After dining with Palmer on Friday, I invited Cook and Palmer to dine with me on the next day, Saturday. Cook sent a message stating that he was not well and could not leave his room. I ordered a boiled leg of mutton for dinner and sent part of the broth from the Albion by the charwoman. I think her name was Rowley. Previous to Cook's death, I borrowed two hundred pounds for Cook and negotiated a loan with Pratt for him for five hundred pounds. The two hundred pound transaction was in May. I borrowed one hundred pounds of Mrs. Palmer and one hundred pounds of William Palmer. 
making together the two hundred pounds to which I have referred. I knew that Palmer and Cook were jointly interested in one horse, and that they were in the habit of betting for each other. When Cook's horse was going to run, Palmer put on for him, and when Palmer's ran, Cook put on for him. I have seen Thirlby, Palmer's assistant, dress Cook's throat with caustic. I think this was before the races at Shrewsbury. I have some signatures of Cook's which I know to be in his handwriting. The two notes with instructions to negotiate the loan of five hundred pounds I saw Cook sign. The notes were put in. One of them is signed J. P. Cook, the other J. Parsons Cook. I knew from Cook that he was served with a writ. I do not remember that I received any instruction to appear for him. The letters put in were read by Mr. Strait, the clerk of arraigns. The first was without date, and signed J. Parsons Cook, Monday. The following is a copy of the letter. Quote, My dear sir, I have been in a devil of a fix about the bill, but have at last settled it at the cost of an extra two guineas, for the blank discounter had issued a writ against me. I am very much disgusted at it. End quote. The letter was sent to me, but its envelope was destroyed. The next letter bore the date 25th of June, 1855. It was also without address, but witness stated that it had been sent to him, and he had destroyed the envelope. The following is a copy of the letter. Quote, Dear Jerry, I should like to have the bill renewed for two months. Can it be done? Let me know by return. I have scratched Polestar for the Nottinghamshire and Wolverhampton states. I shall be down on Saturday. Fred tells me Arabis will win the Northumberland stakes. End quote. The memorandum put in and read was signed J. P. Cook, and the following is a copy. Quote, Polestar three years, Sirius two years, by way of mortgage to secure two hundred pounds advanced upon a bill of exchange for two hundred pounds, dated twenty ninth of August, eighteen fifty five, payable about three months after date. End quote. Cross examined by the Attorney General. I am the person who took Mr. Myatt to Stafford Jail. I have known Palmer long and intimately, and have been employed a good deal as attorney for him and his family. I cannot recollect that he applied to me in December 1854 to attest a proposal for insurance on the life of Walter Palmer for £13,000 in the Solicitor's and General's Assurance Office. I will not swear that I was not applied to on the subject. I do not recollect that an application was made to me to attest a proposal for £13,000 on the Prince of Wales on Walter Palmer's life in January 1855. I know that Walter Palmer had been a bankrupt, but not that he was an uncertificated bankrupt. His bankruptcy took place at least six years ago. He had been in no business since that period to the time of his death. I knew that Walter had an allowance from his mother, and he had also money at various times from his brother William. In the years 1854 and 1855, I lived at Rugeley, sometimes at Palmer's house and sometimes at his mother's. There was no improper intimacy between myself and Palmer's mother. I slept at her house frequently, perhaps two or three times a week, having my own place of abode at Rugeley. How long did this habit continue of sleeping two or three times a week at Mrs. Palmer's house? Several years. Had you your own lodgings and chambers at Rugeley? Yes. Your own bedroom? Yes. How far were your lodgings from Mrs. Palmer's house? nearly a quarter of a mile will you be so good as to explain why having your own place of abode and your own bedroom so near to mrs palmer's you were still in the habit of sleeping two or three times a week for several years at the house of mrs palmer yes sometimes there were members of mrs palmer's family present who were they there was mr joseph palmer who resides at liverpool mr walter palmer too and sometimes william palmer when you went to see the members of palmer's family was it too late when you separated to return to your own lodgings we used to stop very late drinking gin and water smoking and sometimes afterwards playing at cards then you did not go to your own lodgings no and this continued several years two or three times a week yes 
did you ever stay at mrs palmer's house all night when there were no members of the family visiting yes frequently how often as many as two or three times a week when there were none of mrs palmer's sons there yes and when the mother was yes how often did that happen i cannot say sometimes two or three times a week when there was no one else in the house but the lady there was the mother daughter and servants you might have gone to your own home then for there was no one to drink brandy and water with or to smoke with i might have done so but i did not do you mean then to swear solemnly that no improper intimacy subsisted between you and palmer's mother i do sensation now i will turn to another subject do you remember being applied to by palmer to attest a proposal for the insurance of ten thousand pounds on the life of walter palmer in the universal life office i do not remember if you have any document which will show it i shall be able to recollect perhaps now do you remember getting a five pound note for attesting the signature of walter palmer's assignment of his policy to his brother i do not is that your signature handing a document to witness it is very similar to it is it not yours i do not know sensation upon your oath sir is not that your signature witness hesitating examine the document and then tell me on your oath whether that is not your signature witness examined the document now you have perused it tell me is not that your signature witness hesitating i have some doubts whether this is my handwriting sensation have you read the whole of the document i have not then do so witness again perused the whole of the paper now was that document prepared in your office it was not have you ever seen it before it is very much like my handwriting that is not what i asked you upon your oath have you ever seen that document before witness with hesitation it is very much like my handwriting sensation i will have an answer to my question upon your oath sir is not that your handwriting i think it is not my handwriting i think it is a very clever imitation of it sensation will you swear it is not your handwriting i will swear it is not my handwriting renewed sensation the attorney-general will your lordship please to take a note of that answer mr baron alderson did you ever make such an attestation as that in your hand i do not remember the attorney-general now is that the signature of walter palmer handing a paper to witness I believe it to be is that the signature of pratt i do not know did you not receive that paper from pratt i believe i did not i think william palmer gave it me well did he give it you i don't recollect i repeat my question did william palmer give you that document most likely he did did he i ask again it was not signed at the time but did he give it you i will have an answer i have no doubt he did well then if that document bears the signature of walter palmer and was given to you by william palmer cannot you tell whether it bears your own signature or not mr attorney don't mr attorney me answer my question upon your oath is not that your handwriting i believe it not to be will you swear it is not i believe it is not great sensation now did you apply to the midland counties insurance office to be appointed agent to the company at rugeley i did when was this i should like to fetch my documents and papers i should then be able to answer you accurately oh never mind the papers was it in october eighteen fifty five i think it was did you send up a proposal for the insurance of ten thousand pounds on the life of bates i did did william palmer ask you to make that proposal bates and palmer came together to my office with a prospectus and asked me if i knew whether there was an agent for the midland county's office 
in Rugeley. I told him I never heard of one. He asked me afterwards if I would write to get the appointment because Bates wanted to raise some money. Did you send to the Midland County's office to get the appointment of agent in order that you might be enabled to effect this insurance on Bates's life? I did. Did you make the application in order to get the insurance effected? I did. Upon the life of Bates for £10,000? I did. Sensation. Bates was at that time superintending William Palmer's stud and stables. I do not know at what salary. I afterwards went to the widow of Walter Palmer to get her to give up her claim on the policy of her husband. She was then at Liverpool. William Palmer gave me a letter for Pratt to take to her to sign. Mrs. Palmer said she would like to see her solicitor about it. I brought the document back with me because she did not sign it. I had no instructions to leave it. Did she give any reason for not signing it? Mr. Sergeant Shee objected to the question. Lord Campbell decided that it could not be put. The Attorney General. Do you know whether Walter Palmer received anything on executing the assignment of his policy to William Palmer? I believe he ultimately had something. Did he not get a bill for £200? I believe he did, and he also got a house furnished for him. Was that bill paid? I do not remember. Is that document in your handwriting? Document handed in. It is. Now, having seen that document with your signature, I ask you whether you were applied to to effect an insurance on the life of Walter Palmer. I do not recollect. Not recollect? When your signature is staring you in the face? No, I do not. You are an attorney and accustomed to business transactions? I am. Now I ask you again, were you applied to on the subject? I may have been. It is from my memory I am speaking, and wish, therefore, to speak as accurately as possible. Laughter. I don't ask you as to your memory in the abstract, but your memory now, as is refreshed by that document. Is that your signature? Witness, hesitating. I have no doubt it may be. Look at that document and see whether you were not applied to to effect the insurance I have named. That is my signature. I ask you, have you any doubt that in the month of January 1855 you were called upon to attest another proposal for £13,000 on the life of Walter Palmer? Witness with hesitation. I may have signed that paper in blank. Did you sign this proposal in blank? I might have done. But did you? I ask again. I cannot swear I did or did not. I have some doubt whether I did not sign several of these proposals in blank. Sensation. Upon your oath, do you not know that William Palmer applied to you to effect an insurance for £13,000 on the life of his brother? I do not remember. Why, this is a very large sum. Surely you must remember such a transaction as this. I may have been applied to on the subject. Were you applied to to attest another proposal for an insurance with the Universal Life Office? I cannot say that I was. Will you swear that when Walter Palmer executed the deed of assignment of his policy to William Palmer that you were not present? Now be careful, for you will certainly hear of this on some future day if you are not careful. I cannot say that I was. Upon your oath, did you not attest the deed of assignment of Walter to his brother of the interest in a policy of insurance for £13,000? I cannot say. I believe the signature, Jeremiah Smith, is very much like my handwriting. I repeat the question. I cannot say. Why, did you not receive a cheque for £5 for attesting it? I think I did receive a cheque for £5. Did you not see William Palmer write this upon the counterfoil of his cheque-book? Cheque-book handed to witness. Witness with hesitation. I cannot positively swear that I did. Did you not, sir, see him write it? That is William Palmer's handwriting, referring to the cheque-book. Did you not know that you got a five-pound cheque for attesting that signature? I may have got a cheque for five pounds, but I may not have got it for attesting the signature of the document. You say you got two hundred pounds for Cook. 
one hundred pounds from mrs palmer and one hundred pounds from william palmer yes and he gave me ten pounds for the recommendation to whom to william palmer do you not know that the two hundred pounds bill was given for the purpose of enabling william palmer to make up a sum of five hundred pounds i believe it was not for cook received absolutely from me two hundred pounds did he not have the money from you in order to take up to london to pay pratt no he took it with him i think to shrewsbury to the races who was the bill drawn in favour of i think william palmer what became of the bill i do not know witness i was not present at the inquest on cook i can't say who saw me when i went to the talbot arms and went into cook's room one of the servants gave me a candle either bond mills or lavinia barnes re-examined by mr sergeant shee i have known mrs palmer twenty years i knew her before her husband's death i should say she is sixty years of age william palmer is not her eldest son joseph is the eldest he resides at liverpool he is forty-five or forty-six years of age i think george is the next son he lives at rugeley he was frequently at his mother's house there is another son a clergyman of the church of england he resided with his mother until within the last two years except when he was at college there is a daughter she lives with her mother there are three servants mrs palmer's family does not visit much in the neighbourhood of rugeley her house is a large one i slept in a room nearest the old church mr sergeant she is there any pretence for saying you have ever been charged with any improper intimacy with mrs palmer witness i hope not mr sergeant she is there any pretence for saying so witness there ought not to be mr sergeant she is there any truth in the statement or suggestion that you have had any improper intimacy with mrs palmer witness they might have said so but there is no reason mr sergeant she is there any truth in the statement witness i should say not mr sergeant she when did it come to your knowledge that there was a proposal for walter's life witness i never heard of it until the inquest the court then adjourned for about twenty minutes when the proceedings were resumed w joseph saunders was then called upon on his subpoena but did not appear the attorney-general said he should be extremely sorry to commence his reply if there was any chance of witness making his appearance mr sergeant she said he should now ask for the production of a letter written by cook to palmer on january the fourth eighteen fifty five the letter of which the following is a copy was then put in and read Quote, Lutterworth, January the 4th, 1855. My dear sir, I sent up to London on Tuesday to back St. Hubert for fifty pounds, and my commission has returned ten shillings and one penny. I have therefore booked two hundred and fifty to twenty five against him to gain money. There is a small balance of eighteen pounds due to you, which I forgot to give you the other day. Tell Will to debit me with it on account of your share of training Pyrene. I will also write to him to do so, as there will be a balance due from him to me. Yours faithfully, J. Parsons Cook, W. Palmer, Esquire. End quote. Mr. Sergeant She submitted that he was entitled to reply on a part of evidence. The course taken by the Attorney General on getting at the contents of the cheque, the contents of an assignment of the policy on Walter Palmer's life, and the contents of the proposals to various offices for the insurance he submitted entitled him to reply on those points the lord chief justice we are of opinion that you have no right to reply mr baron alderson that is quite clear the attorney-general said he had been taken somewhat by surprise yesterday by the evidence of dr richardson with respect to angina pectoris dr richardson adverted to several books and authorities he had now those books in his possession and was desirous of putting some questions arising out of that part of the evidence the court decided against the application the case for the defence here concluded end of section nineteen
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Tenth day, May the twenty fourth, part two. The Attorney General's reply. The Attorney General, at ten minutes before three, commenced his reply, speaking occasionally in so low a tone that the conclusion of many of his sentences was inaudible. He said, May it please your lordships and gentlemen of the jury, the case for the prosecution and the case for the defence are now before you, and it now becomes my duty to address to you such observations upon the whole of the evidence as suggest themselves to my mind. I feel that I have a moral, solemn, and important duty to perform. I wish I could have answered the appeal made to me the other day by my learned friend, Sergeant Shee, and say that I am satisfied with the case which he submitted to you for the defence. But standing here as the instrument of public justice, I feel that I should be wanting in the duty that I have to perform if I did not ask at your hands for a verdict of guilty against the prisoner. I approach the consideration of the case in, I hope, what I may term a spirit of fairness and moderation. My business is to convince you, if I can, by facts and legitimate arguments of the prisoner's guilt, and if I cannot establish it to your satisfaction, no man will rejoice more than I shall in a verdict of acquittal. Gentlemen, in the mass of evidence which has been brought before you, two main questions present themselves prominently for your consideration. Did the deceased man, whose death we are now inquiring, die a natural death, or was he taken off by the foul means of poison? And if the latter proposition be sanctioned by the evidence, then comes the important, if possible the still more important, question, whether the prisoner at the bar was the author of the death. I will proceed with the consideration of the subject in the order which I have mentioned. Did John Parsons Cook die by poison? I assert and contend the affirmative of that proposition. The case which is submitted to you on behalf of the Crown is this, that having been first practised upon by antimony, Cook was at last killed by strychnine. The first question to be considered is, what was the immediate and proximate cause of his death? The witnesses for the prosecution have told you, one and all, that in their judgment he died of tetanus, which signifies a convulsive spasmodic action of the muscles of the body. Can there be any doubt that their opinion is correct? Of course it does not follow that, because he died of tetanus, it must be the tetanus of strychnia. That is a matter for after consideration. But inasmuch as strychnine produces death by tetanus, we must see, in the first place, whether it admits of doubt that he did die of tetanus. I have listened with great attention to every form in which that disease has been brought under your consideration, whether by the positive evidence of witnesses, or whether by reference to the works of scientific writers, and I assert deliberately that no case, either in the human subject or in the animal, has been brought under your notice in which the symptoms of tetanus have been so marked as in this case. From the moment the paroxysms came on, of which the unhappy man died, the symptoms were of the most marked and of the most striking character. Every muscle of his body was convulsed. He expressed the most intense dread of suffocation. He entreats them to lift him up, lest he should be suffocated, and every muscle in his body, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, was so stricken. The flexibility of the trunk and the limbs was gone, and you could only have raised him up as you would have raised a corpse in order that he might escape from the dread of suffocation they turned him over and then in the midst of that fearful paroxysm one mighty spasm seemed to have seized his heart to have pressed from it the life-blood and the result was death and when he died his body exhibited the most marked symptoms of this fearful disease he was convulsed from head to foot you could have rested him on his head and heels his hands were clasped with the grasp that it required force to overcome, and his feet assumed an arched appearance. Then, if it was a case of tetanus, into which fact I will not waste your time by inquiry, the question arises, was it a case of tetanus produced by strychnia? I will confine myself for a moment to the exhibition of the symptoms as described by the witnesses. 
tetanus may proceed from natural causes as well as from the administration of poisons and while the symptoms last they are the same but in the course of the symptoms and before the disease reaches its consummation in the death of the patient the distinction between the two is marked by characteristics which enable any one conversant with the subject to distinguish between them we have been told on the highest authority that the distinctions are these natural tetanus is a disease not of minutes not of hours but of days it takes say several other witnesses from three to four days and will extend to a period of even three weeks before the patient dies upon that point we have the most abundant and conclusive evidence of dr curling we have the evidence of dr brodie we have the evidence of dr daniel a gentleman who have seen something like twenty-five or thirty cases we have the evidence of a gentleman who has practised twenty-five years in india where these cases arising from cold are infinitely more frequent and he gives exactly the same description of the course which this disease invariably takes idiopathic or traumatic tetanus is therefore out of the question upon the evidence which has been given but traumatic tetanus is out of the question for a very different reason traumatic tetanus is brought on by the lesion of some part of the body but what is there in this case to show that there was anything like lesion at all we have had several gentlemen called who have come here with an evident determination to misconceive and misrepresent every fact we have called before you an eminent physician who had cook under his care it seems that in the spring of the year eighteen fifty five cook having found certain small spots manifest themselves in one or two parts of his body and having something of an ulcerated tongue and a sore throat conceived that he was labouring under symptoms of a particular character he addressed himself to dr savage who found that the course of medicine he had been pursuing was an erroneous one he enjoined the discontinuance of mercury his injunction was obeyed and the result was that the patient was suffering neither from disease nor wrong treatment but lest there should be any possibility of mistake dr savage says that long before the summer advanced every unsatisfactory symptom had entirely gone there was nothing wrong about him except that affection of the throat to which thousands of people are subject in other respects the man was better than he had been and might be said to be convalescent on the very day that he leaves london to go into the country a fortnight before the races his stepfather who accompanied him to the station congratulated him upon his healthy and vigorous appearance and the young man conscious of a restored state of health struck his breast and said he was well very well then he goes to shrewsbury and shortly afterwards arose those matters to which i am about to call your attention i want to know in what part of the evidence there is the slightest pretence for saying that this man had an affection which might bring on traumatic tetanus it is said that he had exhibited his tongue to witnesses and applied for a mercurial wash but it is clear that although he had at one time adopted that course he had under the recommendation of dr savage got rid of it and there is no pretence for saying he was suffering under any syphilitic affection of any kind that fact has been negatived by a man of the highest authority and eminence it is a pretence for which there was not a shadow of a foundation and i should shrink from my duty if i did not denounce it as a pretence unworthy of your attention there is nothing about the man which would warrant for a single moment the supposition that there was anything of that character in any part of his body when the tetanus set in one or two cases of traumatic tetanus have been adduced in the evidence which has been brought forward for the defence one is the case of a man in the london hospital who was brought into that institution one evening and died the same night but what are the facts the facts are that before he had been brought in he had a paroxysm early in the morning that he was suffering from ulcers of the most aggravated description the symptoms had run their course rapidly it is true but the case was not one of minutes but of hours another case has been brought forward in which the toe was amputated but there we have disease existing some time before death but then it is suggested that this may be a case of idiopathic tetanus proceeding from what 
they say that cook was a man of delicate constitution subject to excitement that he had something the matter with his chest that in addition to having something the matter with his chest he had the diseased condition of throat and putting all these things together they say that if the man took cold he might get idiopathic tetanus we are here launched into a sea of speculations and possibilities dr nunnally who comes here for the purpose of inducing you to believe there was something like idiopathic tetanus goes through supposed infirmities and talks about his excitability his delicacy of chest his affection of the throat and he says these things were predisposed to idiopathic tetanus if he took colds but what evidence is there that he did take cold not the slightest in the world there is not the smallest pretence that he ever complained of a cold or was treated for a cold i cannot help saying that it seemed to me that it is a scandal upon a learned and distinguished and liberal profession that men should come forward to put forth such speculations upon these perverted facts and draw from them sophistical and unwarrantable conclusions with a view to deceive you i have the greatest respect for science no man can have more but i cannot repress my indignation and abhorrence when i see it perverted and prostituted for the purposes of a particular case in a court of justice dr nunnally talked to you about certain excitements being the occasion of idiopathic tetanus you remember the sorts of excitements of which he spoke they are unworthy of your notice they were topics discreditable to be put forward by a witness as worthy of your consideration but suppose for a single moment that excitement at the time could produce any such effect where is the excitement manifested by cook as leading to the supposed disease they say that the man when he won his money at shrewsbury was for a moment excited and well he might be his fortunes depended upon the result of the race and i will not deny that he was overpowered with emotions of joy but those emotions subsided and we have no further trace of them from that time to the moment of his death the man passed the rest of the day with his friends in ordinary conversation and enjoyment no trace of emotion was found he is taken ill he goes to rugeley he is taken ill there again but is there the slightest symptom of excitement about him or of depression not the least when he is ill like most people he is low-spirited as soon as he gets a little better he is cheerful and happy he invites his friends and converses with them on the night of his death his conversation is cheerful he is mirthful and happy little thinking poor fellow of the fate that was depending over him he is cheerful and talks of the future but not in language of excitement what pretence is there for this idle story about excitement none whatever but even if there were excitement or depression if these things were capable of producing idiopathic tetanus the character of the disease is so essentially different that it is impossible to mistake the two what are the cases which they attempt to set up against us they brought forward a mary watson who with a gentleman came all the way from some place in scotland to tell us that a girl had been ill all day that she is taken worse at night that she gets well in a short time and goes about her business that is a case which they brought here to be compared with the death agony of this man these are the sort of cases with which they attempt to meet such a case as is spoken to here gentlemen i venture upon the evidence which has been brought before you to assert boldly that the cases of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus are marked by clear and distinct characteristics distinguishing them from the tetanus of strychnine and i say that the tetanus which accompanied cook's death is not referable to either of these forms of tetanus you have upon this point the evidence of men of the highest competency and most unquestionable integrity and upon their evidence i am satisfied you can come to no other conclusion than that this was not a case of either idiopathic or traumatic tetanus but then various attempts have been made to set up different causes as capable of producing this tetanic disease and first we have the theory of general convulsions and dr nunnally having gone through the bead-roll of the supposed infirmities of cook says 
oh this may have been a case of general convulsions i have known general convulsions assuming a tetanic character i said to him have you ever seen one single case in which death arising from general convulsions accompanied with tetanic symptoms has not ended in the unconsciousness of the patient he says no i have never heard of such a case not one but in some book or other i am told there is some such case reported and he cites for that purpose as an authority for general convulsions being accompanied with tetanic symptoms dr copland now dr copland i apprehend would stand higher as an authority than the man who quotes him dr copland might have been called but was not called notwithstanding the challenge which i threw out because it is unfortunately easier for the case to gather together from the east and from the west for practitioners of more or less celebrity than to bring to bear on the subject the light of science as treasured in the books of the eminent practitioners whom you have seen but i say as regards general convulsions the distinction is plain if they destroy the patient they destroy consciousness but here unquestionably at the very last moment until cook's heart ceased to beat his consciousness remained but then comes another supposed condition from which death in this form is said to have resulted and that is the cause intended to be set up by a very eminent practitioner dr partridge it seems that in the post-mortem examination of cook when the spinal marrow was investigated some granules were found and it is said that these may have occasioned tetanic convulsions similar to those found in cook he is called to prove that this was a case of what is called arachnitis arising from granules i asked him the symptoms which he would find in such a case i called his attention to what it had evidently not been called before namely the symptoms in cook's case and i asked him in simple terms whether looking at these symptoms he would pledge his reputation in the face of the medical world and in the face of this court that this was a case of arachnitis he would not do so and the case of arachnitis went then we have a gentleman who comes all the way from scotland to inform us as the next proposition that cook's was a case of epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications well i asked him the question did you ever know of epilepsy with or without tetanic complications in which consciousness was not destroyed before the patient died his reply was no i cannot say that i ever did but i have read in some book that such a case has occurred is there anything to make you think this was epilepsy it may have been epilepsy because i don't know what else it is but you must admit that epilepsy is characterized generally by loss of consciousness what difference would the tetanic complications have made that he was unable to explain i remind you of this species of evidence in which the witnesses have resorted to the most speculative reasoning and put forward the barest possibilities without the shadow of foundation but this i undertake to assert that there is not a single case to which they have spoken from their experience or as the result of their own knowledge on which there were the formidable and decisive symptoms of marked tetanus which existed in this case having gone through these three sets of diseases general convulsions arachnitis epilepsy proper and epilepsy with tetanic complications i suppose we have pretty nearly exhausted the whole of these scientific theories but we are destined to have another and that assumed the formidable name of angina pectoris it must have struck you when my learned friend opened his case that he never ventured to assert the nature of the disease to which they referred the death of cook and it strikes me as most remarkable that no less than four distinct and separate theories are set up by the witnesses who have been called general convulsions arachnitis epilepsy with tetanic complications and lastly angina pectoris my learned friend had this advantage in not stating to you what his medical witnesses would set up because i admit that one after another they took me by surprise the gentleman who was called yesterday and who talked of angina pectoris would not have escaped so easily if i had been in possession of the books to which he referred 
for I should have been able to expose the ignorance, the presumption of the assertions he dared to make. I say ignorance and presumption, and, what is worse, an intention to deceive. I assert it in the face of the whole medical profession, and I am sure I can prove it. These medical witnesses, one and all, differ in the views they take on the subject, but there is a remarkable coincidence between the views of some of them and the views of those who have been examined on the other side. Dr. Partridge, Dr. Robinson, and Dr. Letherby, the most eminent of the witnesses whom my learned friend has called, agreed with the statements of Dr. Brodie and other witnesses that in the whole of their experience and the whole range of their learning and observations they know of no known disease to which the symptoms in Cook's case can be referred. When such men as these agree upon any point, it is impossible to exaggerate its importance. If it be the fact that there is no known disease which can account for such symptoms as those in Cook's case, and that they are referable to poison alone, can you have any doubt that that poison was strychnia? The symptoms, at all events, from the time the paroxysm set in, are precisely the same. Distinctions are sought to be made by the sophistry of the witnesses for the defence between some of the antecedent symptoms and some of the others. I think I shall show you that these distinctions are imaginary, and that there is no foundation for them. I think I may say that the witnesses called for the defence admit this, that, from the time the paroxysm set in, of which Cook died, until the time of his death, the symptoms are precisely similar to that of tetanus by strychnine. But then, they say, and this is worthy of most particular attention, there are points of difference which have led them to the conclusion that these symptoms could not have resulted from strychnine. In the first place, they say that the period which elapsed between the supposed administration of the poison and the first appearance of the symptoms is longer than they have observed in the animals on which they have experimented. The first observation which arises is this, that there is a known difference between animal and human life in the power with which certain specific things act upon their organization. It may well be that poison administered to a rabbit will produce its effect in a given time. It by no means follows that it will produce the same effect in the same time on an animal of a different description. Still less does it follow that it will exercise its baneful influence in the same time on a human subject. The whole of the evidence on both sides leads to establish this fact, that not only in individuals of different species, but between individuals of the same species, the same poison and the same influence will produce effects different in degree, different in duration, different in power. But again, it is perfectly notorious that the rapidity with which the poison begins to work depends mainly upon the mode of its administration. If it is administered in a fluid state, it acts with greater rapidity. If it is given in a solid state, its effects come on more slowly. If it is given in an indurated substance, it will act with still greater tardiness. Then what was the period at which this poison began to act after its administration, assuming it to have been poison? It seems from Mr. Jones's statement that the pills were administered somewhere about eleven o'clock. They were not administered on his first arrival, for the patient, as if with an intuitive sense of the death that awaited him, strongly resisted the attempts to make him take them, and no doubt these remonstrances, and the endeavours to overcome them, occupied some period of time. The pills were at last given. Assuming, which I only do for the sake of argument, that the pills contained strychnine, how soon did they begin to operate? Mr. Jones says he went down to supper, and came back again about twelve o'clock. Upon his return to the room, after a word or two of conversation with Cook, he proceeded to undress and go to bed, and had not been in bed ten minutes before a warning came that another of the paroxysms was to take place. The maid-servant puts it still earlier, and it appears that so early as ten minutes before twelve the first alarm was given, which would make the interval little more than a quarter of an hour. When these witnesses tell us that it would take an hour and a half or two hours, we see here another of those exaggerated determinations to see the facts only in the way that will be the most favourable to the prisoner. 
I find in some of the experiments that have been made that the duration of time before the poison begins to work has been little, if anything, less than an hour. In the case of the girl at Glasgow, it was stated it was three-quarters of an hour before the pills began to work. There may have been some reason for the pills not taking effect within a certain period after their administration. It would be easy to mix them up with substances difficult of solution, or which might retard their action. I cannot bring myself to believe that, if in all other respects you are perfectly satisfied that the symptoms, the consequences, the effects were analogous and similar in all respects to those produced by strychnine, it is not because the pills have been taken only a quarter of an hour that you will say that strychnine was not administered in this case. But they say the premonitory symptoms were wanting, and they say that in the case of animals, the animal at first manifests some uneasiness, shrinks and draws itself into itself, as it were, and avoids moving, that certain involuntary twitchings about the head come on, and they say there were no premonitory symptoms in Cook's case. I utterly deny the proposition. I say there were premonitory symptoms of the most marked character. He is lying in his bed. He suddenly starts up in an agony of alarm. What made him do that? Was there nothing premonitory? Nothing that warned him the paroxysm was coming on? He jumps up, says, Go and fetch Palmer. Fetch me help. I am going to be ill as I was last night. What was that but a knowledge that the symptoms of the previous night were returning, and a warning of what he might expect, unless some relief were obtained? He sits up and prays to have his neck rubbed. What was the feeling about his neck but a premonitory symptom, which was to precede the paroxysm which were to supervene? He begs to have his neck rubbed, and that gives him some comfort. But here, they say, this could not have been tetanus from strychnia, because animals cannot bear to be touched, for a touch brings on a paroxysm, not only a touch, but a breath of air, a sound, a word, a movement of any one near will bring on a return of the paroxysm. Now, in two cases of death from strychnine, we have shown that the patient has endured the rubbing of his limbs, and received satisfaction from that rubbing. We produced a third case. In Mrs. Smith's case, where her legs were distorted, she prayed and entreated that she might have them straightened. The lady at Leeds, in the case which Dr. Nunnally himself attended, implored her husband, between the spasms, to rub her legs and arms in order to overcome the rigidity. That case was within his own knowledge, and yet in spite of it, although he detected strychnine in the body of the unhappy woman, he dares to say that Cook's having tolerated the rubbing between the paroxysms is a proof that he had not taken strychnia. But there is a third case, the case of Clutterbuck. He had taken an overdose of strychnia and suffered from the reappearance of tetanus, and his only comfort was to have his legs rubbed. And, therefore, I say that the continued endeavour to persuade a jury that the fact of Cook's having had his neck rubbed proves that this is not tetanus by strychnia shows nothing but the dishonesty and insincerity of the witnesses who have so dared to pervert the facts but they go further and say that cook was able to swallow so he was before the paroxysms came on but nobody has ever pretended that he could swallow afterwards he swallowed the pills and what is very curious and illustrates part of the theory is this that it was the act of swallowing the pills, a sort of movement in raising his head, which brought on the violent paroxysm in which he died. So far from mitigating against the supposition that this was a case of strychnine, the fact strongly confirms it. Then they call our attention to the appearance after death, and they say there are circumstances to be found which militate against this being a case of strychnine. They say the limbs became rigid either at the time of death or immediately after, and that ought not to be found in a case of strychnia. Dr. Nunnally says, I have always found the limbs of animals become flaccid before death, and have not found them become rigid after death. Now I can hardly believe that statement. The very next witness who got into the box told us that he had made two experiments upon cats, and killed them both, 
and he described them as indurated and contracted when he found them some hours after death and yet the presence of rigidity in the body immediately after death is put forth by dr nunnally as one of his reasons for saying this is not a death by strychnia although dr taylor told us that in the case of one of the cats the rigidity of the body was so great that he could hold it out by the leg in a horizontal position notwithstanding that evidence dr nunnally has the audacity to say that he does not believe this is a case of strychnine because there was rigidity of the limbs because the feet were distorted and the hands clinched and the muscles rigid this shows what you are to think of the honesty of this sort of evidence in which facts are selected because they make in favour of particular hypotheses of the party advancing them the next thing that is said is that the heart was empty and that in animals operated upon by dr nunnally and dr letherby the heart was full i don't think that applies to all cases but it is a remarkable fact connected with the history of the poison that you never can rely upon the precise form of its symptoms and appearances there are only certain great leading marked characteristic features we have here the main marked leading characteristic features and we have what is more collateral incidents similar to the cases in which the administration and the fact of death have been proved beyond all possibility of dispute why in two cases which have been mentioned that of mrs smith and the glasgow girl the heart was congested and empty we know that in cases of tetanus death may result from more than one cause all the muscles of the body are subject to the exciting action of the poison but no one can tell in what order these muscles may be affected or where the poisonous influence will put forth when it arrests the play of the lungs and the breathing of the atmospheric air the result will be the heart is full but if some spasm seizes on the heart the heart will be empty you have never any perfect certainty as to the mode in which the symptoms will exhibit themselves but this is brought forward as a conclusive fact against death by strychnine and yet these men who make this statement under the sanction of scientific authority have heard both cases spoken to by the gentlemen who examined the bodies then with regard to congestion of the brain and other vessels the same observation applies instead of being killed by action on the respiratory muscles of the heart death is the result of a long series of paroxysms and you expect to find the brain and other vessels congested by that series of convulsive spasms as death takes place from one or other of these causes so will the appearances be there is every reason to believe that the symptoms in this case were symptoms of tetanus in the strongest and most aggravated form looking at the symptoms which attended this unhappy man setting aside the theory of convulsions of epilepsy of arachnitis and angina pectoris and excluding idiopathic and traumatic tetanus what remains the tetanus of strychnine and the tetanus of strychnine alone and i pray your attention to the cases in which there was no question as to strychnine having been administered in which the symptoms were so similar the symptoms so analogous that i think you cannot hesitate to come to the conclusion that this death was death by strychnine several witnesses of the highest eminence both on the part of the crown and for the defence agree that in the whole range of their experience observation and knowledge they have known of no natural disease to which these remarkable symptoms can be attributed that being so and there being a known poison which will produce them how strong how cogent how irresistible is the conclusion that it is that poison and that poison alone to which they are to be attributed on the other hand the case is not without its difficulties strychnia was not found in this body and we have it no doubt upon strong evidence that in a great variety of experiments upon the bodies of animals killed by strychnia strychnia has been detected by tests which science placed at the disposal of scientific men if strychnia had been found of course there would have been no difficulty in the case and we should have had none of the ingenious theories which medical gentlemen have been called here to propound the question for your consideration is 
whether the absence of its detection leads conclusively to the view that this death was not caused by the administration of strychnia. Now, in the first place, under what circumstances was the examination made by Dr. Taylor and Dr. Rees? They told us that the stomach of the man was brought to them for analysation under the most unfavourable circumstances. They state that the contents of the stomach had been lost, and therefore they had no opportunity of experimenting upon them. It is true that they who put the portions of the body into the jar make statements somewhat different, but their appears to have been by accident some spilling of the contents and there is the most undeniable evidence of considerable bungling in the way in which the stomach had been cut and placed in the jar it was cut says dr taylor from end to end and it was tied up at both ends it had been turned among the intestines and placed amongst a mass of feculent matter and was in the most unsatisfactory condition for analysation it is very true that Dr. Nunnally, Mr. Herapath, and Dr. Sotheby say that whatever impurities there may have been, if strychnia had been in the stomach, they would have found strychnia there. I should have had every confidence in the testimony of Dr. Herapath if he had not confessed a fact which had come to my knowledge, that he had asserted that this was a case of poisoning, but that they did not go the right way to find it out. I reverence the man who, from a sense of justice and love of truth, will come forward in favour of any man for the purpose of stating what he believes to be true. But I abhor the trafficked testimony which I regret to see men of science sometimes advance. But assuming all they say to be true, as to the case of detecting strychnine, is it certain that it can be found in all cases? Dr. Taylor says no and it would be a most mischievous and dangerous proposition to assert that it is necessarily so, for it enables many a guilty man to escape, who, by administering the smallest quantity necessary to destroy life, might prevent its detection in the stomach. What have these gentlemen done? They have given large doses in the experiments they have made for the purposes of this case, in which they have been retained. I use the word retained, for it is the proper word. In all these cases, I say, they have given doses large enough to be detected. But the gentleman who made the experiments in Cook's case failed in detecting strychnine in two cases out of four, in which they had administered it to animals. The conclusion I draw is that there is no positive mode of detection. But this case does not rest here. Alas, I wish it did. I must now draw your attention to one part of the case which has not been met or attempted to be disputed in the slightest degree by my learned friend. My learned friend said that he would contest the case for the prosecution step by step. Alas, we are now upon ground upon which any friend has not even ventured a word in explanation. Was the prisoner at the bar possessed of the poison of strychnia? This is a matter with which it behoved my learned friend to deal, and to exhaust all the means in his power in order to meet this part of the case. The prisoner obtained possession of strychnia on the Monday night. It is true that the evidence of the man who sold the strychnia to Palmer, as I stated at the outset of these proceedings, and I repeat it now, must be received with care and attention. Now Newton said that on the night when Palmer came back from London, he came to him and obtained three grains of that poison, the symptoms and effects of which are precisely similar to those which are stated to have occurred in the case of this poor man. With respect to the evidence of Newton, my learned friend has done no more than repeat the warning which I gave you at the commencement of the case. You have heard the reason assigned by the witness why he did not state the fact of his having sold strychnine to the prisoner on the previous evening before the coroner, and you will judge of the value of the explanation which he gave. Upon the other hand, there is the consideration, what conceivable motive could this young man have had for now coming forward and deposing to the fact of his having sold this poison to the prisoner, except a sense of truth? My learned friend has very justly and very properly asked for your most attentive consideration to the question of the motives involved in this part of the evidence, 
before you can come to the conclusion of the prisoner having taken away with malice and forethought the life of another hideous though may be the crime of taking away life by poison it is probably not so horrible to contemplate as a motive of a judicial murder effected by a false witness against a man's life can you suppose that this young man newton could have the shadow of any such motive in coming forward in a court like this to take away the life of the prisoner at the bar as alas his evidence must do if you believe him if you believe the witness that on the monday night for no other conceivable and assignable purpose except the deed of darkness to be committed that night the prisoner at the bar obtained from him the fatal means and instrument whereby cook was to be destroyed it is impossible that you can come to any other conclusion that the prisoner is guilty of the foul deed with which he stands charged at the bar my learned friend says that newton did not speak truth because first he did not make this statement before the coroner and secondly because newton laid the time of palmer's arrival at nine o'clock whereas he did not arrive until ten o'clock now newton only stated that it was about nine o'clock and every one knows how easy it is to make a slight mistake as to the hour when there is nothing particular to fix the event on the memory my learned friend has sought to meet this part of the case he has produced a witness all i can say of whom is that for the sake of the prisoner at the bar i trust you will not allow him to be affected by anything which that most disreputable witness jeremiah smith has stated now dr bamford said that palmer told him he had himself seen cook between nine and ten o'clock while smith said that they did not leave the car until past ten o'clock with respect to the evidence of smith that he saw palmer alight from the car go from thence to the house of palmer's mother i ask you not to believe one single word of it because i do not myself believe a single word of his evidence certainly such a miserable spectacle as that witness in the box i have never been surpassed in a court of justice he is a member of the legal profession and i blush that such a member is to be found upon the rolls there was not one who heard his evidence who was not satisfied that the man came here to tell a falsehood not one who was not convinced that he was mixed up in many of the villainies which if not perpetrated were at all events contemplated and that he came here to save the life of his companion and friend and the son of the woman with whom he had that intimacy the nature of which he sought in vain to disguise i cannot but think that looking to the whole of this part of the case you must believe the evidence of newton and if you do so believe it then that evidence is conclusive of the case end of section twenty section twenty one of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson tenth day may the twenty fourth part three but the case does not stop there because we have the most indisputable evidence that on the following day palmer perched more strychnine at the shop of mr hawkins you remember the circumstance connected with that purchase palmer's first asking for some prussic acid and then ordering some strychnine to be put up for him newton coming in and the prisoner calling him out of the shop to speak to him of the most unimportant matters why did the prisoner take newton out of the shop evidently because he wished to avoid exciting suspicions that would very naturally be raised in the mind of newton from the fact of the prisoner having purchased strychnia on two occasions and who would very naturally inquire for what purpose it was that the prisoner wanted nine grains of strychnine why did the prisoner go to hawkins's shop to purchase the poison the reason was clear if he had gone to thirlby's who was his former assistant he would naturally have asked palmer for whom the strychnine was intended why the prisoner should have gone on two successive days and purchased the poison is one of those mysteries attending this case which i cannot explain at all events it is quite clear that he did so 
but if there is some difficulty in this part of the case there is on the other hand a still greater difficulty arising from the use to which the poison was to be put if it was for the purpose of professional use for the benefit of some patient where is the patient and why was he not produced my learned friend passed over this part of the case in mysterious but significant silence account for that six grains of strychnia throw a doubt if you please on the purchase of the strychnine on the monday night but on tuesday it is unquestionably true that six grains were purchased if these six grains were purchased for the use of any patients why were they not produced and if for any other purpose why was it not explained has there been the slightest shadow of attempt to show the use to which the poison was applied alas no something was said at the outset about dogs which were troublesome in the paddock to the prisoners mares and foals but that was proved to have been in september and if there had been any recurrence of this annoyance why was it not proved in evidence if it were used for the purpose of destroying dogs some one must have assisted him in the act why were they not called but not only were these persons not called they were not even named i ask you what conclusion you can draw from these circumstances except this one that the death of cook took place with all the symptoms of poison by strychnia death in all the convulsions and throes which that deadly poison produces in the frame of man it is said by my learned friend that palmer might easily have purchased strychnine at london and that he would not have purchased it in rugely on two occasions if he had intended to have used it for a criminal purpose i admit the fact and feel the full force of the observation and if he could have shown any proper use to which the poison was applied the assertion would have been one well worthy of your consideration but how do the facts stand with respect to palmer's visit to london he might it is true have purchased strychnine there but then on the occasion of his visit he had a great deal to do he had to catch the train he had pecuniary difficulties to settle and arrange and even then it would have required the certificate of one other person in order to have obtained the strychnine as he was not known in london as a medical practitioner but what avail all these suppositions when we have on the other hand the strong and unmistakable evidence that the prisoner did actually purchase the strychnine at rugeley well then it has been said that the fact of the prisoner having called in two medical men was strong presumptive evidence to negate his guilt it is true that he called in dr bamford and wrote to dr jones to come and see cook now as medical men it is true that they would be very likely to know the symptoms of death by strychnine but there is a point in this part of the case which deserves notice if these symptoms exhibited were not those resulting from strychnia but were referable to that multiform variety of diseases to which the witnesses have referred there is no reason why the prisoner should have any credit for sending for these medical gentlemen it is quite true that he called an old dr bamford i speak of that gentleman in no terms of disrespect but still i think i do him no injustice when i say that the vigour of his intellect and the powers of his mind have been impaired as all human powers are liable to be by the advance of age i do not think he was a person likely to make any very shrewd observation as to the cause of the death of cook and the best proof of this is to be found in what he did and what he wrote on the subject as regards mr jones these observations do not apply for he was a man in the possession of the full powers of mind the prisoner selected jones and the result proved how wise he was in making that selection the death of cook occurred in the presence of jones and all those painful symptoms you have heard described and yet jones suspected nothing and if the prisoner had succeeded in introducing cook's body into that strong oak coffin which he had made for him the body would have been consigned to the grave and nobody would have known anything of these proceedings while the presence of jones and dr bamford would have been used to prevent any suspicion on the other hand it is not at all improbable that the prisoner might have thought that the best mode of disarming all suspicions would be to take care that some medical men should be called in and should be present at the time of death there is nothing to show that the prisoner entertained the most distant notion that jones would have to sleep in the same room as cook 
and if this had not been the case they would have found in the morning that cook had gone through his mortal struggle and had died there alone and unfriended cook would have been found dead next morning and the old man would have said he died of apoplexy and the young man that he died of epilepsy and had any suspicion been awakened it would have been urged in reply as it has been by my learned friend that two medical men were called in by the prisoner previous to his death but the case does not end there we have had a great many witnesses who have told us a great deal about strychnia but none that have said a word about antimony on the wednesday night at shrewsbury when cook drank a glass of brandy and water he said that there was something in it which burned his throat and was afterwards seized with vomiting which lasted for several hours on the same night mrs brooke saw the prisoner shaking something in a glass it is a remarkable fact that when cook drank that brandy and water he was taken ill a few minutes after there were it is true other persons taken ill at shrewsbury about the same time but still you will have to bear in mind that scene of the shaking up of the fluid in the glass in the passage the fact that cook was somewhat in liquor and that in that state he ought not to have been told by the prisoner that he would not drink any more unless he finished his glass pass on however to rugeley you will still find that cook was under the influence of the same symptoms as those which he suffered at shrewsbury you have the fact of the prisoner sending him over toast and water and broth and that no sooner had the poor man taken these things than he is seized with incessant vomitings of the most painful character then too there was the broth said to have been sent by smith from the albion which was sent however not to the talbot inn but to the prisoner's kitchen this broth was taken over to the talbot by the prisoner himself and as soon as it was touched by cook vomitings followed there is too the fact that the servant at the talbot after taking two spoonfuls of the broth was ill for several hours and vomited something like twenty times then again on the monday when the prisoner was absent cook was found to be better but upon the tuesday when he returned to rugeley the vomitings again returned now the important fact is that antimony was found in the tissues of the poor man's body and in his blood and the presence of the antimony in the blood shows that it must have been taken within the last forty-eight hours before death the small quantity found does not afford however the slightest criterion of the whole quantity administered a part of the quantity given would have been thrown up in the vomiting something has been said about cook having taken the antimony in james's powder but not a little of evidence has been given that he took any of these powders while the presence of the antimony in the blood proved that it had been administered within forty-eight hours of death i believe that you will feel that you have a right to conclude from all the evidence that has been brought before you upon this point that antimony had been administered to cook in a mode and in quantities which showed that it could have been given for no legitimate object and further that it must have been administered by the prisoner and from these facts you will see how great is the probability that he must in that case have acted with a view of carrying out a fatal resolution previously formed for it is well known that antimony has often been given in amounts capable of destroying life but let us take into consideration the conduct of the prisoner in the after stages of the case and let us look at what took place on the day of cook's death on the preceding night he had suffered from what was indisputably a most severe attack dr bamford sees palmer on the tuesday morning and not a word is said to him about the attack the prisoner manifests an anxiety that he should not see the deceased he states that cook is quiet and is dozing and that he does not wish to have him disturbed that might be but on the other hand it must be remembered that if dr bamford had seen cook in the morning cook would in all probability have made known to him his frightful suffering of the night before and they must then have formed the subject which was of all others the most present to his memory dr bamford however did not see the deceased until seven o'clock on the tuesday evening when he was much better palmer had then talked of his having suffered from a bilious affection and it is a remarkable fact that he had more than once represented the illness of cook as one arising from a bilious attack both to dr bamford and dr jones although the patient had exhibited none of the symptoms which ordinarily accompany a bilious 
constitution. The moment Dr. Jones saw him, he made the observation that his tongue was not that of a bilious patient, and the answer he got from Palmer was, Oh, you should have seen him before. Seen him when before? There was not the slightest ground for supposing that he had been suffering from any bilious complaint, either at Shrewsbury or since his arrival at Rugeley. But not one word did Palmer say to Dr. Jones about the fit of Cook on the night before. Well, the three medical men consulted together by the bedside of the patient, and then Cook turned round and said, Mind, I will have no more pills and medicine tonight, remembering, as he no doubt did at the time, his illness of the preceding night. No observation was made even then by Palmer as to what had been the nature of Cook's attack on the night before, but the medical men having withdrawn to the adjoining room or lobby, Palmer immediately proposed that Cook should again take the same pills he had taken on the previous night, but he desired Jones not to say anything to him about what they contained, lest he might object to take them. It was then arranged that the pills should be made up, and Palmer proposed that they should be compounded by Dr. Bamford, although it was then early in the evening, and he might easily have prepared them on his own premises. He accompanied Dr. Bamford to the surgery of the latter, and after the pills had been made up there, he asked Dr. Bamford to write the address on them, and the address was so written. An interval occurred of an hour or two, during which the prisoner had abundant opportunities of going to his surgery, and doing what he pleased in the way of changing the pills. He returned to the hotel, and before he gave the pills to Cook, he took care to call the attention of Jones, who was present at the time, to the remarkable handwriting of an old gentleman like Dr. Bamford, by whom the direction of the medicine had been written. What necessity was there for that? Might it not have been part of a preconceived design to save himself from any subsequent suspicion, by his being able to state that the pills had been prepared by Dr. Bamford? And might it not have been done for the purpose of disarming any immediate suspicion on the part of Dr. Jones himself? Have we not every reason to suppose that it may have been effectual in accomplishing the latter result? Any one of these circumstances could not have been of so decisive a character as to lead you to the conviction of the prisoner's guilt, but I ask you to consider them as a series of events following one another in close succession and then I leave it to you to draw from them the conclusion to which you may find they must legitimately lead. I will now pass over for a moment the remainder of the history of the Tuesday night, and I will take you to the circumstances which immediately followed Cook's death. On the Thursday, Mr. Stevens, the stepfather of the deceased, went over to Rugeley on receiving intelligence of the sad event. He applied to Palmer for information upon the subject of Cook's affairs, and in the course of the communications which passed between them, Stephen said, Rich or poor, the poor fellow should be buried. Palmer then observed that he would undertake to bury him himself, but Mr. Stevens declined, in a decisive manner, to avail himself of that offer. I admit that there may be nothing suspicious in the proposal of Palmer to bury his friend, if it should be taken by itself, but there is this somewhat remarkable circumstance on this part of the case, that when Mr. Stevens had said that he could not have the funeral for a few days, Palmer observed that the body ought to be put in a coffin immediately, and when, after an absence of about half an hour, he returned, and was asked by Mr. Stevens for the name of an undertaker to whom he should give directions about the funeral, the prisoner stated, much to the surprise of the gentleman whom he was addressing, that he had himself ordered a shell and a strong oak coffin. Why should he have so hurriedly interfered in the business of another man, unless he made up his mind that the body should be consigned to its last resting place, and removed from the sight of man with the utmost possible rapidity? You have heard the conversation which took place between Mr. Stevens and the prisoner on the Saturday at the different railway stations at which they met. It appears that at that time Mr. Stevens had made up his mind that a post-mortem examination of the body of the deceased should take place, in consequence of circumstances which had engendered a suspicion in his mind that the death of his stepson had not been the result of natural disease. He had noticed the strange attitude of the deceased 
his clinched hands and the unusual appearance of his face and being a man of natural shrewdness and sagacity he felt a lurking suspicion which he could not unravel that there must have been foul play in the case he made known to the prisoner his intention of having the body opened before it was consigned to the grave it is true that the prisoner did not flinch from that trying ordeal and that he met with firmness the trying gaze of mr stevens when the report of the post-mortem examination was first mentioned but finding that there was to be a post-mortem examination he was anxious to know who was to perform it mr stevens would not inform him but merely stated that it was to take place on the monday then we have on the sunday that remarkable conversation between the prisoner and newton which has been for some time known to the crown it is true that newton did not mention the conversation in the course of his examination before the coroner but the reason for this silence upon the subject on that occasion may be easily proved he was called at the inquest solely for the purpose of corroborating the evidence of roberts with respect to palmer's appearance in dr hawkins's shop on the tuesday morning and to that point his evidence before the coroner was confined he has since deposed that during a conversation with palmer on the sunday the latter suddenly asked him what quantity of strychnine would you give if you wanted to kill a dog the reply was from half a grain to a grain the prisoner then asked would you expect to find any traces of it in the stomach after death newton answered no and on his doing so he observed the prisoner make a movement conveying an intimation of his delight i had at one time thought that my learned friend engaged for the defence would have attempted to show that the prisoner had purchased the strychnia at the commencement of the week for the purpose of destroying dogs but no evidence whatever has been adduced to establish such a point and we have no evidence of any kind to show how that strychnia was applied but my learned friend has contended that the prisoner had no motive for taking away the life of his friend cook now if i convince you upon unimpeachable evidence that the death of cook had been caused by strychnine and that that strychnine could only have been administered by the prisoner then the question of motive must become a mere secondary consideration it is often difficult to give into the breast of man and to ascertain with any certainty the reasons which directed him to any particular course of action and the inscrutable character of any particular motive ought not to destroy the force of a well-authenticated fact but motive is unquestionably an important element in a case over which any doubt as to the facts can by any possibility rest i believe i can perfectly satisfy your minds that in this case the prisoner had a motive and a very obvious motive for taking away the life of cook he was at the time reduced to a condition of the direst embarrassment it appears that in the month of november last he owed on bills not less than nineteen thousand pounds of which twelve thousand five hundred pounds worth was in the hands of pratt and out of that latter sum five thousand five hundred pounds was pressing for immediate payment by the death of cook he was enabled to obtain possession of one thousand and twenty pounds due to the latter in the shape of bets he was enabled to obtain possession of the money which cook must have had about him on his arrival at rugeley and which according to one of the witnesses must have amounted to seven hundred pounds or eight hundred pounds and he attempted to obtain possession of the three hundred and fifty pounds which the messrs weatherby were to have received as the amount of the state of the shrewsbury handicap the order forwarded by palmer to messrs weatherby for the three hundred and fifty pounds and purporting to bear the signature of cook had been sent back by them to the prisoner and if that signature was not a forgery why had it not been produced on the part of the defendant my learned friend says that cook was the best friend of the prisoner and that cook was the only person to whom he could look for assistance in his embarrassments but cook had no means of assisting him unless he were to appropriate to his use the money which he had won at shrewsbury which was all the property he then possessed and can any one believe that the deceased would have parted with that money 
and would have left himself wholly without any resources for the approaching winter my learned friend contends that the fact that palmer had written the letter on the friday night in which he asked fisher to pay two hundred pounds to pratt on account of a transaction in which both he and palmer were interested while three hundred pounds more were to be sent upon that night my learned friend contends that that fact shows that the prisoner and the deceased perfectly understood one another at the time and goes far to prove the innocence of his client to my mind however that very circumstance affords a very strong argument in favour of the case for the crown the only transaction with pratt in which palmer and cook were both interested was that relating to the bill for five hundred pounds and in which cook had assigned his horse as a collateral security it is very easy to see that he must have felt particularly anxious that that claim should at once be settled and that his horses should come into his own undisputed possession one of these horses being a very valuable one namely polestar which had just won the shrewsbury race he accordingly i have no doubt gave palmer three hundred pounds to be sent up to london on account of that bill but that sum was never applied by the prisoner to the purpose for which it had been placed in his hands there is not the slightest foundation for the statement that cook had entered into an arrangement with palmer for the purpose of defrauding fisher of the two hundred pounds he had advanced for there was nothing in his character which could show that he was capable of so infamous an act and it could not possibly have been his interest that it should take place i will not ask you to direct your attention to the request addressed by the prisoner to cheshire the postmaster that he should bear his witness to the genuineness of cook's signature to the order on the messrs weatherby for the sum of three hundred and fifty pounds that request was made forty-eight hours after cook's death and if the signature was not a forgery why was that extraordinary demand made of cheshire and why had not the document been since produced it is impossible to forget that if cheshire had testified to the genuineness of that document the prisoner would have been enabled to exercise over him the most fatal control and that he might then have compelled him to sign another paper transferring as the prisoner had sought to do in the course of one of his conversations with mr stevens to the deceased the liability for four thousand pounds or five thousand pounds due on bills to pratt and outstanding in his own name all these facts show irrefragably as i contend that the death of cook had in the opinion of the prisoner become most desirable for his own relief there is another part of his conduct as tending to throw light on this matter and that is with reference to cook's betting book on the night when cook died ere the breath had hardly parted from that poor man's body the prisoner was found there rummaging his pockets and searching for his papers when subsequently stevens asked for the betting book the prisoner said oh it's of no use for a dead man's bets are void true it is that a dead man's bets are void but not when they are paid during his life who received the bets the prisoner at the bar who was answerable for them the prisoner at the bar who had an interest in concealing the amount of those debts the prisoner at the bar if stevens had seen that book he would have seen that cook was entitled to a sum of one thousand and twenty pounds he would have seen that fisher was his agent and from him that herring and not fisher had calculated his bets but there is still more yet to be accounted for when stevens determined upon having a post-mortem examination what was the conduct of the prisoner at the bar the learned attorney-general then proceeded to refer to the arrival of dr harland in the town of rugeley for the purpose of making the examination his conversation with palmer when the latter said that cook had died of epileptic fits and that traces of old disease would be found in the head and heart none of which were however found on the examination of the body the removal of the jar containing the stomach and intestines of cook the slits cut in the covering probably for the purpose of introducing something into the jar which would neutralize the poison if it were present the restlessness and uneasiness of the prisoner while the examination was going on his remonstrating with dr bamford for letting the jars be sent away 
and his attempt to bribe the postboy to upset the chaise and break the jar. The conduct of Mr. Stevens, the stepfather of Cook, in resolving to prosecute this inquiry, was such as the gravity and importance of the case proved ought to have protected him from the charge of insolent curiosity brought against him by my learned friend. The honourable and learned gentleman then concluded as follows. It is for you to say, under these circumstances, whether or not the death of the deceased was caused by the prisoner at the bar. You have indeed had introduced into this case one other element which I cannot help thinking might well have been omitted. You have heard from my learned friend an unusual, I think I may even say an unprecedented, expression of the innocence of his client. I can only say on that point that I believe my learned friend might have abstained from any such statement. What should he think of me if, imitating his example, I should at this moment declare to you, on my honour, as he did, what is the internal conviction which has followed from my conscientious consideration of this case? My learned friend has, with a full display of his great ability, also adopted another course which, although sometimes resorted to by members of our profession, involves in my mind a species of insult to the good sense and the good feeling of the jury. My learned friend told you that if your verdict in this case should be guilty, the innocence of the prisoner will one day or other be made manifest, and you would never cease to regret the verdict you have given. If my learned friend was sincere in that, and I know that he was, for there is no man who is more alive than he is to the claims of truth and honour. But if he said what he believed, all I can state in answer is that I can only attribute the conviction he has expressed to that strong bias which his mind easily, perhaps, received in directing all his energies to the defence of a man charged with this frightful crime. But I still think he would have done well to have abstained from any assurance of the innocence of the prisoner at the bar. I go further and say that I think he ought, in justice and in consideration to you, to have abstained from telling you that the voice of the country would not sanction the verdict which you might give. I say nothing of the inconsistency which is involved in such a statement, coming from one who but a short time before complained in eloquent terms of the universal torrent of passion and of prejudice by which, he said, his client was borne down. In answer to my learned friend, I have only this to say to you. Pay no regard to the voice of the country, whether it be for condemnation or for acquittal. Pay no regard to anything but the internal voice of your own consciences. Trust to the sense of that duty to God and man which you are about to discharge upon this occasion, seeking no reward except the comforting assurance that when you shall look back at the events of this trial, you have discharged, to the best of your ability and to the utmost of your power, the duty you have been called upon to fulfil. If, on a review of the whole case, comparing the evidence on one side and on the other, and weighing it in the even scales of justice, you can come to the conclusion of innocence, or even entertain that fair and reasonable doubt of guilt, of which the accused is entitled to the benefit. In God's name give to him that benefit. But, if, on the other hand, all the facts and all the evidence lead your minds with satisfaction to yourselves to the conclusion of his guilt, then, but only then, I ask for a verdict of guilty at your hands. For the protection of the good, for the repression of the wicked, I then ask for that verdict by which alone, as it seems to me, the safety of society can be secured, and the demands, the imperious demands, of public justice can be satisfied. The Honourable and Learned Gentleman concluded his address shortly after half-past six o'clock after having occupied the breathless attention of every one who had heard him during a period of three hours and three quarters. Lord Campbell then addressed the jury as follows. The cause of public justice imperatively requires that the court should now adjourn. I shall feel it my duty, in this important case, to bring before you the whole of the evidence on the one side and on the other, accompanying the reading of it with such remarks as I may think it proper to make. It is impossible to enter on that duty at this hour, and I am, therefore, under the painful necessity of ordering that you be again kept sequestered, 
from your families and friends during another sabbath the court then adjourned at twenty-five minutes to seven o'clock until ten o'clock on monday we may here observe that the prisoner listened with deep attention to the whole of the address of the attorney-general and even with an air of considerable anxiety although he still preserved his usual perfect self-possession end of section twenty one Section 22 of the Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Eleventh day, May the 26th. The proceedings in this protracted case were resumed this morning at the Old Bailey. The public interest which it has excited from the first appears in no degree to have abated, and the court was again densely crowded the prisoner was placed at the bar punctually at ten o'clock and we were unable to trace any change in his appearance or demeanour although he naturally listened with marked attention in which one might occasionally detect a shade of anxiety to the summing up of the lord chief justice still it must be admitted that he looked as little concerned as any one in court several persons of distinction were present during portions of the day and among them we noticed Mr. Gladstone, M.P., General Fox, Mr. Milnes Gaskell, M.P., Mr. C. Forster, M.P., Mr. Oliveira, M.P., Lord G. Lennox, M.P., the Recorder, the Common Sergeant, Alderman Sir R. W. Garden, the Sheriffs, and other gentlemen officially connected with the administration of justice in the city. Summing up of the Lord Chief Justice silence having been proclaimed the lord chief justice campbell proceeded to sum up the case to the jury but spoke in so low a tone that some part of his address was not audible in the reporter's inconvenient box he said gentlemen of the jury we have at length arrived at that stage in this solemn and important case when it becomes the duty of the judge to explain to you the nature of the charge brought against the prisoner and the questions and considerations upon which your verdict ought to be given gentlemen i must begin by conjuring you to banish from your minds all that you may have heard before the prisoner was placed in that dock there is no doubt that a strong prejudice elsewhere did prevail against the prisoner at the bar in the county of stafford where the offence for which he has to answer was alleged to have been committed that prejudice was so strong that the court of queen's bench made an order to remove the trial from that county the prisoner by his counsel expressed a wish that the trial might take place at the central criminal court and to enable that wish to be accomplished an act has been passed by the legislature authorizing the court of queen's bench to direct the trial to be held in this court and so as to secure to the prisoner that he shall have a fair and impartial trial gentlemen i must not only warn you against being influenced by what you have before heard but i must also warn you not to be influenced by anything but by the evidence which has been laid before you with respect to the particular charge for which the prisoner is now arraigned it is necessary that i should so warn you in this case because the evidence certainly implicates the prisoner in transactions of another description which are very discreditable it appears that he has forged a great many bills of exchange and that he had entered upon transactions which were not of a creditable nature those transactions however must be excluded from your consideration altogether by the practice in foreign countries it is allowed to raise a probability of the prisoner having committed the crime for which he is charged by proving that he has committed other offences by showing that he is an immoral man and that he is not unlikely therefore to have committed the offence with which he is charged that is not the case in this country you must presume that a man is innocent until his guilt be established and his guilt can only be established by evidence directly criminating him on the charge for which he is tried gentlemen it gives me great satisfaction that this case has been so fully laid before you everything has been done 
that could have been accomplished for the purpose of assisting the jury in arriving at the right conclusion the prosecution has been taken up by the government so that justice may be duly administered the attorney-general who is the first law officer of the crown having conducted it in his capacity of a minister of justice the prisoner also appears to have had ample means for conducting his defence witnesses have very properly been brought from all parts of the kingdom to give you the benefit of their information and he has had the advantage of having his case conducted by one of the most distinguished advocates of the english bar gentlemen i must strongly recommend to you to attend to everything that fell from that advocate so eloquently so ably and so impressively you are to judge however of the guilt or innocent of the prisoner from the evidence and not from the speeches of counsel however able or eloquent those speeches may be when a counsel tells you that he believes his client to be innocent remember that that is analogous to the mere form by which a prisoner pleads not guilty it goes for nothing more and the most inconvenient consequences must follow from regarding it in any other light i will now say a few words in order to call to your minds what are the allegations in this case on one side and on the other on the part of the prosecution it is alleged that the deceased john parsons cook was first tampered with by antimony that he was then killed by the poison of strychnia and that his symptoms were the symptoms of poisoning by strychnia then it is alleged that the prisoner at the bar had a motive for making away with the deceased that he had an opportunity for administering poison that suspicion could fall upon no one else and that a few days before the time when the poison is supposed to have been administered he had purchased strychnia at two different places it is also alleged by the prosecution that his conduct during that transaction and after it was that of a guilty and not of an innocent man the prisoner at the bar on the other hand puts forward these allegations that he had no interest in procuring the death of john parsons cook but on the contrary that it was in his interest to keep him alive that the death was not occasioned by strychnia but by natural disease and that the symptoms were those of natural disease and were by no means consistent with the supposition of death by strychnia these are the allegations which are urged upon one side and the other and it is for you to say upon the evidence which of these allegations you believe to be founded on truth gentlemen you have a most anxious duty to perform the life of the prisoner is at stake if he be guilty it is necessary that he should expiate his crime if he be innocent it is requisite that his innocence should be vindicated if his guilt be proved to you on satisfactory evidence it is your duty to society and to yourselves to convict him but unless his guilt be fully sustained by the evidence it is your duty to acquit him you must bear in mind that in a case of this sort you cannot expect that witnesses should be called to state that they saw the deadly poison mixed up by the prisoner and by him openly administered circumstantial evidence of the fact is all that can be expected and if there be a series of circumstances leading to the conclusion of guilt a verdict of guilty may be satisfactorily pronounced with respect to the motive it is of great importance in cases of this description that you should consider whether there was any motive for committing the crime with which the prisoner is charged for if there be no motive there is an improbability of the offence having been committed if on the other hand there be any motive which can be assigned for the commission of the deed the adequacy of that motive becomes next a matter of the utmost importance the great question which you will have to consider is whether the symptoms of cook's death are consistent with poisoning by strychnia if they are not and you believe that the death arose from natural causes the prisoner is at once entitled to your verdict of not guilty if on the other hand you think that the symptoms are consistent with poisoning by strychnia you have another and important question to decide namely whether the evidence which has been adduced is sufficient to convince you that death was effected by strychnia and if so whether such strychnia was administered by the prisoner 
in cases of this sort the evidence has often been divided into the medical and the moral or circumstantial evidence they cannot be separated however in the minds of a jury because it is by a combination of those two species of evidence that their verdict ought to be given in this case you must look at the medical evidence to see whether the deceased died from strychnia or from natural causes and you must look at what is called the moral evidence to consider whether that shows that the prisoner not only had the opportunity but that he actually availed himself of that opportunity and administered the poison to the deceased now gentlemen with these preliminary observations i will proceed to read over the evidence which has been given in the course of this long trial praying you most earnestly to weigh that evidence carefully and to be guided entirely by it in the verdict at which you may arrive i begin with that part of the case which was first raised by the attorney-general with respect to the motive which the prisoner is supposed to have had for taking away the life of john parsons cook now i think that that arises out of certain pecuniary transactions which must be fresh in the minds of all of you it appears that the prisoner had borrowed large sums of money upon bills of exchange which he drew and which purported to be accepted by his mother a lady it seems of considerable wealth residing at rugeley those acceptances were forged and the lady was not aware of them until a recent period when they became due and proceedings were taken upon them one of those acceptances for two thousand pounds was in the hands of a gentleman named padwick one thousand pounds had been paid and one thousand pounds remained due to mr padwick upon that bill a solicitor named pratt of queen street mayfair had advanced large sums of money to the prisoner upon similar bills to the amount i think of twelve thousand five hundred pounds several of those bills had been renewed without the knowledge of the mother but there were two which remained unrenewed one for two thousand pounds became due on the twenty fifth of october eighteen fifty five and another for two thousand pounds became due on the twenty seventh of october eighteen fifty five besides these mr pratt held one bill for five hundred pounds and another for one thousand pounds which were overdue but not renewed and which pratt held over charging a very high rate of interest upon them in addition to these large sums which had been advanced by pratt to the prisoner it appears that upon similar bills palmer had contracted a very large debt with an attorney at birmingham named wright to whom he owed ten thousand four hundred pounds it had been stated by palmer that he should be able to liquidate those bills by the proceeds of a policy of assurance which had been effected on the life of his brother walter palmer gentlemen the law of this country wisely forbids an insurance being effected by one person upon the life of another who has no interest in that life but unfortunately it does not prevent a man from insuring his own life to any amount however large and whatever his position may be and assigning the policy of that insurance to another person it has been proved in evidence that there had been an insurance for thirteen thousand pounds effected on the life of walter palmer who was a bankrupt without any means except such as were furnished to him by his mother and that the policy had been assigned by walter palmer to the prisoner at the bar it was expected that the thirteen thousand pounds insured upon the life of his brother would be the means of enabling the prisoner to meet the acceptances to which i have referred but the directors of the prince of wales insurance office denied their liability upon that policy and refused to pay it hence arose the most pressing embarrassments claimants were urging the payment of their accounts and it was evident that unless they were immediately paid the law would be put in force against the prisoner and his mother and that the system of forgeries which had been so long carried on would be made apparent now i begin with the evidence of mr john espin a solicitor practising in davis street berkeley square the learned judge then read the evidence of mr espin with respect to the two thousand pounds bill held by mr padwick the dishonouring of the cheque for one thousand pounds and the final issuing of a cassa against the person of the prisoner on the twelfth of december this continued the noble lord is certainly strong evidence to show the desperate state of the prisoner's circumstances at that time 
but we now come to the evidence of mr thomas pratt who had advanced money to the prisoner upon bills of exchange which bore the forged acceptance of the prisoner's mother to the amount of twelve thousand five hundred pounds the learned judge then proceeded to read the whole of the evidence of mr pratt together with the voluminous correspondence between that gentleman and the prisoner detailing the entire history of the transactions which had taken place between them from the date of their first acquaintance in november eighteen fifty three down to the period of the apprehension of the prisoner upon the present charge they will be found reported in their proper place with regard to the letters subjoined and marked strictly private and confidential quote, my dear sir should any of cook's friends call upon you to know what money cook ever had from you pray don't answer that question or any other about money matters until i have seen you and oblige yours faithfully william palmer end quote. the learned judge observed that the jury would recollect that when that letter was written mr stevens the stepfather of cook was making inquiries of a nature which was certainly very disagreeable to palmer having first disposed of that portion of the correspondence respecting money due from palmer to pratt and with regard to which cook was supposed to have no interest the learned judge then proceeded to read that branch of the correspondence relating to the assignment of the two race-horses pole star and sirius and to some other occurrences to which cook was supposed to have been a party with respect to the cheque for three hundred and seventy five pounds sent by pratt to palmer for cook from which the words or bearer had been struck out his lordship observed now it is rather suggested on the part of the prosecution upon this evidence that cook had been defrauded of this money by palmer and certainly the endorsement was not in cook's handwriting but as was very properly argued on the part of palmer it is very possible that cook may have authorized palmer or some one else to write his name cheshire a clerk at the bank is then called and says that the cheque was carried to palmer's account now all this may have happened with the consent of cook in pursuance of some agreement between him and palmer his lordship then read the cross-examination of pratt the bill of five hundred pounds drawn by palmer on cook and payable on the second of december and also the evidence of armshaw who proved that on the thirteenth of november palmer was in a state of embarrassment and that on the twentieth he received from him two fifty-pound notes it is for you gentlemen to draw your own inference from this evidence having before the races been pressed for money on the night of the tuesday on which cook died he has now two fifty-pound notes in his possession his lordship next read the evidence of spilbury who on the twenty second of november received a fifty pound note from palmer and of strawbridge who proved that on the nineteenth of november his balance at the bank was only nine pounds six shillings this evidence certainly shows that the finances of the prisoner were at the lowest ebb and he had no means of meeting his bills his lordship next read wright's evidence as to the large debts due to his brother from palmer and the bill of sale given by palmer as security upon the whole of his property strawbridge's evidence as to the forgery of mrs palmer's name to acceptances and the further evidence of mr weatherby particularly calling the attention of the jury to the fact of the cheque purporting to be signed by cook having been returned to palmer by mr weatherby when he refused payment of it a great deal said his lordship turns upon the question of whether that cheque was really signed by cook or not as if not it shows that palmer was dealing with cook's money and appropriating it to his own use mr sergeant she observed that mr weatherby expressed an opinion that the cheque was cook's lord campbell mr weatherby said that the body of the cheque was not in cook's handwriting and he had paid no attention to the signature you gentlemen must consider all the evidence with regard to this part of the case the cheque is not produced although it was sent back by mr weatherby to palmer and notice to produce it has been given if it had been produced we could have seen whether cook's signature was genuine it is not produced his lordship then read the evidence of butler 
to whom palmer owed money in respect of debts and of bergen an inspector of police who had searched palmer's house for papers after the inquest it might have been expected that the cheque which was returned by mr weatherby to palmer who professed to set store upon it and to have given value for it and who required mr weatherby not to pay away any money until it had been satisfied would have been found but it is not forthcoming it is for you to draw whatever inference may suggest itself to you from this circumstance we then come to the arrest of palmer now as it strikes my mind the circumstance that palmer remained in the neighbourhood after suspicion had arisen against him is of importance and ought to be taken into consideration by you although he may perhaps have done so thinking that from the care he had taken nothing could ever be discovered against him it seems however that he was imprisoned on civil process before the verdict of the coroner's jury rendered him amenable to a criminal charge besides the cheque purporting to be signed by cook the prisoner also had in his possession a document purporting that certain bills had been accepted by him for cook but neither that document nor any such bills have been found all the papers which were not retained were returned to the prisoner's brother and notice has been given to produce them but neither the bills nor the document are produced with regard to this witness's statement that field was at rugeley i know not how it is connected with the present investigation if field was employed to inquire into the health of walter palmer at the time the insurance was effected on his life and into the circumstances of his death i know not what he can have to do with the question you are to determine this then is the conclusion of the evidence upon one branch of the case and now begins the evidence relating to the health of cook and the events immediately preceding his death his lordship then read the evidence of ishmael fisher observing in the course of it that one of the most mysterious circumstances in the case was that after cook had stated his suspicion as to palmer having put something in his brandy he remained constantly in palmer's company he appeared to have entire confidence in palmer and during the few remaining days of his life he sent for palmer whenever he was in distress in fact he seemed to be under the influence of palmer to a very great extent his lordship also directed the attention of the jury to the circumstance of the seven hundred pounds which cook had entrusted to the care of fisher having been returned to him on the morning of the day on which he went with palmer to rugeley his lordship then read fisher's statement that he had been in the habit of settling cook's account and now he continued comes the very important letter of the sixteenth of november certainly if cook induced fisher to make an advance of two hundred pounds on the security of his bets and then employed another person to collect those bets there was a fraud on his part in the letter of the sixteenth of november cook says quote, it is of great importance both to mr palmer and myself that a sum of five hundred pounds should be paid to mr pratt of five queen street mayfair to-morrow without fail three hundred pounds has been sent up to-night and if you will be kind enough to pay the other two hundred pounds to-morrow on the receipt of this you will greatly oblige me and i will give it to you on monday at tattersall's End quote. mr sergeant shee there is a postscript my lord lord campbell yes quote, i am much better End quote. Now the signature to this letter is undoubtedly genuine, and it shows, first, that Cook at that time intended to be in London on the Monday, and secondly, that he desired an advance of two hundred pounds to pay Pratt. How he came to alter his intention as to going to London, and how Herring came to be employed for him instead of Fisher, you must infer for yourselves. But if he authorised the employment of Herring in order to prevent Fisher from reimbursing himself, he was a party to a fraud you must infer whether he did so or not his lordship then read the remainder of fisher's evidence and also the evidence of mr jones the law stationer of gibson and of mrs brooke this he said ends the history of cook's illness at shrewsbury taken by itself it amounts to very little 
but in connection with what follows it deserves your serious consideration then with regard to what took place at the talbot arms at rugeley where cook lodged you have a most important witness elizabeth mills his lordship then read the evidence of mills observing that the events of monday and tuesday the nineteenth and twentieth of november and the symptoms which immediately preceded the death of cook formed a most material part of the case it has been suggested continued the learned judge by the counsel for the defence that elizabeth mills may have been bribed by mr stevens the father-in-law of cook to give evidence prejudicial to the prisoner but in justice both to mr stevens and to elizabeth mills i am bound to declare that not one fact has been adduced to warrant us in believing that there is the slightest foundation for any such statement it has also been alleged that mr stevens called upon elizabeth mills and read to her an extract from a newspaper with the view it is presumed of influencing her evidence or guiding it in a particular direction but this too is a gratuitous assertion and so far from being supported by the evidence it is distinctly denied as regards the manner in which palmer was addressed when he ran over from his own house to the talbot arms on the night of cook's death there is no doubt a difference between the testimony of elizabeth mills and that of her fellow-servant lavinia barnes the former asserting that he wore a plaid dressing-gown and the latter a black coat but it is for you to decide whether the point is of sufficient significance to justify a suspicion dishonourable to the veracity of either witness it has been asserted also that there are certain discrepancies between the evidence given by elizabeth mills before the coroner and that which she gave in your presence that you may the more accurately estimate the importance of those differences it is competent for the prisoner's counsel to require that the depositions shall be read what say you brother she mr sergeant she with your lordship's permission we desire to have them read lord campbell then let them be read by all means the clerk of the arraigns then read the depositions of elizabeth mills as taken before the coroner lord campbell you have now heard the depositions read and you will decide for yourselves whether her statements before the coroner are not substantially the same as those which she made before you in the course of her examination you will have to determine whether there is any material discrepancy between them her own explanation of her omission to state before the coroner that she was sick after partaking of the broth prepared for cook is that she was not asked the question but that she was sick the evidence of another witness goes distinctly to prove and it is for you to say whether corroborated as it thus is the testimony of elizabeth mills is worthy of being believed and if so what inference should be drawn from it the next witnesses are mr james gardiner attorney of rugeley and lavinia barnes fellow-servant of elizabeth mills at the talbot arms inn the learned judge having read his notes of the evidence of the witnesses in question observed the testimony of lavinia barnes corroborates that of mills as to the latter having been seized with illness immediately after she had taken two spoonfuls of the broth there is some little difference of evidence as to the exact time when palmer was seen at rugeley on the monday night after his return from london but you have before you the statements of all the witnesses and you will decide whether the point is one of essential importance the learned judge then read over without comment his notes of the evidence given by the witnesses anne rowley and sarah bond and then proceeded to recapitulate the facts deposed to by mr jones surgeon of lutterworth your attention he observed has been very properly directed to the letter written by the prisoner on sunday evening to mr jones summoning the latter to the sick-bed of his friend cook the learned counsel for the defence interprets that document in a sense highly favourable to the prisoner and contends that the fact of his having ensured the presence of such a witness is conclusive evidence of the prisoner's innocence you will say whether you think that it is fairly susceptible of such a construction it is important however to consider at what period of cook's illness jones was sent for and in what a condition he was when jones arrived palmer's assertion in his letter to jones was that cook had been suffering from diarrhoea 
but of this statement we have not the slightest corroboration in the evidence when jones looking at cook's tongue observed that it was not the tongue of a bilious attack palmer's reply was you should have seen it before what reason could palmer have had for using these words when there is not the slightest evidence of cook's having suffered from such an illness it is a matter for your consideration the deposition of jones taken before the coroner having been read at the instance of mr sergeant she the learned judge remarks it is for you to say whether in your opinion this deposition at all varies from the evidence given by mr jones when examined here i confess that i see no variation and no reason to suppose that mr jones's evidence is not the evidence of sincerity and of truth after observing that the evidence of dr savage which he read went to show that down to the hour of the shrewsbury races and an attack on the wednesday night cook was in perhaps better health than he had enjoyed for a long time the learned judge called the attention of the jury to the evidence of charles newton who deposed to having furnished three grains of strychnia to palmer on the monday night and to having seen him shop at the shop of mr hawkins on the tuesday having read the evidence of this witness and his deposition before the coroner his lordship said this is the evidence of newton a most important witness it certainly might be urged that he did not mention the furnishing of strychnia to palmer on the monday night before the coroner he did not mention it till the tuesday morning when he was coming up to london that certainly requires consideration at your hands but then you will observe that in his deposition which has been read to you although there is an omission of that which is always to be borne in mind there is no contradiction of anything which he has said here well then you are to consider the probability of his inventing this wicked lie a most important lie if lie it be he had no ill will towards the prisoner at the bar he had never quarrelled with him and had nothing to gain by injuring him much less by betraying him to the scaffold i cannot see any motive that he could have for inventing a lie to take away the life of the prisoner no inducement was held out to him by the crown he says himself that no inducement was held out to him and that he at last disclosed this circumstance from a sense of duty if you believe him his evidence is very strong against the prisoner at the bar but we will now turn to the next witness charles joseph roberts whose evidence is closely connected with that of newton having read the evidence of roberts mr hawkins's assistant who stated that on the tuesday he sold to the prisoner at his master's shop three grains of strychnia his lordship continued the witness was not cross-examined as to the veracity of his testimony nor is he contradicted in any way it is not denied that on this tuesday morning the prisoner at the bar got six grains of strychnia from roberts if you couple that with the statement of newton believing that statement you have evidence of strychnia having been produced by the prisoner on the monday night before the symptoms of strychnia were exhibited by cook and by the evidence of roberts undenied and unquestioned that on the tuesday six grains of strychnia were supplied to him supposing you should come to the conclusion that the symptoms of cook were consistent with death by strychnia if you think that his symptoms were accounted for by merely natural disease of course the strychnia obtained by the prisoner on the monday evening and the tuesday morning would have no effect but if you should think that the symptoms which cook exhibited on the monday and tuesday nights are consistent with strychnia then a case is made out on the part of the crown after the most anxious consideration i can suggest no possible solution of the purchase of this strychnia the learned counsel for the prisoner told us in his speech that there was nothing for which he would not account he quite properly denied that newton was to be believed disbelieving newton you have no evidence of strychnia being obtained on the monday evening but disbelieving newton and believing roberts you have evidence of six grains of strychnia being obtained by the prisoner on the tuesday morning and of that you have no explanation the learned counsel did not favour us with the theory which he had formed in his own mind with respect to that strychnia there is no evidence there is no suggestion how it was applied what became of it 
that must not influence your verdict unless you come to the conclusion that the symptoms of cook were consistent with death by strychnia if you come to that conclusion i should shrink from my duty i should be unworthy to sit here if i did not call your attention to the inference that if he purchased that strychnia he purchased it for the purpose of administering it to cook the evidence next read by the learned judge was that of mr stevens the stepfather of cook upon this the noble lord observed the learned counsel for the prisoner in the discharge of his duty made a very violent attack upon the character and conduct of mr stevens it will be for you to say whether you think it deserved that censure in the conduct of that gentleman i cannot see anything in the slightest degree deserving of blame or reprobation mr stevens was attached to this young man who was his stepson and who had no one else to take care of him and whatever the result of this trial may be i think there were appearances which might well justify suspicion i know nothing which mr stevens did which he was not perfectly justified in doing having been to rugeley and seen the body of the deceased he goes to this respectable solicitors in london who recommend him to a respectable solicitor mr gardiner at rugeley under his advice mr stevens acts a conversation ensues between himself and the prisoner palmer but i see nothing in the proceedings which he took at all deserving of animadversion whether palmer had any right to complain of, of what was said about the betting book and whether mr stevens could be blamed for suspecting that palmer had taken it it is for you to say having read the evidence of the woman keeley who laid out the body of cook and of dr harland who spoke to the circumstances attending the two post-mortem examinations to the pushing of mr devonshire who operated and the removal of the jar on the first occasion the learned judge continued from that push no inference unfavourable to the prisoner can be drawn as it might easily be the result of accident in the removal of the jar there would be nothing more than in the pushing were it not coupled with the evidence afterwards given which may lead to the inference that there was a plan to destroy the jar and prevent the analysis of its contents the learned chief justice then read the evidence of mr devonshire the surgeon of rugeley dr monckton the physician and mr john boycott the clerk to mrs lander gardner and lander the rugeley attorneys and of james myatt the postboy of the talbot arms who swore that palmer had offered him ten pounds to upset the fly containing mr stevens and the jar with the contents of the deceased's stomach remarking upon the evidence of this last witness the chief justice said in cases of circumstantial evidence you must look to the conduct of the person charged and you must consider whether that conduct is consistent with innocence or is compatible with guilt i see no reason to doubt the evidence of that postboy an attempt was made upon cross-examination to show that the offer of ten pounds was not made in reference to the jar but as an inducement to upset mr stevens it was suggested you will remember that stevens had wantonly provoked palmer and that palmer might be excused therefore if he wished him to be upset i see no grounds for supposing that stevens gave palmer any such provocation and if you believe the postboy that bribe was offered to him to induce him to upset the jar that is not indeed a decisive proof of guilt but it is for you to say whether the prisoner did not enter upon that contrivance in order to prevent an opportunity of examining the contents of the jar which might contain evidence against him we have next the evidence of samuel cheshire formerly postmaster at rugeley the learned judge read the evidence remarking upon the circumstance of palmer calling upon him to witness a document said to have been signed by cook as if he had been present and had seen cook sign it upon the remarkable fact of palmer endeavouring to obtain information from cheshire as to the contents of the letter from dr taylor to mr gardiner and upon the impropriety of the following letter addressed by the prisoner to the coroner mr ward during the progress of the inquest Quote, my dear sir i am sorry to tell you that i am still confined to my bed i don't think it was mentioned at the inquest yesterday that cook was taken ill on sunday and monday night in the same way as he was on the tuesday when he died 
the chambermaid at the crown hotel masters can prove this i also believe that a man of the name of fisher is coming down to prove he received some money at shrewsbury now here he could only pay smith ten pounds out of the forty one pounds he owed him had you not better call smith to prove this and again whatever professor taylor may say to-morrow he wrote from london last tuesday night to gardner to say we and dr rees have this day finished our analysis and find no traces of either strychnia prussic acid or opium what can beat this from a man like taylor if he says what he has already said and dr harland's evidence mind you i know and saw it in black and white what taylor said to gardner but this is strictly private and confidential but it is true as regards his betting book i know nothing of it and it is of no good to any one i hope the verdict to-morrow will be that he died of natural causes and thus end it ever yours w p palmer says in that letter that he had seen it in black and white cheshire states that he had not shown him the letter however that might be there can be no question that this was a highly improper letter for the prisoner to write and speaking as the chief coroner of england and being desirous for the due administration of justice and of the law i have no hesitation in saying that it was not creditable in mr ward to receive such a letter without a public condemnation of its having been written you will say gentlemen whether the conduct of the prisoner in that respect suggesting to the coroner the verdict which he should obtain from the jury is consistent with innocence the noble and learned lord then read the evidence of ellis crisp the police inspector at rugeley who produced a medical book which had been found in the prisoner's house and in which the following passage occurred in the prisoner's handwriting quote, strychnia kills by causing tetanic fixing of the respiratory muscles end quote, and remarking that this was a book which was in the possession of the prisoner seven years ago when he was a student he said there was nothing in it which ought to weigh for a moment against the prisoner at the bar having read without comment the evidence of elizabeth hawkes the boarding-house keeper with respect to the sending of game to ward of slack her porter and of herring who spoke to the directions given him by palmer as to the disposal of cook's bets his lordship called the particular attention of the jury to the statement in the evidence of bates that the prisoner had told him not to let any one see him deliver the letter to ward the next witness he continued is dr curling and now gentlemen you will be called upon to come to some conclusion with regard to the evidence of the scientific men respecting the symptoms of the deceased before death and the appearance of his body after death you will have to say how far those symptoms and those particular appearances are to be accounted for by natural disease and how far they are the symptoms and appearances produced by strychnine it will be a question of great importance whether in your judgment they correspond with natural that is with traumatic or idiopathic tetanus or with any other disease whatever his lordship read the evidence of dr curling and the examination in chief of dr todd without comment and directed the clerk of arraigns to read the depositions of dr bamford the depositions were accordingly read and his lordship then remarked when the deposition was first given in evidence dr bamford was too ill to come into court but he partially recovered and on a subsequent day he was examined and gave the viva voce evidence which i will now read the learned lord here read the evidence observing with regard to the pills made up by dr bamford that the prisoner certainly had an opportunity of changing them if he pleased that circumstance deserved their serious consideration there is not he continued the slightest reason to impute any bad faith to dr bamford but it is allowed on all hands that the old man was mistaken in saying that the death was caused by apoplexy all the witnesses on both sides say that whatever the disease may have been it was not apoplexy but he filled up a certificate that it was apoplexy in compliance with a recent act of parliament which renders a certificate of the cause of death necessary the cross-examination of dr todd was then read and his lordship pointed out 
that the case of strychnine seen by that witness bore a certain resemblance to cook's attack on the monday night the next witness is a gentleman of high reputation and unblemished honour sir b brodie one of the most distinguished medical men of the present time his lordship read sir b brodie's evidence that distinguished man tells you as his solemn opinion that he never knew a case in which the symptoms he had heard described arose from any disease he is well acquainted with the various diseases which afflict the human frame and he knows of no disease answering to the description of the symptoms which preceded cook's death if you agree with him in opinion the inference is that cook died from some cause other than disease the learned judge then read the evidence of dr daniel who agreed with sir b brodie and of dr solly who also thought that natural disease would not account for death mr sergeant she wished to have the cross-examination of this witness read lord campbell certainly i dare say it is very applicable mr sergeant she read a part of the cross-examination is not the rhesus sardonicus very common in all forms of violent convulsions no it is not common does it not frequently occur in all violent convulsions which assume without being tetanus a tetanic form and appearance yes it does are they not a very numerous class no they are not numerous is it not very difficult to distinguish between them and idiopathic tetanus in the onset but not in the progress i think you say you have only seen one case of idiopathic tetanus i have only seen one when you answered that question of mine you spoke from your reading and not from your experience i did not know your question applied to idiopathic tetanus alone does epilepsy sometimes occur in the midst of violent convulsions epilepsy itself is a disease of a convulsive character i am aware of that but you heard the account that was given by mr jones of the few last moments before mr cook died yes i did that he uttered a piercing shriek fell back and died did he not yes tell me whether that last shriek and the paroxysm that occurred immediately afterwards would not that bear a strong resemblance to epilepsy in some respects it bears a resemblance to it are all epileptic convulsions i do not mean epileptic convulsions designated by scientific men as of the epileptic character are they all attended with an utter want of consciousness no not all does not death by convulsions frequently occur without leaving any trace in the body behind it death from tetanus accompanied with convulsions leaves seldom any trace behind but death from epilepsy leaves a trace behind it generally lord campbell the jury have heard you read it it is for them to say whether it is important in their view or not evidence is next given of various cases of tetanus arising from strychnine it is for you gentlemen to consider how far the symptoms in those cases resemble the symptoms in this case or how far the symptoms in this case resemble those of ordinary tetanus idiopathic or traumatic the learned judge read the testimony of caroline hickson mr taylor surgeon and charles bloxham all of whom were examined with reference to the case of mrs smith of romsey he then passed on to the leeds case that of mrs dove whose name had transpired so frequently in the course of the trial that it would be vain to affect any reserve on the subject now after reading the evidence of jane witham and george morley the learned judge observed it is beyond all controversy that strychnia was not discovered in the dead body of cook but it is important to bear in mind that the witness morley declares that in cases where the quantity of strychnine administered had been the minimum dose that will destroy life it is to be expected that the chemist should occasionally fail in detecting traces of the poison after death that case of mrs dove's is a very important one because it is a case in which it is beyond all question that death was caused by strychnine however administered it is for you to determine how far the symptoms of this unhappy lady corresponded with or differed from those of cook 
you will remember that she had repeated attacks of convulsions she recovered from several but at last a larger dose than usual was given and death ensued with regard to the possibility of the poison being decomposed in the blood that appears to be a vexed question among toxicologists and mr morley differs on the point from other and i doubt not most sincere witnesses the great question for your consideration at this part of the inquiry is whether they may not be cases of death by strychnia in which nevertheless the strychnia has not let the cause be what it may been discovered in the dead body the learned judge then read the evidence of edward moore in the clutterbuck case where an overdose of strychnia had been administered and proceeded as follows i have now to call your attention to the evidence of dr taylor but before doing so i think it right to intimate that i fear it will be impossible to conclude this case to-night it is most desirable however to finish the evidence for the prosecution this evening when that is concluded i shall be under the necessity of adjourning the court and asking you to attend here again to-morrow when god willing this investigation will certainly close the learned judge then proceeded to read his notes of dr taylor's evidence and on arriving at that portion of it in which the witness described the results of his own experiments upon animals observed there is here a most important question for your consideration great reliance is placed by the prisoner's counsel and very naturally so upon the fact that no trace of strychnine was detected in the stomach of cook by dr taylor and dr rees who alone analysed it and experimented upon it but on the other hand you must bear in mind that we have their own evidence to show that there may be and have been cases of death by strychnine in which the united skill of these two individuals have failed to detect the presence of the strychnine after death both dr taylor and dr rees have stated upon their oaths that in two cases where they knew death to have been occasioned by strychnine the poison having in fact been administered with their own hands they failed to discover the slightest trace of the poison in the dead bodies of the animals on which they had experimented it is possible that other chemists might have succeeded in detecting strychnine in those animals and strychnine also in the jar containing the stomach and intestines of cook but however this may be it is beyond all question that dr taylor and dr rees failed to discover the faintest indications of strychnine in the bodies of two animals which they had themselves poisoned with that deadly drug whatever may be the nature of the different theories propounded for the explanation of this fact the fact itself is deposed to on oath and if we believe the witnesses does not admit of doubt with regard to the letter from dr taylor to mr gardiner stating that neither strychnia prussic acid nor opium had been found in the body his lordship said this letter was written before cook's symptoms had been communicated to dr taylor and dr rees but they had been informed that prussic acid strychnia and opium had been bought by palmer on the tuesday they searched for all these poisons but they found none the only poison they found in the body was antimony and therefore they did not in the absence of symptoms attribute death to strychnia as they could not at that time but they say that it possibly may have been produced by antimony because the quantity discovered in the body was no test of the quantity which might have been taken into the system as to the letter which was written by professor taylor to the lancet the learned judge remarked i must say i think it would have been better if dr taylor trusting to the credit which he had before acquired had taken no notice of what had been said but it is for you to say whether he having as he says been misrepresented and having written this letter to set himself right that materially detracts from the credit which would otherwise be given to his evidence having concluded the reading of dr taylor's evidence his lordship said this is dr taylor's evidence i will not comment upon it because i am sure that you must see its importance with regard to the antimony and the strychnia for the discovery of strychnia dr taylor experimented upon the bodies of two animals which he had himself killed with that poison but in them no strychnia could be found the learned judge next read the evidence of dr rees in commenting upon which he said 
I do not know what interest it could be supposed that Dr. Taylor had to give evidence against the prisoner. He was regularly employed in his profession, and knew nothing about Mr. Palmer until he was called upon by Mr. Stevens, and the jar was given to him. He could have no enmity against the prisoner, and no interest whatever to misrepresent the facts. Mr. Sergeant Shee reminded the learned judge that the experiments upon the two rabbits were not made until after the inquest. That makes no difference. If the witnesses are the witnesses of truth, there are equally cases where there has been the death of an animal by strychnia, and no strychnia can be found in the animal. If that experiment had been made this morning, the fact would have been the same. Dr. Taylor has been questioned about some indiscreet letter which he wrote, and some indiscreet conversation which he had, with the editor of the illustrated times against dr rees there is not even that imputation and dr rees concurs with dr taylor that in these experiments the rabbits were killed by strychnia that they did whatever was in their power according to their skill and knowledge to discover the strychnia as they did with the contents of the jar and no strychnia could be observed as to the antimony he corroborates the testimony of dr taylor antimony is a component of tartar emetic tartar emetic produces vomiting and you will judge from the vomiting at shrewsbury and rugeley whether antimony may have been administered to cook at those places antimony may not have produced death but the question of its administration is a part of the case which you must seriously consider his lordship then read the evidence of professor brand of dr christison a man above suspicion who said that if the quantity of strychnia administered was small he should not expect to find it after death and of dr john jackson who spoke to the symptoms of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus as he had observed them in india which concluded the evidence on the part of the crown having thus gone through all the evidence of the prosecution his lordship intimated that he should defer the remainder of his charge until the following day and the court was therefore at eight o'clock adjourned till ten o'clock to-morrow tuesday morning end of section twenty two